Hari Luis, good morning. Welcome to our very special event entitled Remembering Professor Richard G. Hovhannisian, Looking Back and Moving Forward, a retrospective on the extraordinary work and life and impact of our beloved late UCLA professor, Richard Hovhannisian, who served our university and our worldwide Armenian community for over 50 years, in fact, well over 60 years, as you see in the bio that we've provided for you. This is an event that is designed not only to honor Professor Hovhannisian's memory and legacy, but also to reflect on his impact and how each one of us, irrespective of our fields or backgrounds, or even how well we knew Richard and our connections to him, can be inspired by his vision and how we can continue in our own way his efforts on behalf of the Armenian people. So I welcome you all to this special event in memory of a very special man. My name is Professor Anne Karagosian, and it is my honor as the inaugural director of the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute to host this important symposium. We are honored to have a very large number of speakers and panelists in our symposium, some coming from many parts of the United States and even the globe to participate today. All of our participants had a connection with Professor Hovhannisian in various ways and in various contexts and time periods. And I believe they will help us to appreciate even more the extraordinary range of contributions made by our dear Richard throughout his life and career. So we all look forward to a very stimulating day with a series of short talks from speakers as well as panels and panelist comments with several videos and even a wonderful musical offering from uh, just before lunch from our UCLA Armenian Music Program. Before we start, I am very happy to acknowledge the long list of co-sponsors for this important symposium, which include the UCLA Center for Near Eastern Studies, the Promise Institute for Human Rights at the UCLA Law School, the Fowler Museum at UCLA, the UCLA Richard Hovhannisian Endowed Chair in Modern Armenian History, the UCLA Nadekatsi Chair in Armenian Studies, the UCLA Armenian Music Program, the UCLA Luskin Center for History and Policy, the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research, the Ararat Eskijan Museum, the Society for Armenian Studies, the UC Irvine Center for Armenian Studies, the Cal State University Fresno Armenian Studies Program, the USC Institute of Armenian Studies, and the USC Shoah Foundation. Most of the leaders of these entities, these organizations are with us today and they will be participating in the program, but I would also like to acknowledge the presence of some who are with us today, who are here in our audience. I'll call out uh, Mr. Al Kabrilov, uh, representing the Armenian Educational Foundation, which funded the original uh, Hovhannisian Endowed Chair at UCLA many decades ago. So thank you all for being with us today. And I would also like to acknowledge the very helpful, somewhat informal committee that worked with us in planning this event. In fact, ever since last summer when Richard passed away, um, these include, and uh, all of them are here today, Mark Mamagonian of Nasser. Christina Maranchi of Harvard, Bedros Dermatosian of the University of Nebraska, Puri Berberian of UC Irvine, Barlow Dermagurdichian of Cal State Fresno, and Tanner Akcham, Sebu Aslanian, and Peter Cowie of UCLA. So thank you to all of you for your helpful ideas and assistance in this endeavor. And finally, on behalf of the co-sponsors here at UCLA, I would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the indigenous Gabrielino Tongva peoples, it is a privilege for our institution to acknowledge the history of the land on which we are established. Before we begin our formal program, I would like to read statements 
from a number of UCLA administrators who regretfully could not attend today's event due to their busy travel schedules, but who nevertheless appreciated the magnificent contributions of Professor Hovhannissian over the years. So first from UCLA's Chancellor, Jean Block, he writes, Professor Hovhannissian was a remarkable and prolific scholar whose impact on the study and preservation of Armenian history, culture, and identity is virtually unmatched. Throughout his 50-year career at UCLA, he completely reshaped his field through both his own work as well as through his mentorship of hundreds of others who became leaders in Armenian studies themselves. He also embodied the role of a public intellectual, using his considerable abilities to reach well beyond the academy, deepening understanding of Armenia and its people, and advocating passionately for greater recognition of the Armenian genocide. So Chancellor Block writes, thank you for joining this symposium. It is a wonderful opportunity to honor Professor Hovhannissian's legacy, celebrate his achievements, and continue the important work of pre preserving and sharing Armenian history. Next, from UCLA's Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Darnell Hunt, who is a former Dean of Social Sciences in which the Department of History here is housed. Uh, Darnell writes, I join Chancellor Block in thanking you for participating in today's symposium. I cannot think of a more appropriate way to honor the life and legacy of Professor Hovhannissian than by bringing together esteemed scholars who continue to advance the important work that he championed throughout his career. He led the way for generations of Armenian studies researchers, artists, and activists to bring attention to a painful history while also empowering the Armenian community and fostering hope for the future. This time together is an important opportunity to share fond memories of Professor Hovhannissian as well as the powerful insights inspired by his work. And finally, from Professor Cindy Fan, who is UCLA's Vice Provost for International Studies, uh, in which our Promise Armenian Institute is housed here at UCLA. She writes, the first time I met Professor Richard Hovhannissian was in 2019, during the celebration of the establishment of the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA. He came to the podium beaming with joy as we recognize the historic moment, which would not have been possible without his lifetime commitment and long-term scholarship. The last time I saw him was about a year ago at the inaugural Kerr family lecture entitled The Extraordinary Humanitarian Le Legacy of Near Eastern Relief, which was actually in this room approximately one year ago, where he spoke. Before the event, Professor Hovhannissian and I shared a moment together. He was frail, but his wisdom, kindness, and sheer humanity through his eyes were unforgettable. Thank you, Professor Hovhannissian. We will try our very best to carry on the important work as part of your legacy. And finally, uh, we actually have a short pre-recorded video from our dear friend and colleague and benefactor of the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA, Dr. Eric Israelian, who regrets that he is not able to be here. Uh, Eric is the chief of the Vacha and Tamar Manukian Division of Digestive Diseases at the Ge Ge David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. So I will ask that the video uh, be shown at this time. Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Israelian, and I'm honored to say a few words and welcome you as part of this event, remembering Richard Havanesian. It was an honor to spend some time with many of you and Richard's beloved family in February as part of the celebration of Richard's life and work. And it was a beautiful moment for me to see family, friends, and colleagues in the audience coming together. And uh, it was particularly special for me to see some of the priceless photographs of Richard and his family over the years. I was honored to meet Richard later in life and to become friends over the years. And I've had the honor of being friends with his family of many generations in my lifetime. And while I was never taught directly in a classroom by Richard, we have all been fortunate 
to learn from Richard both directly and indirectly. For me, it was also an honor to work with all of you to help establish the Promise Armenian Institute in 2019 and to have him there for the launch and to have him also present at the inaugural Kerr family lectureship we established in 2023 was an absolute thrill. Richard has had a legendary impact in so many fields, but most notably Armenian history, Armenian genocide studies, and efforts to preserve our culture and language. I was truly touched because he once told me while he did not compliment people easily, and I know many of you know what he meant, he told me that he was proud of me and whatever small contributions I've made to our community. And that really uh, was a special moment for me. I think we all admire Richard. We all aspire to have an impact on our community the way that Richard has had. And we are also fortunate to have somehow been in his orbit over the years. His legacy will live on at UCLA and beyond for many years to come. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person, but I'm with you in spirit. And I know we have much work to do ahead in honor of Richard and all the people who have contributed to his illustrious career. Thank you again. Thank you. We are very grateful to Eric for all of his contributions to our Institute and to UCLA. Um, so now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Sebu Aslanian, who currently holds the Richard Hovanissian Endowed Professorship in Modern Armenian History at UCLA. Sebu is also the inaugural director of our Armenian Studies Center within the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute, and he will offer also some welcoming remarks. So Sebu, I will uh, invite you to come to the podium. Thank you very much, Anne, for that introduction. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'd like to be. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you all, of course, for uh, gathering here to celebrate the magnificent accomplishments of the late Professor Obanisian. Today's event brings together a truly exceptional gathering of scholars, students, friends, and colleagues of Richard Obanisian. That we have such an embarrassment of riches, that's a good thing, is a testament to the exceptional skill and dedication of my esteemed colleague, Dr. Anne Karagosian and Hasmik, Hasmik Bagdasarian. I can only heartily express my thanks and admiration for the work that you have done, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of us here today. Professor Hovanisian was a formidable scholar and a pathbreaking innovator in the field of Armenian history, and the first holder of the Armenian Educational Foundation's Chair of Modern Armenian History at UCLA. In recognition of his towering accomplishments, the chair was renamed in his honor upon his retirement in 2011, following a storied 50-year career here at UCLA. Dr. Hovanisian was a mentor to several generations of scholars and a recipient of numerous awards and prizes, including a Guggenheim Fellowship. As the first holder of the chair, I am profoundly indebted to his vital contributions to the teaching and researching of Armenian history and for establishing the field of modern Armenian studies in North America on a firm foundation, a legacy that I'm sure will be carried in the future generations. Professor Hovanisian was not only a monumental figure in Armenian studies, but he was also a true pioneer in genocide studies in North America, a field that hardly existed before the early 1970s and owes an enormous debt uh, to his contributions. His role as an indefatigable champion for the recognition of the Armenian genocide will be remembered as one among the many meaningful and profound contributions that he has made. Like many scholars of Armenian history, Professor Hovanisian's dedication sprang from a deep desire to alleviate the incalculable losses and ineffable trauma 
caused by the Armenian genocide of 1915 to 1918, during which, of course, uh, much of the Armenian population in the Ottoman Empire was systematically exterminated. With the passing of our friend, mentor, colleague, last July, the whole of the Armenian Studies family suffered an irreparable loss and will be forever in Professor Hovannisian's debt for the many sacrifices that he has made to, that he made to build the scholarly foundation of modern Armenian history, a truly remarkable feat, especially since he did so at a time when there was no one else working in this area and he had no shoulders to stand on. So thank you. Thank you, Sabu. And now we are delighted to present a short biographical video that was made about our dear Richard Hovhannisian, uh, which concluded around the year 2000, 2001, but it nevertheless has a wonderful context that will augment, again, the short bio that you see in your programs or those of you who are watching online can see at our event website. So I will ask now that that video be shown and after the video, we will hear reflections on uh, dear Richard's life by his grandson, one of his many grandsons, got in Havanissian, a well-known writer, filmmaker, and producer. So after the film, you can just come up. Richard G. Havanissian was born in the San Joaquin Valley in the small central California town of Tulare on November 9th, 1932. He was the third of four sons born to Kaspar and Sirun Hovanesian, genocide survivors from Kharpert. Richard and his brothers, John, Ralph, and Vernon, spent their childhood on the family farm, harvesting crops, working the soil, and in little Richard's case, often stealing time to help his mother or read a book. His worldly travel started early, like this family adventure all the way to Yosemite in their Model T Ford, from Wilson Elementary and Cherry Avenue Junior High to Tulare Union High School, Richard was a model All-American student and a thespian too. Still, when graduating from high school as class valedictorian, young Richard was frustrated. For all those years, no matter how much he searched, he couldn't find any reference to Armenia in either his classes or his school books. His college years took him to the big city, Fresno, California. There, while a student at Fresno State College, Richard got involved in many international clubs on campus and was a member of the Model United Nations team along with Vartiter Kocholozian, the girl he'd later marry. At that time, they could only dream of having an independent Armenia represented in the United Nations. Fresno also brought him closer to other things Armenian, like the Armenian Youth Federation, where he made lifelong friends and drove cross-country from Fresno to the East Coast for annual conventions. He finished his undergraduate education at the University of California, Berkeley in 1954 with a Bachelor of Arts in History. But to pursue graduate studies with a focus on Armenian history, he'd first have to learn the language beyond the Kharpertsi dialect he'd grown up with. So he boarded the SS United States and headed to Beirut, Lebanon and the Nishan Palanjan Armenian College known as Jemaran. There, Hovhannisian studied with a man who would set him on what would become a lifelong mission. Under the wings of Simon Varatsyan, the last prime minister of the first independent Armenian Republic, Hovhannisian learned the Armenian language and history. The more he learned, the more he searched. 1956, Hovhannisian spent the year on a solo journey around the world, seeking out Armenian history and life. He visited near and far eastern countries and communities in his quest for living history and perspective. Upon his return to California, Hovhannisian joined the U.S. Army for two years. But he never strayed from the academic path, and while serving his country at Fort Ord and the Presidio in San Francisco, he started studying for his master's degree at University of California, Berkeley. At the same time, in 1957, Richard married Vartiter Kocholozian. She was one of only two women in her class at the University of California, San Francisco Medical School. In 1958, he received his master's degree in history and she her medical degree. They returned to Fresno, where Richard began teaching Armenian language and history, while Vartiter embarked on her internship and residency at Fresno General Hospital. Soon after, in 1959, came Rafi, 
the first of four children. A call to join the history faculty at UCLA brought the young family to Los Angeles in 1962. The 60s were a busy time. Three more children, Armen, Ani, and Garo. And while teaching at UCLA, Jovanissian was also an associate professor of history at Mount St. Mary's College. And so in the early 60s, Jovanissian started shaping the Armenian history curriculum at UCLA. He developed the undergraduate courses and initiated the PhD program in Armenian history. His own PhD was in Russian and Near Eastern history, which he earned at UCLA in 1966, because there was no such program yet offered in Armenian history. Ovenissian's dissertation traced Armenia's road to independence from 1914 to 1918. That dissertation, published as Armenia on the Road to Independence, was the launching pad for a masterful four-volume series dedicated to the First Armenian Republic of 1918 to 1921. The books that Hovhannisian expected would take a few years to publish took more than 30 years to complete, requiring decades of research in the world's archives and many late nights of reading, writing and revising in his office. At UCLA, while building the Armenian history curriculum from ground up, Professor Hovhannisian was also the Associate Director of the Near Eastern Studies Center for more than 20 years. Among his most important undertakings at UCLA was the introduction of the Armenian Oral History Program. This pioneering effort yielded more than 700 detailed recorded interviews with genocide survivors, virtually all of whom are gone today, but whose eyewitness accounts are documented forever. 1986 marked a turning point at UCLA. The Armenian Educational Foundation endowed a chair in modern Armenian history, ensuring that Armenian history would be taught in perpetuity at the university. The Bob and Nora Movell and Kaspat and Sirun Hovhannessian fellowships were also established to support graduate students of the AEF chair. After an extensive international search, Professor Hovhannessian was named the first holder of the chair in modern Armenian history. Thank you very much. The Armenian people survived the darker side of April, and our being here today gives witness to their revival and determination. The University of California has acknowledged the value and importance of Armenian studies and has welcomed a second chair. To date, Professor Hovhannisian has opened the door of Armenian history for thousands of students. And those who've attained graduate degrees in Armenian history under his direction are now teaching or researching at institutions across the country. Who's in the back row today in Berkeley? Oh, that's Ara, is it? That's right. Hello, Ara. Hovhannisian has even been able to teach at three places at once. He piloted the distance learning program at UCLA, where his classes were video conferenced to the campuses of UC Berkeley and Santa Barbara, and where students at those campuses could interact live with him. Yeah. And we're going to sign off with all three campuses. It's been a great pleasure being with you. Uh, and if you want to ask, talk a little bit more, Berkeley, just hold on there, and I'm going to say goodbye to my L.A. students in Santa Barbara. Great. Great. During a career that has spanned more than four decades, Professor Hovhannisian has kept the truth and relevance of the Armenian Genocide alive. Through thousands of lectures, conferences, classes, publications, and media appearances, he has managed to raise consciousness about mass violence, its roots and consequences. The historic lands of Armenia, the lands of Van, of Mush, of Sasun, of Erzurum, of, of Sepastia, of Kharpert, these lands were swept clean of a people that had lived there since the first millennia B.C. Hovhannisian's participation in several films, documentaries, and TV shows has also helped educate international audiences about Armenia, the Caucasus, and the Armenian Genocide. The genocide for the Armenians is almost... Equally consuming and determined has been his effort to gain world recognition of the genocide and to tear down the wall of denial. Don't get me up here to argue with someone whether or not a genocide took place. I mean, it took place. Let's talk about why it took place. It is within this framework that Professor Hovhannisian is involved with facing history and ourselves. 
Through this organization, he participates in seminars nationwide to share with middle and high school teachers effective ways to incorporate the Armenian experience into world history and human rights curricula. He was also instrumental in creating the Armenian chapter in the model curriculum on human rights and genocide. That curriculum is today available to all California schools. Professor Hovanissian's research and scholarly activities have taken him to more than 40 countries on six continents. One of life's most compelling moments came in Syria, where he came face to face with a desert he had read and taught about almost all of his life. There in the blistering heat of Derzor, where thousands marched to their death, came a grave discovery. A hill in the village of Margade, made entirely of Armenian bones. Other countries Professor Hovanissian has done fieldwork in include France, Israel, Germany, the United Kingdom. Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, Noble Lords, members of the House of Commons, ladies and gentlemen. Egypt, India, China, Japan, the former USSR, Armenia 42 times, and Turkey. In the year 2000, despite the obstacles, Professor Hovanissian addressed academicians and students about the genocide at Bogazici University, formerly Robert College in Istanbul. Despite his non-stop schedule, he does manage occasionally to take a breather on some of his outings like this one at Australia's Great Barrier Reef. Professor Hovanissian is the founder and three-time president of the Society for Armenian Studies. He also represented California on the Western Interstate Commission on Higher Education for 16 years. Hovanissian serves on the board of directors of nine scholarly and civic organizations and on five editorial boards. The professor's awards and honors are innumerable. He was honored by His Holiness Karakin I with a medal of St. Mesrop Mashtots for his advancement of Armenian studies. In 1990, he was elected to the Armenian Academy of Sciences, becoming the first social scientist living abroad to be so honored. He has received honorary doctorates from Yerevan in Artsakh State Universities and in 1998 was bestowed with a Movses Horenazi medal by the Republic of Armenia. Hovanissian has published more than 22 books and 50 scholarly articles, and according to his children, has filled their home with mountains of material that he and Vartite read, write, translate, and edit during every spare moment. In recent years, Hovanissian has initiated a popular conference series on historic Armenian cities and provinces, ranging from Van and Erzurum to Mush and Ani. The weekend-long conferences draw capacity crowds to UCLA, with each conference, Hovanissian brings many noted scholars from around the globe to address specific topics of interest. Through it all, Professor Richard and Dr. Vartiter Hovanissian haven't lost sight of life's greatest blessings. Garin, Daron, Van, Datev, Shushi, Sevan, Edi, Armen, Bahan, Sofin, and yet another on the way provide the smiles and inspiration needed to carry on. True fulfillment comes to those whose life's work and purpose live on in those who follow. So it is for Richard Hovanissian, who on March 2, 1992, watched proudly as his son Rafi, Foreign Minister of the Republic of Armenia, raised the tricolor of the newly independent republic at the United Nations in New York City. <laughs> I saw Hayastana Mezanov Gabre, Yev Menkeng, Borkov Kovikalov, Meg Kodunz Gazmelov, Borbiliyerash Kavoreng, Bormer Yerakuna, Mushtagan, Yev Havezmuna, I Shenki Arshev. Professor Hovanissian dedicated his first book to a generation whose ideals continue to inspire. With the banner flying high, we dedicate this to a man whose ideals continue to inspire, a national treasure. Professor Richard Ovanesian.
Thank you, uh, Dr. Karagosian and the team at the Promise Armenian Institute at UCLA for bringing this very important symposium to life. It's easy to say that Professor Hovanissian will always be remembered, but it's much more difficult to actually remember him and to invest so much time and resources um, into bringing memory to life. So I thank you, and I thank you all on behalf of the Hovanissian family for sharing in today's remembrance and tribute. In 2008, I set upon a journey to learn my family history and to write a book about it, and I knew how the book was going to open with the story of my great-grandfather, Kaspar Hovanissian, who survived the Armenian genocide. It was going to be a story of the loss of family and our ancestral homeland, and I knew it was going to be dramatic. I knew how the story was going to conclude, too, with the story of my father, an Armenian-American-born lawyer, Rafi Hovanissian, who would repatriate to Armenia in Soviet times and fight for independence and become Armenia's first foreign minister, and I was confident that that part of the story was going to be dramatic, too. I was much more concerned about the history that would fall in between. The seemingly quiet, academic narrative concerning my grandfather, Richard Hovanissian, the generation that came in between. And yet, as I began my sequence of interviews with my grandfather and began to uncover the trails of his personal history, I realized that I was dealing with the most dramatic history of them all. Because the history of my grandfather is the history of a boy who all alone, out of context, and without precedent in a single-minded obsession decides to stand against the tides of history and believe that he could reverse the tides of history. He was born and raised to be a farmer in the San Joaquin Valley of California, but he pursued the life of academia and ideas instead. He was never taught Armenian formally, and he defied his parents to move across the world to learn Armenian. He didn't get to take any Armenian history classes at his university because the field didn't exist, so his solution was to invent the field. He was named Richard, his brothers Ralph, Vernon, John, but he would name his kids, together with his wife, Dr. Vartiter Hovanissian, Rafi, Armen, Ani, and Gado. So while his father, Kaspar Hovanissian, lived the dramatic story of the Armenian genocide, and his son, Rafi, would live the dramatic story of Armenia's national rebirth, the reversal of fortune was actually accomplished by Richard Hovanissian. It was an event of the soul that occurred in that anxiously beating heart of a little boy who somehow decided to accept this impossible mission to reverse the tide of history. As a scholar, Richard Hovanissian did not fall for fashionable ideas that would come and go. He did not hide behind the opaque and the obscure. He took on the monumental subjects of modern Armenian history. He became known across the world as an important scholar of our national horror, the Armenian Genocide. Today, we'll be talking about the books he wrote and edited the important oral history collection which gave voice to the survivors of the Armenian genocide and very importantly the conferences he convened right here on this campus to 
explore what was lost beyond life during the Armenian Genocide, the schools and the churches and the homeland. If one day artificial intelligence is able to recreate lost civilizations, it will recreate Western Armenia in large part due to the scholarship of Richard Hovhannisian. But while he became a world authority on the Armenian Genocide and the history of our national horror, that isn't the history that he had sought to tell when he first got into the field. It was another history that had excited him, an alternative history, a history of hope that took place just a few years after the Armenian Genocide when a band of survivors and orphans convened in the city of Yerevan and declared the Republic of Armenia. Decades of research and writing resulted in the work of his life, Richard Hovhannisian's four-volume masterpiece, The Republic of Armenia, which is a parable, a premonition, and an, and an account of our national rebirth. I want to I want to say something that's very important to me and which we we neglect in talking about the professor's life which is that Professor Hovhannisian was an excellent writer. It 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 took a master storyteller to set the stage of history and to bring and show how the forces and ideas of history clashed upon these small Armenian people and their small Armenian nation. And it took a, a literary, a keen, sensitive literary mind to craft those sentences. So measured and so reserved, and yet with the dew of poetry and romance at the, the very tips More and more, we mistakenly say and think that writing is about conveying information. Writing is about creating an experience. And in the case of Richard Hovhannisian, he created the experience of being Armenian, which is hard fought and troubling and rocky and mountainous and tragic and heroic but always, always elegant. <laughs> Professor Hovhannisian didn't just sit on the histories he wrote either, as many of you know. He packed those books and many others, including the one I ended up writing, into carry-on suitcases and traveled the world with them. He believed that history isn't just to be written. It has to be fought for and marketed, sold. At the grandest academic conferences and the smallest of community halls, he became our history's grand ambassador. He ripped out the weeds of denial from the catalogs of publishers in faraway universities and on, an, on his own home turf. We'll hear later today about the episode of the denialist Turkish chair at UCLA. Of course, he created his own chair and held the AEF chair in modern Armenian history, which has now been renamed for him. He thought of the future. And he wanted to ensure in his life's work that Armenian history would be taught in perpetuity, not only here, but in institutions across the country. And he supported the creation of chairs in universities across the land. He testified in Sacramento and Washington to ensure that Armenian history and the study of genocide is properly integrated into the national thinking and curriculum. He took real part in the creation of many Armenian organizations 
he subjected himself to let's let's admit the, the, the unglamorous and often miserable work of trying to heal fractures and bringing people together. He built bridges with other communities and among other disciplines too. He was looking back, but always moving forward, preparing for battles that we could not yet see and that he would not be here to fight. His children would have to do that And their children, and the children who followed. And with each new member of the family, I saw how uniquely he approached each soul, how careful he was, how concerned, how he took seriously the differences in each of us and how he was so attuned to the condition of each of our minds and hearts. Because we, his family, were to be his successors, and by his family, I, I mean his students too, of course. He treated you no differently. Many of his students, the thousands of them, he educated, inspired. Many of them became great scholars. Many of you are here today. And even those who didn't become, become scholars and went on to live other lives and in other professions still took with them the fire that he had ignited in their hearts. If he touched you or challenged you or pulled you into some kind of moment, then he entered a lifelong covenant with you. And he knew you. He knew your parents, and he knew their parents. He knew where they came from. He knew when they left. He knew where they settled. He knew you by where you came from. And he knew it where it was that you were going and how you were going to fit in. In the treasury of his mind, I think the greatest treasure was that hidden map that connects all of us. And I'm grateful that at least for today, that map isn't hidden and that we are together again and we are connected again just as he saw us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Godin, for that uh, amazing commentary and very eloquent tribute to your grandfather. So we are ready now to begin uh, our first session of the day. Um, this one is on the subject of Professor Hovhannisian's contributions to Armenian genocide research, specifically pertaining to historical documentation, efforts by him and others in refuting genocide denial, uh, as well as um, efforts for official recognition by governments, including the U.S. government. So our speakers today will reflect on Professor Hovhannisian's contributions in the subject that is listed, but also perhaps offer some personal reflections on his impact on their lives. So our first speaker in this session is our own Dr. Tanner Akcham who is our inaugural director of the Armenian Genocide Research Program within the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute. So, Tanner, please come to the podium. Good morning. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, organizing for this, I mean, amazing event started yesterday. Thank you, uh, Nanor and uh, uh, Asmik, uh, helping creating this event. 
it's really a great honor for me to speak on Richard Hovenetsian's contribution to Armenian genocide research. And I think my PowerPoint should be there, I hope. Uh, first, I would like to share a few personal memories about uh, Richard. I met him for the first time in 1995 while attending a big conference on the Armenian genocide in Yerevan. I was living in Germany then, and it was the first time that a Turkish academic was attending such a conference, and it aroused some interest. Of course, Richard also wanted to meet me. We met for the breakfast one morning, but as I did not speak English, and since unfortunately there was no interpreter, we spent much of the meal looking at each other, occasionally exchanging some yes and no's as we smiled at each other across the table. This was my first communication with Richard. Now I would like to share a couple images, photos with you. In the first image, you can see Richard in my village in 2013 when he was visiting my mom with a group of Armenian friends. Some of them are sitting here in the room. The second photo is from Los Angeles. On top of it, you see it. Uh, December 2005, you may recall the large conference he organized at UCLA to introduce three Turkish scholars to the Armenian community. In the third image, we are in Yerevan on the same panel. The first experts of the Armenian genocide studies were the survivors like Aram Andonian and Father Krikor Gergerian. While their works has been very valuable, foundational even, it was not academic. Together with Vahakan Dadrian, Richard Hovenissian is rightly considered the founder of the scholarly field of Armenian genocide studies. These two individuals were a bridge between the first generation and our own. If we can speak of a fledgling stage of the Armenian genocide research, then these two, Dadrian and Hovanesian, served as its icebreakers, forging a path through a frozen sea of ignorance, indifference, and denial. But the great challenge they faced was not only the denialist policies of the Turkish state, it was also the avoidance or outright indifference of the academic world. In the United States, most historians of the late Ottoman period tended not to focus on or even completely ignore the series of massacres that taken together can be seen as the components of the Armenian genocide. Focusing on such subject was often dismissed as an expression of narrow-minded ethnocentrism by members of the targeted ethnic groups. Richard often told me that at gatherings of the Middle East Studies Association, one of the most important organizations in our field, he and other Armenians were not even allowed to have a table to sell books and let alone present papers on the Armenian genocide. If we consider Armenian genocide studies to be an established field today, we owe it to their tireless efforts of Richard and those like him. Those he knew, Richard, are aware that he frequently denied being a genocide scholar. He repeated this several times to me. And he would repeat this in almost every speech he gave. What bothers him most is what bothers every Armenian or every person whose heart beats for justice, denial of the truth. The denial of the Armenian genocide was his greatest regret. And not only because he was Armenian or justice seeker, he was also upset because it prevented him from practicing his profession as a historian. Yet, despite his adamant denial, he was and remained one of the principal founders of the Armenian genocide studies. Let's take a look his publications. Here are the image of only five books. It omits countless other books and articles that deal with the Armenian genocide. These five books, which he edited, contains a total of 75 articles, each one dealing with a different aspect of Armenian genocide. There is hardly an academic field that 
isn't covered in these book works history law philosophy literature art music film education memory studies comparative genocide studies and transitional justice are just some of these fields he was well informed of the works in all these fields in his latest book on the subject he divided the content according to these titles at this point i would like to take a closer look three of the book that to show the enormity of his contribution the first one published in 1986 the armenian genocide in perspective it is of historical importance it brought together papers presented at 1982 tel aviv conference which is considered the springboard of armenian genocide studies the book was first in many ways his article Richard's article, Armenian Genocide and the Patterns of Denialism, is still the main reference article for those dealing with Turkish denialism. I use in my classes every year. Robert Melson's article, Provocation and Nationalism, has become a classic in our field. That Richard included a second article on oral history and the Armenian Genocide should be considered revolutionary for its time. In 1992, he published the collection, The Armenian Genocide, History, Politics, Ethics. Each paper in this book has also subsequently became a classics in our field. James Reed's Total War, Robert Melson's Revolution and Genocide, Richard's own altruism during Armenian Genocide are just few examples. Ionis Hosiotis, Pioneering article, Armenian Genocide and the Greeks, directly treats the relationship between different ethnic groups during the genocide, a topic that other scholars only begin to contend with after 2010s. In his foreword, Richard deals at length with the concept of security. To my surprise, I discovered when I reread them, he dealt with the concept of security and its relationship with genocide and denial. Those who knows the field know the field. This shows how far sightedness and his vision for the future. As you know, today security studies and genocide studies are at the cutting edge. It's simply not possible to go through all his books here, but it must be highlighted the extent to which Richard has not only encouraged and brought together people from a wide range of disciplines to write about Armenian genocide, but also made a major contribution to the field through his own work on denialism and oral history. Moreover, he has not hesitated to tackle some of the thorniest issues in genocide studies. Foremost among these is the question of when and how the decision for genocide was taken. The classic formulation is thus. War was the Armenian genocide, the result of a wartime radicalization or a premeditated continuum. Richard even made this question, which I called Ronsuni Wahakan Dadrian controversy in our field, the title of his article in his 2007 book. The Armenian Genocide, Cultural and Ethical Legacies. He was, he very aptly argued that these two seemingly opposing positions are not contradictory nor mutually exclusive. He believed that the Armenian Genocide was premeditated, but he also correctly pointed out that mass killings are the product of contingencies and long-term trends or mentalities. And therefore, these two extremes should be seen as complementary, not contradictory. Today, most theoreticians of genocide studies agree that there are two set of factors in place in genocidal process. Namely, dispositional ones, attitudes and ideologies, and contextual, situational ones. And to pit them against each other is plainly wrong. It is generally accepted that the situation, the contextual factors, not only interact 
with dispositional factors to affect behavior, but also shape and change those dispositions. People do not just react to the situation, they also affect and shape them, even when not always aware of the extent to which they do. And finally, situations themselves do not even objectively exist, but need to be cognitively constructed by the people they then affect. Based on these theoretical premises, I personally consider Richard's writing as an attempt trying to merge both aspects, and this has been an important contribution to the field of Armenian genocide research. Richard wrote this article in 2007 and concluded it with this hard belief pro prophecy. This is a prophecy I cannot describe a different way. He, he says, it is probable that more precise and compelling evidence, perhaps even the proverbial smoking gun, exist among the extensive archival materials and private collections in Turkey, he wrote and mentioned that a few Turkish colleagues have begun to explore the subject. Hopefully, like German historians, a new generation of Turkish scholars will be able to find the missing link that will remove any existing tentativeness regarding genocide that took place under the canopy of the Great War. In his, Richard shows a great foresight, and without minimizing the work of all other scholars, it was as if he was foreshadowing my discovery of Gergerian archive and the book and articles follow. Indeed, these words proved precedent coming at, at prescient, coming at a time when my articles which would later appear in Journal of Genocide Research 2019 and 2022, in which I presented the definitive documentation on the extermination process of the Armenians based on Ottoman documents. We were not even in the incipient stage. I would like to leave you with a final observation. Here, an attempt to compare the scholarship of my beloved mentor, Bahakun Dadrian, and of Richard. If you read the works of these two giants, you will see that there is an important difference in their approach to the topic. Dadrian's work reads more like a prosecutor's indictment that the effort of someone, try, uh, uh, to, uh, someone trying to understand events. He accuses, lays out evidence, and convicts. Richard's work, on the contrary, can be read more as an attempt to understand. This can be seen in the way in which he is always mindful to include articles from different disciplines art, literature, history, political science, law, and transitional justice. I could say a lot about the methodological differences between these two giants, but it seems to primarily stem from their education. Dadrian studied law. Richard studied history. Law is the science of judging in the name of justice, whereas in history, understanding is favored over judgment. In 1975, Michael Hagopian made his first Emmy-nominated documentary on the Armenian Genocide and rightly titled it Forgotten Genocide. And when Richard wrote in his book 2007 in the introduction, he says what once referred to as the forgotten genocide is no longer forgotten. He knew that this was in large part the result of his own work. May he rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tonner. And uh, next in this session, we will hear from Dr. Bedros Dermatosian, who is Professor of Modern 
Middle East History in the Department of History at the University of Nebraska, Lincoln. So I will ask Bedros to come to the podium uh, after which we will have our panelists here. Thank you, Dr. Karagouzian, for the invitation. Can you hear me? All right. I've given so many talks. I've given so many talks in the past, but this is the most painful one, I should say. It is painful because we keep referring to Professor Hovanisian in the past tense. It should be present tense and future tense because he still is with us and will remain with us forever. It's an honor to be here today to respect a historical figure, renowned scholar, a mentor, and a teacher by the name of Professor Richard Hovanisian, the Dean of Modern Armenian History, who established the foundations for the interdisciplinary approach to studying the Armenian Genocide. In this short presentation, I will discuss the impact on me as a person his role in putting the basis of interdisciplinary approaches to the Armenian Genocide and his struggle against denialists in the field of Middle Eastern and Ottoman and Turkish studies. I have known Professor Hovanisian for the past three decades, during which time he became a father figure and a mentor, despite the fact that I didn't go to UCLA. He raised in me the passion to pursue modern Armenian history even before I met him. I remember that in the early 90s, during my undergraduate years at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, I spent hours at the library sifting through the DS section. Anyone who knows academia, you know what DS section is? That's where I encountered Professor Hovanisian's books. His books inspired a young undergraduate who grew up in the Muslim quarter of the old city of Jerusalem and lit in him the torch of pursuing modern Armenian history. From the Muslim quarter to Columbia University and from MIT to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Professor Hovanisian has closely followed my career path. He stood by my side at the darkest moment in my life. And some of you know what I'm talking about. Before I moved to Nebraska, he and Dr. Vartiter flew to Omaha, took a car, drove to the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, met the chair, checked my office to make sure that I was in safe hands. Even I found about this after a few weeks. They both wanted to make sure that I was in a good place. Being elected to the Executive Council was a great honor. He encouraged me to run to the SAS. He appointed me as the secretary. Back then was a great thing to become the secretary under Professor Hovanisian. And it was like, you know, major, major position. And eventually I became the vice president and served two terms as the president of the Society for Armenian Studies. He was not, as I said, only a mentor, but also a father figure. It was because of him that I met my better half, Dr. R.P. Siayan. While my parents were not able to come to my wedding due to health problems. He spoke on the, on, during the wedding on behalf of my parents. After finishing four volumes dedicated to the Republic of Armenia, Professor Hovanisian dedicated his research and career battling denial of the Armenian genocide, resurrecting the history of the Armenian towns and villages of the Armenian provinces of the Ottoman Empire, and writing textbooks on modern Armenian history. As a scholar of the Armenian Genocide, he has contributed more to the discipline than others in the field. He edited multiple volumes on different facets of the Armenian Genocide, including historical, literary, and artistic perspective. 
Yet the question is, what drove Professor Hovanisian to dedicate his time and efforts to exploring the field of Armenian genocide? In one of his essays, he says, and I quote, it was the Turkish government's campaign of denial that pushed me into the arena of the Armenian genocide studies through what my through what may be called the back door. I had not chosen this depressing subject. It was the reprehensible action of a government to wipe clean the slate of history, just as its predecessor had wiped clean an entire people that aroused in me a sense of moral indignation and a commitment to engage in the struggle of memory against forgetting despite the highly unfavorable odds." End quote. Thus, Hovanisian concentrated on exploring different facets of the Armenian genocide. He and his peers were acting in a different time, where denial of the Armenian genocide was considered as the norm. Along with his colleagues, he resisted the stifling voices of Armenian voices within Middle Eastern and Ottoman studies, which had relegated Armenian studies to a second-class status. He fought for the relevance for the relevance of Armenian studies within these fields and tirelessly fought against the efforts to marginalize Armenian issues and the denial of the Armenian genocide. He was not only fighting the denialist propaganda propagated by prominent figures in the field of Ottoman and Middle Eastern studies, but also that of Turkish state that poured millions of dollars into Western academia to obfuscate the historical veracity of the Armenian genocide. Middle Eastern Studies Association, MESA, and the Ottoman and Turkish Studies Association were complicit in the past with denialist venture. Even today, there are major denialists within these associations. For example, in the far first decades of the inception of its inception, MESA failed to address and condemn the campaign of denial of the Armenian genocide launched by consecutive Turkish governments in the U.S. academic sphere. This was well-orchestrated campaign in which many prominent Middle Eastern and Ottoman Turkish studies scholars took an active role. Over half of a half century, Professor Hovanisian brought together more than 70 scholars to contribute to his edited volumes on the Armenian genocide. Professor Hovanisian was not obsessed with the smoking gun. How many times do we need to prove that what happened to the Armenians was a genocide. We don't need a document to prove that. We don't, the process itself indicates that it was a genocide. These volumes demonst demonstrate the mul multifaceted and interdisciplinary approaches to the Armenian genocide, including but not limited to philosophy, literature, art, music, history, historiography, denial, education, politics, and law. People tend to think erroneously that his first book on the genocide was published in 1986, 1986, but his first book on the Armenian genocide was published in 1980 with the title The Armenian Holocaust, a bi bibliography relating to the deportations, massacres, and dispersion of the Armenian people. It included bibliography of books in Western languages relating to the Armenian genocide, memoirs, eyewitness accounts, especially by non-Armenians, general studies and archival materials. While literature on the Armenian genocide was primarily published in Armenian and inaccessible to the Western academic audience, Hovanisian took up upon himself the task of furnishing the history of the Armenian genocide in English by adhering to the highest academic standards. I'm not going to go into detail on his different volumes, as Tanner did, but I'm going to I'm going to conclude because it would be redundant to go over these volumes again. And my conclusion is the following: While historical events and transformations play an important role in history in shaping history. Historical agents also shape the history of their nations, communities, 
and states. Professor Hovhannisian became a historical agent who shaped the field of Armenian studies and fought single-handedly against denialism orchestrated by one of the world's most powerful nations, the Republic of Turkey. While he has physically passed away, his perseverance, contributions to the field, and scholarship should stand as an ultimate model to every young scholar who strives to walk in his footsteps. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bedros, for your come. Ah, don't, don't forget your glasses. Yes. Okay. So next in this, uh, we will introduce our panelists who will come to, again, talk about different facets of this subject, Armenian genocide research, documentation, denial, recognition, but also personal reflections. So I will call to these seats. Uh, Dr. Harry, uh, Henry Terrio, Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs and Adjunct Professor of Philosophy at Worcester State University, Dr. Rubina Perumian, an independent scholar, um, author and researcher and former lecturer in Armenian Studies here at UCLA, and Professor Levon Marashlian, Emeritus Professor of History at Glendale Community College. So panelists, I invite you to come and sit in these seats. And now in my role as moderator, I will take one of the seats as well. These microphones, I believe, work. <laughs> is, it, is it live now? Ah, very good. I think they're all live. All right. So... For our first panelists, we have heard from Tonner and from Bedros about Professor Richard Hovhannisian's long-term contributions, not only to enhancing the study and documentation of the Armenian Genocide, moving it more prominently to the public eye, but also his efforts to uh, push back at and refute denial of the Armenian Genocide. Perhaps each of you could offer your own perspectives on his contributions and how it had perhaps a lasting impact on the field as well as perhaps you personally. So maybe we'll start with Henry and move to Rubina and then Levon. Thanks so much. Uh, it'll, it'll, is it on? Okay, uh, there we go. All right. Not that I can't shout, but it's good to have a mic. Um, um, as is evident from what we heard last night and have heard so far today, we could spend weeks and months detailing all of the contributions Richard Ovenessian made as a scholar, an Armenian, and as a human being, and still have much more to say. Uh, in my six minutes, hopefully, um, I can, of course, add only a tiny bit more. Richard Ovenessian's brilliance was not simply in the remarkable histories he produced, but in his innovative reframing of historical scholarship itself to engage the complex issues that are raised when one conceives history from a minority perspective, from an outsider's position, and produces the history of a group the very existence of which, let alone the existence of scholarship about it, was in question throughout that history and remains so as one constructs accounts of that history. I will focus on just two aspects of that reframing. First, much of the discussion last night and today has detailed Richard's tremendous impact on Armenian studies and Armenian students. Yet his impact went far beyond that and continues to impact far beyond that. While he would say, and Tanner alluded to this, uh, he would say he was not a historian of the 1915 Armenian genocide. The reality is that he contributed immensely to scholarship in what is so special is that his work was recognized from the very beginning of the development of the field of comparative genocide studies by non-Armenian scholars as essential to that emerging field. Before figures such as Vahakan Dadrian, Tanner Akjam, and many others made their incredible impacts, for these non-Armenian scholars, and rightly so, Richard was the expert on the Armenian genocide and was able to bridge the divide between viewing it as an event within the history of Armenians from ancient time to present and its core position within the history of genocide as a whole human issue 
as first conceived by Raphael Lemkin. More than anyone else, Richard brought the Armenian genocide to the community of non-Armenian scholars. Indeed, it is not just that he was the representative of scholarship on the Armenian genocide to the first founders of this field, people such as Israel Charney and Roger Smith, um, and in the International Association of Genocide Scholars they created, but that his significant presence from the beginning had an important role in shaping that field. More than any other scholar engaged in the Armenian genocide, he made study of the case central to that field. Indeed, because of his efforts more than anything else, in the 21st century, along with the Rwanda genocide and the Holocaust, the Armenian genocide has become a referent case by which insights um, on the Armenian genocide in the literature on such things as ideological factors in genocide, the role of structural hierarchies, complex political dynamics between uh, future perpetrators and victims, the centrality of mass violence against women and girls in genocide, and especially denial, are applied to a range of other cases. Take a moment to think about how different that is today, where the Armenian genocide is central to scholarship around the world from when Richard first couldn't find references to Armenian history in any sources he was looking for. The way Armenian scholars once saw the Holocaust as a standard of measure of the Armenian case, now scholars of other genocides view the Armenian genocide. Not only did Richard produce excellent scholarship on the 1915 genocide, but he advocated persuasively for a special role in uh, comparative genocide studies for it. As one example, he famously emphasized that the Armenian genocide is one of the rare instances of genocide executed through all five of the methods definitive of genocide in the UN Convention. Of special importance in this regard is his landmark 1998 chapter in Remembrance and Denial, denial of the Armenian genocide in comparison with Holocaust denial. His great innovation was to move beyond comparing the Holocaust and the Armenian genocide or more to the point, trying to show similarities of the Armenian genocide to the Holocaust in order to more firmly establish the veracity of the Armenian genocide to a comparison of their denials. This was game changing. This trend, uh, this new uh, work drove a trend in comparative genocide studies, but also enriched the study of Holocaust denial by offering new insights um, beyond those that Holocaust scholars themselves had made and providing an opportunity for them to engage the denial phenomenon itself as broader and more complex than Holocaust denial alone, while at the same time transforming denial of the Armenian genocide from an isolating burden of Armenians to part of a broader trend regarding not just genocide, but human rights and other issues. That one brief chapter by Richard was the impetus for me to the most central um, focal area of my scholarship over my entire career, looking at denial as a pervasive general phenomenon in the late modern era. The second contribution by Richard impacted me and so many others in a very practical way. Those of us in academia know well, uh, only too well, that the norm for a prominent scholar in any field is self-focus and the desire to develop adherents, echoers, and even acolytes and disciples in a, in, as a way of demonstrating that scholar's importance. Richard's profound difference in this regard has been perhaps the most important factor in the development of Armenian genocide studies and Armenian studies more broadly. At a career point where many celebrated scholars rest on their past ac accomplishments and consolidate their statuses, Richard introduced a fundamental innovation into how Armenian genocide st studies developed that should be a model for all fields. He used his unquestionable position as a major figure in U.S. and international academic circles, not to impose his views on others, not to feed his ego, not to derive benefits for himself, but quite the opposite, to create spaces for literally hundreds of emerging scholars. Perhaps influenced by his geographical location in L.A., he became a great talent scout for Armenian genocide studies and Armenian studies more broadly. He began running major conferences, which we've heard about, and editing collections, which we've also heard about. And through those conferences and collections, fostered a comprehensive interdisciplinary scholarship on the Armenian genocide that defines what that scholarship is at its best. Going back through those conference programs and collections, you see scholar after scholar for whom Richard opened the door. You see again and again his identifying important contributions that went far beyond his particular area of expertise, 
not merely tolerating psychological, philosophical, aesthetic, and other scholarship, but embracing it with not just an intellectual openness, but a genuine supportive concern for the advancement of each author. Richard's inclusion of me in multiple works early in my career, especially the 2003 book from which this uh, symposium takes its name, were crucial to my having a career at all. What is more, he did not treat us, however junior, inexperienced, and sorely in need of guidance, with condescension or as second-class scholars, but quite the opposite, encouraged us in all sorts of ways to make our unique contributions, and Garin used put it so well, he knew us all, to make our unique contributions to an area that was a deep passion for him, not just an intellectual exercise. I certainly experienced the demanding Professor Hovenessian that we talked about last night, uh, but I also experienced the open-minded colleague, Richard Hovenessian, with a brilliant mind that could grasp things that were new, and really even the student Richard, who was always learning from other people, always engaging, always developing new ways of thinking. It is no exaggeration to say that his efforts in this regard, more than any other factor, built the human structure of Armenian genocide studies. I never took a course with Richard, and how I wish I could have, but have long felt much, uh, very much his student and mentee. Richard, it is impossible for me to ex express how much gratitude I feel for what you did for me and so many others, and thus I think the future of Armenia. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Rubina Parimian. It should be on when you start. Is it on? Yes. OK. Uh, it was a struggle for me to squeeze whatever what I wanted to say about Richard Ovanissian in five to six minutes. Uh, uh, fortunately, I had the opportunity last night to uh, talk about the impact that he had, the role that he played in my academic life. So I will just read through what I mm, thought was my perspective of Professor Hovannisian's career. I would uh, characterize Richard Hovannisian as a unique combination, a rare uh, synthesis of an outstanding scholar of Armenian uh, studies, a trailblazer, and a staunch activist, an unyielding crusader of high thought. He often used to say, as we heard before, that he is not a genocide scholar, and his expertise is in another area of Armenian history. But he did more than any other genocide scholar would do to disseminate awareness of the Armenian genocide, knowledge about the Armenian genocide, fight for its recognition, world recognition, and against denialism. He did not lock himself in an ivory tower, as uh, the metaphor goes for some scholars, but opened to the community. Uh, he dedicated his uh, precious time to the community affairs, starting from the that co complicated uh, process, the entire process, of lobbying, uh, constructing, uh, testifying in courts, uh, and finally erecting the Armenian Genocide Memorial up atop Bicknell Park against very heavy, very strong Turkish opposition. He lobbied in Sacramento for the inclusion of teaching of the Armenian Genocide uh, in public schools, as he did in New York City's Department of Education and Massachusetts uh, uh, Board of Education, State Board of Education. He helped initiate the organization of the Armenian scholars, the Society for Armenian Scholars, to fight the Turkish hegemony in the Middle Eastern Studies Association the home of Turkish denial of Armenian genocide. He reached far and near, testifying in United States, 
uh, and in, in international courts, like the uh, uh, Permanent People's Tribunal in Paris, uh, in governmental uh, media, uh, governmental uh, platforms, and in media, to uh, advocate, to promote the truth of the Armenian genocide, the indisputable truth about the Armenian genocide. They even testified for the sons of... Hold, hold the mic up. Yeah, he testified in for uh, in defense of the sons of the genocide survivors. You remember the LA five, that some of whom had taken justice in their hands and acted the way not acceptable for today's civilized society. His focus was the inherited uh, trauma of the genocide they experienced and the ever-sharpening memory of it, the ever-sharpening uh, frustration, the uh, 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 psychological effect that was caused by the ongoing flagrant Turkish uh, uh, denialism. He rallied forces to expose the lies of denialists and the leaders of Turkish denialism in academia, such as Stanford Shah, Hitlari, uh, 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 Justin McCarthy, and others. In one of our conversations, and there were many, during my uh, 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 academic uh, cooperations with him, he shared my, uh, my concern about the nuances of the nihilism, explaining and contextualizing and historicizing to the extent that it might lead to rational explanation and even to veiled justification. He was concerned. He was worried about, and I'm quoting his words exactly, the inherent dangers. He was concerned about the inherent dangers and very real potential of uh, exploitation of seemingly scholarly contextualization. But unfortunately, he was one of the few who could define, who could identify these nuances. It has been 45 years now. Since, I, since the day that I started my studies at Near Eastern Languages and Cultures Department at UCLA. Uh, of course, thanks to uh, his mediation with Professor uh, Avedi Sanjian, who had rejected my appeal, saying that I'm a civil engineer and I have nothing to do with uh, humanities and with the Armenian studies. I better go back to my own uh, field of uh, engineering and work there. And oh, I owe everything that I did. And I tried my best. I, uh, I did everything I could. What I produced, I owe it to Professor Hovanisian for opening my path into this area, into this field, being my guide as everybody witnesses, as everybody uh, uh, mentions that. I repeat that too. He was my guide. He was my role model. He was my mentor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rubina. And next we'll hear from Levon. I was first introduced to Dr. Hovanisian through a non-Armenian at the University of Illinois in Chicago Circle in a European history course. 
uh, uh, we had to do a paper. And I chose uh, the Eastern question. And the professor said, Eastern question, Eastern question. I know everything about the Eastern question. You're not going to teach me anything. And uh, you'll get a C, maybe B plus if you're lucky. He said, why don't you do something about the Armenian question? And I said, what's that? This in the early 70s in, in, in Chicago. I was disconnected from Armenian uh, life. I said, no, I want to do the Eastern question. Why, he said. Because it's big, everybody knows about it. Yes, I said. He said, well, you know, you won't get a good grade. If you're lucky, you'll get a B. But he said, I know nothing about the Armenian question. And in the Eastern question, I noticed Armenian question sometimes comes up, but I know nothing about it. If you do a paper on the Armenian question, you might get an A. I said, okay, <laughs> I'll do anything for an A. Okay, so uh, and through that, and he knew, he knew, and this was, he wasn't Armenian, he, knew, he had heard of Hovanisyan. So through that circuitous way, I learned about him. And when I got my BA at the University of Illinois, um, I decided to come to LA to meet him. And um, I came out, I, I saw him for the first time in 1974. And, um, and I, I, I beat you by a little, what were you? What, by five years. By five years, 1974. And, um, uh, I applied. It was very helpful with you know admissions and uh, and everything. It was always supportive, uh, and um, not just with me. All the all the students. He was supportive, not just academically, but also um, he knew the nooks of nooks and crannies of finding financial aid for his students. He'd pull strings here, he'd turn this here. He said, "Come over here. I, I just found out about something." In my case, I did not need financial aid too much because uh, I, had the, I had the GI Bill, and I was also working as a mechanic. But he was very good at just helping students in many ways. Um, well, I began studying under him, and I forgot what, whether it was a paper or uh, a report or test I wrote. And the first one, and he, he, he wrote this at the bottom. He, he, he marks up all over the place, destroys it. At the bottom, he wrote, Adequate, but not inspired. Boy. Wow, it hurts. <laughs> but it, it pushed me to try, to try harder. And um, let me go to oral history, the oral history project. Uh, he initiated it. He, 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 he designed it. And uh, I, with, with other students, we did so many oral history interviews. And uh, one of the projects was to bring us, bring us to Fresno. And I forgot the year. Was it? Uh, I forgot what year it was. Um, he said there are a lot of people in Fresno, so he took me and a few other students who had already done good oral history uh, uh, interviews. So we went up to Fresno in my 1965 green Chevy van as a group. And what he did is he had, he had already prepared all the survivors. He had already prepared. He signed uh, uh, him to me. She, you know, he, he had arranged everything in, uh, in great detail. And, um, and he chose me to interview his mother, Sirun, and, uh, in, in her home, which was, was a especially moving experience uh, uh, experience for me. Uh, and we did so many interviews in a short, in a short period of time. Um, his research uh, is, uh, the, his research is, uh, is uh, it has a, it's a seminal research with, with uh, long lasting, long lasting impact to what he does, what he produced, and through his, um, his many students. Um, let me go to Mesa. It was mentioned before. Professor Hovhannisian stressed and encouraged 
his students, mostly his graduate students, uh, to go to Mesa conferences, where, as it was already mentioned, we were not very welcome. There are so many panels organized by, not by Armenians, organized by uh, uh, Turkish scholars and others, Middle Eastern specialists, and obviously they were not, you know, the Armenian uh, question, the genocide, uh, was either never mentioned or mentioned, you know, through the side in a negative way. And what Kovanistan did is he organized himself and he encouraged others to organize panels on the Armenian genocide, specifically using the term Armenian genocide, which wasn't a popular thing in those days. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the uh, 1980s and 1990s. It wasn't popular. Um, at that time. And um, on something personal, uh, always with him was Vartitir. And she was like a, a mother hen watching over him personally, getting him ready to go. One time I remember uh, they were packing, she said, Dikran Shabigat Mimornar. Every detail, she would help him academically with his research, with his writing, translation, but also she was like a, I don't know, like a, a mother hen, just taking care of him uh, in a way, reminding him of, uh, of everything. And at the Mesa conferences, she was always there supporting. She wasn't a scholar herself, but she was always around and she had this uh, uh, small camera. She would take pictures all over the place. Now, for young people over there, you say, why would she take a camera? Doesn't she have a smartphone? In those days, no smartphone, folks. So she had this little camera, and she'd go around. Oh, so I'm going to drop this. Click, 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 taking mostly pictures of her husband and others. And she was like a, almost like a, I don't know how, uh, how to describe it. Um, his, there's so much to say about him, but his, perhaps his uh, biggest, one of the most important things he did, it was mentioned already, uh, the uh, Turkish chair was going to be organized at, at, uh, at UCLA. It was 1997, I think it was 96, 97, it became quite a controversy, and uh, it was going to be funded by the Turkish government, I think a million and a half dollars, a million, a million and a half. And it was going to pass. It was all universities like to get big money like that. So it was a it was a it was a done deal, basically. But what he did is first he organ he encouraged his students and the UCLA, I mean Student Association, to do whatever they could, preparing uh, writings and things in the in the Bruin paper in other papers and so forth, demonstrations, lobbying, all kinds of activity. Uh, I wrote uh, something in the Ghana News Press about it. We spread the word, but ultimately, that means nothing. The bottom line is, it's an internal department decision. And the only people who have a say on this is not even the whole university, the history department. And uh, it, it came to a point where there was a final, after all the efforts he made, uh, there was, uh, I can find the date someplace, uh, December 5, 1997. After all the work he did with his colleagues, there was a final meeting, uh, in a bunch hall, sixth floor, bunch hall, a final meeting. And over there, I wasn't there, obviously. Only the, the members of the history department were there, but I heard from him. And uh, what happened is a long debate, lasting a long time, and he presented documents, he presented evidence, and ultimately, when the vote was taken on December 5, 1997, the vote was um, set, uh, 18 to 17, won by the chair was, was, was successful by 18 to 17. Imagine what would have happened if he had not been there. The chair would have been established at that time. It probably would have existed until today. And you can imagine what 
the consequences of that would be. So I'm going to close by um, uh, paraphrasing what Winston Churchill said while England was being carpet bombed during World War II. And uh, he said something that a lot of you probably are aware of. I'm going to paraphrase that. Uh, should the legacy of uh, the historian of the Republic of Armenia, who put the Republic of Armenia on the map, should his legacy last a thousand years, that day in the history department will be his finest hour. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Levon. And thanks to all of our panelists for your really insightful comments. So uh, you can now return to your seats. Thank you so much. Amazing panel. And so now, uh, once again, as the moderator of this session, our second session is now, again, focuses on the Armenian genocide and research, but in particular focusing on the survivor testimony, uh, acquisition, documentation, and in fact, archiving as uh, has been mentioned, uh, Richard Hovanissian and his students here at UCLA uh, took over a thousand Armenian genocide survivor testimonies. And these are now uh, fully archived and um, reside at the USC Shoah Foundation, one of our co-sponsors of this event. So our first speaker on this subject and also with personal reflections is Dr. Carla Garabetian, who is a well-known filmmaker, director, writer, also board member at the Armenian Film Foundation. So Carla, I will ask you to come up and offer a few remarks. Well, thank you for asking me to take part in today. I'm very honored to be amongst this very esteemed group of scholars, colleagues, friends, family members. Thank you. What would he have thought of this day? All of us gathered here together talking about him and his amazing legacy. I can imagine his response. Well, as long as something useful can come of it. Okay. Use my work as a catalyst to move forward. It's not about me. It's our collective goals. Now, my connection is that I work with Michael Hagopian at the Armenian Film Foundation, and Richard Hovanesian was interviewed multiple times for Michael's documentaries about the Armenian genocide. I was there for some of those interviews. Richard was the academic touchstone from 1975 all the way into the 2000s, Richard would pop up as an academic voice in those films. Richard and Michael, in fact, shared a mission, collecting survivor testimonies. Now, Michael's method was tailored to making documentaries. He would pre-interview the survivor to see how the survivor's story added to what we already know about the genocide. The interviews were targeted to elicit particular stories that filled in the gaps. Film was and still is very expensive, so those interviews were short and very much to the point. Now, Richard's method was the opposite. Richard did not want to limit the time because of expense. He wasn't making a film. He wanted the whole story, including the experience of the survivor's emigration. And so he decided to use audio tape as his format, cheap and cheerful, no fuss. And rather than limiting the interviewers to just one person, he enlisted UCLA students to become part of a big Armenian oral history project. Manuk Avedisian, who's here in the audience and who will be on the panel, he worked closely with Professor Hovanissian in his last years, working on the UCLA Survivor Collection, and sometimes he'd let me know what exciting testimony he had just come across. He knew I would understand his enthusiasm because I too had worked with testimony. And there's nothing like the moment when you hear an eyewitness account that reveals something we never knew before. In this case, Manuk said, it was the survivor's experience of being in a camp, a transit camp 
or what we might call a concentration camp. We didn't have an account from someone who had been in this particular camp, and Monik was listening to a survivor actually talking about this place. Because you see, the genocide is still a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. One overarching policy, yes, but the execution of that policy varies from region to region. So when we get detail from an eyewitness, it's like a piece of the puzzle falling into place. And so now, we have Richard's collection of over a thousand audio interviews. Arda and Doris Melkonian, who we'll hear from in the panel, they were instrumental in working with the professor in creating an index for those interviews. And when years later, Richard saw the power of the Shoah Foundation's visual history archive, he decided that's where his audio collection should live, on a digital platform that could be accessible to a global audience, searchable down to the minute of testimony. Professor Hovhannisyan was instrumental in augmenting the Shoah Foundation's Armenian Genocide Index to include Armenian terms and names that are particular to the Armenian Genocide experience. He was a much-loved Professor Emeritus Advisor to that USC collection, even though he was at heart a Bruin. And that brings me to the one aspect of the story I want to share with you today in particular. In December 2010, a digital copy of the Armenian Film Foundation's Genocide Survivor Collection was added to USC's Shoah Foundation. And Richard came onto the USC campus and saw how that archive worked. He was impressed. He said, this is the Cadillac of archives. And shortly after that, he held a historic conference at UCLA called the Armenian Oral History Conference. Some of you may have attended that event, 2011. Now, there are an estimated 5,000 Armenian genocide survivor testimonies in different collections around the world. This was the first time representatives of those major collections gathered together in one place. Richard wanted all of us to share information about our collections, who was in them, how they could be digitized, preserved, archived for the future. It was Richard who instigated this because he knew there was no point in hoarding our interviews. The time had come for us to share. And that didn't mean handing them over or giving up ownership. No, it meant sharing metadata. And so collections from Canada, Mexico, Alma Museum in Watertown, and various universities around the United States, they toured the Shoah Visual History Archive at USC and then came back here to UCLA to talk brass tacks and see what we could accomplish together. As you've heard, Richard was inclusive. He believed in being interdisciplinary. I repeat, Richard was inclusive. He believed in building bridges between people and institutions. He believed that for us to move forward in Armenian studies, we had to think big. We always needed to be open to collaborate, share, and cooperate with each other. And that didn't mean he wasn't discerning about who he had relationships with. It just meant his basic model, his basic approach to life was to be inclusive. And part of that was understanding that the Armenian Genocide period and its aftermath included other victim groups, like the Dersim Kurds. Professor Taner Akcham was the final speaker at that 2011 conference describing the Dersim Oral History Project, covering the 1938 massacres of an estimated 30,000 to 50,000 Kurds by the Turkish army, a crime of humanity that followed in form and substance, the footsteps of the Armenian Genocide. What did Richard want to happen as a result of this conference? He wanted a register of all survivors in these collections, the metadata, so that anyone looking for a family member or for a person connected to the Armenian Genocide, the name of a camp, for example, they could consult one source, one register. No voice would be lost. He wanted digitization, 
self-preservation indexing of these interviews with a gold standard, the Cadillac, being a searchable archive like USC's Visual History Archive. He wanted us to make sure we safeguard the smaller archives in danger so that we don't lose valuable information. We don't lose a single voice, a single reference, a single clue. And moreover, that we use these interviews to learn, learn more about what happened. Because Richard was a historian who used the tried and true methods of his work, which were scrutinizing government documents, official records, letters, memoirs, but also eyewitness testimony. However inconsistent or flawed eyewitness testimony can be, they were all, those stories, all of them, hold valuable clues that could help us understand what happened, where, when, and how. Richard and all of the students he enlisted to interview the survivors, some of whom are here today, knew how important it was to save these accounts because they're a part of who we are. They are evidence. They are testimony to our identity, history, and culture. They are evidence of our survival. He threw down the gauntlet in 2011, asking us to collaborate, share, keep moving forward on the Armenian Oral History Project. We haven't reached that goal yet. But I pledge to you, Richard, that I will try to keep to your goal of greater unity and collaboration. Thank you for inspiring us, helping us to remember our collective mission of using these precious resources, the voices of our survivors and eyewitnesses, to pursue education, truth, and understanding. Because without truth, there cannot be understanding. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carla. And uh, next, our speaker in this uh, session is Dr. Sebu Aslanian, who is, um, as I mentioned earlier, the Richard Hovhannisian Endowed Professor of Modern Armenian History here at UCLA. So, Sebu, I will call you uh, to the podium for your comments. Thank you very much, Anne. Thank you all for being here. Um, my talk today is, uh, my reflections today are titled The Imperative to Remember a Tribute to Richard G. Hovhannisian. So as the first holder of the chair of modern Armenian history named after the late professor, and as a professor of history here at UCLA, where uh, Professor Hovhannisian had a, a renowned career as an educator and mentor for half a century, I consider myself fortunate to be here to celebrate his monumental accomplishments and to carry the torch of educating a new generation of Armenian students and scholars as best as possible. Today, I wish to focus on the human element in Professor Hovhannisian's scholarship on the historic Armenian cities and provinces series and his pioneering work on documenting the witness, a practice now at the forefront of genocide scholarship. In other words, I'm interested in touching on the question of what drove Professor Hovhannisian to work so tirelessly and so productively for so long. It seems no secret to those who knew him that he was inspired by two extraordinary individuals. The first was his remarkable wife and Gyanki Unger, Dr. Vartiter Kocholosian Hovhannisian of blessed memory. We heard about her last night and we have been hearing about her uh, today as well. Uh, beyond this formidable woman was another person whose shadow was long and foundational. I am referring here to the professor's father, Kaspar Hovannisian, whose place in the professor's life and work I only came to appreciate in novel ways only after the professor's passing last July. Soon after learning of Hovannisian's death while traveling abroad last summer, I acquired a copy of a Family of Shadows, a beautifully written family memoir by Hovannisian's grandson, uh, our very own Garin Hovannisian, who is with us today. I gleaned much about the trauma and pain the young Kaspar Hovannisian and his mother, Hernar 
Gavroyan endured during the cruel spring of 1915. In their natal town of Bazmashen, not far from Harpert and Mezre. When the deportations began, 14 year old Kaspar was separated from his pregnant mother. He never saw her again, again, save for his dreams as a bereaved survivor in Tulare, California, where he resettled after the Armenian genocide. As I prepared a statement on the occasion of Professor Vanissian's passing, this is last summer, I was also struck by an interview he gave at UCLA in 2001. He invoked the shadow of his father, Kaspar, who was so traumatized that he never spoke about the genocide that claimed his father, brother, and pregnant mother. This is Richard's father. In that interview, Professor Hovanissian would call his, uh, with Professor Hovanissian said the following of his father. And I quote here from these words. He didn't talk much about it, but in his sleep, he would call for his mother. That's the way with the aftermath of genocides. It's not there, but it's always there. These lines that so vividly illustrate the ineffable power of tra and trauma uh, of the genocide moved me profoundly. Suddenly, I began to see Professor Hovanissian's prolific body of scholarship, including the 15 volumes of the historic Armenian cities and provinces, uh, and many of his publications on the genocide, uh, uh, especially the over 1,000 recorded interviews with genocide survivors that now forms the, uh, a foundational part of the uh, Shoah Foundation's Richard G. Hovannisian Armenian Genocide Oral History a collection entirely in a new light. As one of the very first professionally trained historians working in modern Armenian history in North America, Professor Hovannisian's body of scholarship was not only a truly magnificent feat in its own right, but was also a cry of the first generation descendant of genocide survivors. In crucial ways, Hovannisian enlarged upon the work of scholars and survivors of 1915, such as Arshak Alboyadjan, Aram Andonian, who has been mentioned already by uh, our colleague Tane Rakcham, Hagop Siruni, and many others. Like them, but in a highly professionalized manner, Professor Hovannisian's scholarship was a response and an attempt to heal the wounds felt by his father, wounds inflicted with the destruction of an entire generation of Armenian fathers, mothers, uh, Armenian fathers, mothers, and children, all taken violently from this world. If psychoanalysts and scholars of trauma have anything to teach us, it is that everybody responds differently to inherited trauma and to the long shadow of mass extermination. Some cannot respond and thus remain crippled, silent, and mute. Others resort to activism, while a very few others are able to fuse scholarly gifts with engaged activism to fill the void left by genocidal trauma and rescue what remains of the, from the erosion of the past, of history. Professor Hovannisian was one of these rare individuals. And in this context, his scholarship and his response to his father's silence reminds one of the celebrated passage in the work of the great Aram Andonian. And so in concluding my homage to Professor Hovannisian, I'd like to quote from Andonian's fund fundamental work, the Med Medzvojira, the great crime, and end with an, inv an invocation from the celebrated Jewish historian Yosef Haim Yerushalmi of Columbia University as well. He's also, he's also passed away, as both speak to a fundamental truth of which Professor Vanissian in his monumental scholarship and legacy reminds us all today. In celebrating his life and work, let us then recall first the profound words of Andonian, a survivor, writer, scholar, who was twice deported and twice miraculously survived to preserve a massive assemblage of survivor testimonies at the Nubarian archive in Paris. In his book, The Great Crime, The Latest Armenian Massacres in Talat Pasha, first published in Boston in 1919, Andonian put his survivors keen intellect on the pulse of history by singling out the importance of historical truth in the memory 
and lived experience of survivors' testimonies. At a time of, the, of a general assault on truth and the questioning of the very nature of reality, in the era of our fake news, it is important for all of us to reflect on its deeper meaning in light, that is to say, the deeper meaning of Andonian's passage in light of Professor, Professor Hovannisian's own profound contributions. The following is my verbatim translation from the Medzvogir of this particular passage that struck me uh, and in some ways traumatized me, I have to say, when I first encountered it in graduate school many, many years ago at Columbia. So uh, Andonian writes, when the British entered Aleppo, bringing with them also freedom, I took advantage and labored at least to save history by interrogating those among the survivors who were still capable of recalling the unspeakable terror and atrocities of those past five years. Thousands of women, young girls, and men thus came to see me. They spoke and they wrote. Each of them had their own story to tell, and not one of the tortures they had endured was similar to the other. I used to often think that for each of them, an entire volume uh, an entire vo for each of them, an entire volume would be necessary to write in order to at least assemble in general outlines the, this terrible, their terrible sufferings. And, and there were more than a hundred thousand of them who had a volume of things to tell. And even then, this colossal work would still be missing the stories of those who have fallen, taking with them the loss of more than a million volumes. So let me conclude these reflections by noting that the memories of the, of the souls uh, that Professor Avanisian labored to preserve also needs to be protected vigilantly. And here I will quote from uh, Yerushalmi's uh, celebrated work, a short work of 100 something pages called Zahor, colon, Jewish memory and history a very important fundamental work on the workings of memory and forgetfulness. And in the conclusion of this work, Yerushalmi writes and describes our age, our age of fake news and so on. This is before, uh, this is Avan Lalet of the fake news era because he wrote this in the 19, late 1980s. He writes, our age is characterized by, quote, the aggressive rape of whatever memory remains, the deliberate distortion of the historical record, the invention of mythological pasts in the service of the powers of darkness, against the agents of oblivion, the shredders of documents, the assassins of memory, the re revisers of encyclopedias, the conspirators of silence, only the historian with the austere passion for fact, proof, and evidence, which are central to his or her vocation, can effectively stand guard. Of course, all of us uh, today in the Armenian Studies Establishment and beyond mourn the passing of one of the giants of our field. But we also celebrate his grand accomplishments and are grateful that such a scholar chose to respond to his father's silence and the ghosts that haunted him by choosing to confront through humane scholarship and engagement, I have to say almost in perfect measure uh, combined, those conspirators of silence, those assassins of memory, against whose deliberate distortions only a historian with a passion and meticulous scholarship of Professor Hovannisian could stand guard. So, to hoge tetevnesti Professor Hovannisian imvra, yev tog ir yerchanig hishadaga, ir sirog nerun, yev andanikin, ent misht mkhitarankov, mkhitarankov, yev spopankov barure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sebu. And now I will invite our panelists for this portion of our uh, program to come forward. We have, um, unfortunately, Tamar Mashigian cannot join us today, but we have Manuk uh, Avedikian, who worked with Richard closely at the USC Shoa uh, Archive uh, and currently is the project manager of California history through the Armenian Experience 
at USC in the USC um, Institute of Armenian Studies. We have Arda Malkonian, um, a graduate student at Fuller Theological Seminary, former student of Richard, uh, and Shant Dermagurdichin, the assistant principal at uh, Eleanor Toll Middle School here in Southern California. So panelists, thank you for joining us. And I will now um, offer to you a question. Um, so Carla and Sebu, as you have heard, have discussed Richard's extensive pioneering contributions to documentation of the Armenian genocide. Perhaps each of you could share your perspectives uh, on the survivor testimony work, either as an interviewer, a translator, an archivist, or uh, whatever your context. So Manu, we will start with you. Thanks for being with us. I mean, I come at the very end uh, in terms of time. I mean, you guys were uh, like we were working on the project much, much like much earlier. Um, I hope to make this a mix of a speech and some reflections. I realize it's mostly uh, I'm hoping that we can memorialize his life through his actions and through our experiences with him. Um, I worked on his oral history archive and at the Shoah Foundation. I met, I helped manage it, but. Uh, before that archive, he was a consultant on the Armenian Film Foundation um, documentary film archive, where we worked very closely. Um, before I talk about our years before his collection came in, and we were working uh, on now we could say the largest Armenian genocide survivor um, like archive in the I mean in the world um, because it's a, about a thousand one hundred interviews. Uh, but before we came in. Uh, he was a consultant and we worked very closely and I was a young guy. Uh, I guess I still am. Um, I still am. And he was a formidable professor. And uh, we, he had, before I came in, um, there would, the project had already started and he had put together a, not, a, not a controlled vocabulary, but a kind of a corpus of terms, a corpus of terms of Armenian genocide specific terminology for the for the archive that came in before, that was J. Michael Agopian's uh, documentary film archive. And what I realized later, work, that when we continued to work and we were creating new, new, like new terms per each interview, of course, each interview is bringing up a new place, a new, a new phenomenon, uh, different people. Uh, thanks to Taner Aksham, later I realized that we were creating a Armenian genocide archive of a controlled vocabulary that was very specific to this time period and he helped create the foundations for that and we worked together uh to work on that and it's it's still being worked on uh, i'm currently not working on the project but i have i have uh, former co-workers that are still working on this with each interview um when he decided that this archive was i guess the cadillac of archives is that uh i i remember him mentioning that uh, carla mentioned it earlier um he came in and we went to his office in bunch hall and uh, seeing some of the organization that he did and how uh, like how the Melkonen sisters had also like worked on. Um, I remember there was boxes that were specifically what you guys had touched. Um, he was very well organized. He had a catalog. Um, he had four different layers of copies. So each interview had about four copies, if I'm not mistaken, some three, some five, but mostly he was very well organized in that sense. Most. Most interviews had release forms. All that, like I mean, all the documentation was there. Transcripts, which were of very good quality, uh, he had sent them to Armenia. It was uh, probably the best quality material he had. And the translations, which his students did in the later years, maybe not always the best quality, but re but regardless, he did. They were up to the seven hundreds, eight, like I mean, eight hundreds. This is not this is no small feat. This person was able to leverage all of his resources, uh, and and get something done. Uh, he even digitized them. He had he had his students work on that. Um, when we tried to f really fine tune the catalog, I remember calling him every so often and saying, you know, per, per, like like the professor was the name that I would, and and he was never my, he, I was never a student, but of course that's his that's his title, um, and I would always call him and I would mention, hey, by the way, we have fifty more interviews that you were unaware of. Oh, we have another thirty. We have another hundred, and the number went up to thousand one hundred. He thought it was about eight hundred something. Uh, we know we we found extra interviews sometimes by just sheer f luck. He had never cataloged this interview. This family reached out, "Hey, where's my grandpa's interview?" 
here's the here's the audio tape here's the mp3 and we had no cat we had no we had no idea of that interview um some were stolen in people's cars so that interview was long gone some interviewer left it in the car for about a week longer than they should have it's long gone but regardless he was really happy every time that his 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 archive would just get bigger and bigger <laughs> and and it was this amazing it was a really cool It was a very cool experience, especially talking to him and seeing how happy he would get. Uh, I would always call him when I was unaware of or unsure of a person's family tie or spelling of a name or something. And as his grandson, like the Godin mentioned earlier, he knew everyone's family history and where they were from, who they were, who, who they were related to, who, like who the grandpa was. And sometimes... Because I'm also an LA Armenian, and the majority of this collection is Southern California Armenians, and many from Fresno. It's really a California, like the collection of genocide survivors. And me being an LA Armenian, sometimes you know I would, I would be a match, <laughs> a small match. But hey, this is my friend's grandmother, or this is this, this is Romanian Armenian, etc. Um, it was a, it was a great relationship that we ended up forming, um, and uh, <clears throat> eventually before. Um, In the early years, maybe my second year of working with him, while he was a consultant in his collection and I was not working on his, on his archive, uh, I remember again. Here I am, a young guy. He's a formidable professor. We're still getting to we're still getting to know each other, but we have general respect. I had passed his test much earlier. Uh, he had given me some geography questions, and I passed it, uh, and I was okay. I was in his I was in his I was in the good books. Um, But we had a deadline to edit some translations, about 200 or so Armenian translations to English, and we were editing them. And he, I had to go on my honeymoon, and we had a deadline. And he said, "Please go have fun." And while I was on my honeymoon, he was editing these translations, and I'm thinking, you know, this guy is a very honest, very. Uh, there's no, there was no hierarchy of, uh, there was a lack. That hierarchy was. didn't exist in our relationship, which I was very fortunate for. Um, of course, I came back and the work was done. I mean, I didn't even ask him to do it, but he did it. Uh, um, I wanted to, that, that, that incident made a big impact on me. And I, he ended up calling me his friend, his son. I ended up, we had this relationship where either I was his friend, a son, grandson, uh, a colleague, Uh, maybe all of them at the same time. A ment he was my mentor. It was all of them, all these titles at the same time. I, and I'm assuming the same for other for other people that were in his uh, in who had who had relations with him. Um, it was I was unfortunately was unable to visit his uh, go to his funeral in his wake. I was in I was out of the country in Armenia, and uh, the, it was a very emotional and difficult time. But I was able to you know. Go, go visit his grave, which he's with his all of his in-laws, all of his relatives, and so on, like Telirian as well. Like I mean, watching all of I mean, over them, and it was the same week that Artsakh had been um, had been emptied of its Armenian population, and I'm very I was very glad that he wasn't alive to see that, and it would have been extra emotional. I remember during the 2020 war, it was a very difficult time, of course, for pretty much every Armenian. And uh, I'm glad he was, I'm almost glad that he didn't get to feel that pain uh, because that's an extra pain. Uh, I want to just mention one more thing, not to go over my time, which I may or may not have done. But I had the fortune of interviewing him uh, about a year and a half or I forget now how long ago, about a year and a half or so ago. Um, and he had been interviewed by the Shoah Foundation, um, which I helped prepare and consult and get the questions ready, though I was not the interviewer. Uh, and, I, and I really wanted to make sure that that interview didn't, wasn't a repetition of a previous interview. He had given me some personal notes, some personal writings that helped uh, make sure that there was no redundancy. Um, I went to his home. He was living with his daughter at the time. And my colleague, then boss, Shushan, like the Garabetian and I, interviewed him. And one thing that left a mark on me during that interview was that how much he emphasized his Armenian American identity, his Central Valley identity. In his later years, he kept talking about his youth. I think this this is what happens when one gets older. You always go back to your youth. But the emphasis he called Armenian Americans, as he rightfully claimed, 
built the built the infrastructure of this community here in the states and be, uh, before the 1970s immigrant waves that so much so many of us were part of and he was he was not only part of that community but he ended up being a bridge towards that community towards his wife's dps the displaced persons towards the new towards the new immigrants he was a bridge towards many many like the communities and not only a bridge but he was the he was the foundation he not only came from the generation of the, those those that built the foundations but he was the foundation as well uh, for so many for so many things in our armenian life here i just want to leave with that mark thank, thank you. you thank you Manu. Arda, we'll hear from you next. As has been mentioned, Professor Hovhannisyan was a pioneer in the field of Armenian genocide survivor testimonies. And he had the foresight and he recognized the importance of collecting and documenting the experiences of the survivors before they perished. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Armenian Genocide Oral History class at UCLA. Um, he developed the class in the 1970s, and it was taught for many years in different phases. So when I say different phases, I'm referring to the different forms of oral history. Oral history has several forms. There's the interview, there's the recording of the interview, the interviewer's transcription, and then the interpretation of the interview data. In the case of the Armenian Genocide Survivor Testimonies, there was one additional phase, and that was the translation from Armenian to English. Um, so my sister Doris and I got involved in the project after the interviews had been collected and transcribed. So we took the class and we also um, did the grueling 100 pages of translation that was required, and those of you who've taken his class, know what I mean by grueling. Many of us will say we've never worked so hard in our lives. Um, and then after we completed the, the class, he asked us to become his teaching assistants for the class. So we did that for a few years. And after all the um, interviews had been translated and there was no more work for students to do, there still was a lot of work to do um, as far as editing and correcting the transcriptions. So Professor Hovhannisyan found funding for us and asked us to continue as his research assistants. Um, we spent countless hours in his office in the Bunch Hall sixth floor, and we worked with these testimonies intimately. And over the course of five years, we've read and corrected about 500 testimonies about half the collection, it was half the collection before you found more. <laughs> a few points I wanna make um, as far as my interaction with Professor Hovhannisyan and with this collection. Uh, first point I wanted to emphasize is his dedication to this collection. Um, as Levon Marashnian said, he would take students to Fresno on the weekends and drop them off at survivors' homes, give them time to interview them, and then at a designated time, he would collect all of them and bring them back. So this was just a labor of love on his part, such dedication to making sure that these testimonies were recorded and preserved. As far as transcribing the interviews, um, I think most of us know that Professor Hovhannisyan was frugal and he was a good steward of the funds entrusted to him. So instead of having the interviews transcribed here in the US, he would send them to Armenia and it was more cost effective to do that, even though it introduced some difficulties in terms of the Eastern and the Western Armenian dialects. And so that caused some um, difficulties, but in the end, not only did he spend uh, save money, but he was also providing employment for many individuals in Armenia. So he's always thoughtful about doing that and, and providing jobs in Armenia. The final phase um, involved the translation, and, um, and that's when so many of his students in this room were involved um, translating 
the transcriptions. The second point I want to emphasize is the value he placed on survivors and their experiences. As has been mentioned, he knew these survivors. He knew their stories. He knew their families. He was interested in their experiences. For Hovanesian, the survivors were not subjects or informants, as we often refer to in research. These were individuals whose lives had been tragically disrupted. And he knew he cared about what these individuals had experienced. And he viewed them as human beings and respected their courage and their perseverance. The third point I want to emphasize about Professor Hovhannisson in regards to this collection was that he was always willing to learn. As Henry said, this, the student Richard, that he was always willing to learn. And he had the humility to learn from students, from graduate students. When we were working on the uh, testimonies, Doris and I were being trained as social research methodologists. And we often wanted to bring in the theories that we were learning and the concepts and the approaches. And initially we were a little hesitant because here was this giant of a scholar. Um, we were intimidated to bring up these ideas. And initially we hesitatingly mentioned some of this, the theories that we had learned about and how we could use that and apply it to this collection. And we were surprised that he was so receptive and welcoming of our ideas. And um, he welcomed our contribution. And he recognized that other disciplines had important things to offer to better this collection that he could use for, um, in the, in interpreting and analyzing this collection. So it really impressed me that he was willing to listen to us and learn from others. Lastly, I want to mention that he cared about us. He wanted to make sure that our experience was beneficial to us as individuals and as scholars. He wanted to make sure that we were learning and growing as we worked on the testimonies. So we would often have conversations about the testimonies and we would discuss the theoretical, ethical, methodological challenges encountered in oral history research and how some of those challenges can be managed. We also talked about how the, the value of oral history and how it helps us understand the experiences of individuals and that it enriches and at the same time complicates our understanding. Um, and he would explain to us that what we are reading is not just what happened, but it's what happened in terms of how the individual remembers it and how um, the meaning is shaped by the psychological and the social circumstances of recall. Not only did he care about us learning, but he wanted his undergraduate students to have a more meaningful experience. So often he would invite survivors to come to class and speak to his class. And that way the students would connect with the survivor and it would make the text more meaningful and come to life for them. Um, he did all this because he cared he cared for all of us. And it is such a touching and refreshing thing to know that this giant of a scholar cared for all of us, his students, his colleagues, his community. I want to close by saying that one of the things that I am most grateful to God for is for bringing Professor Hovhannisyan into my life. And I am grateful for the opportunity to have known him, to have worked with him, and to have learned from him. Thank you. Thank you, Arda. And 
Last on our panel, we will hear from uh, Shant Dermigerdichin. Shant. Thank you. About a year ago, my son called me, my son Vaughn called me to the dining room where he was working and he was on his laptop and he said, Dad, this is you. And then what he was playing was he was working with Manu again, the, the show foundation with indexing of the survivor accounts. And he actually played one of the, um, you know, the, the interviews that I had done when I was an 18 year old. So let's flash back 18 uh, when I was 18, so you're talking about 35 plus uh, years ago. Uh, no thanks to the genocide. Grew up in uh, pretty much Los Angeles, very to a very patriotic family. Uh, I was part of Armenian organizations like Homenet Men, the Armenian Youth Federation. I went to Ferahian Armenian uh, High School and uh, talking about you know the free and independent Armenia genocide recognition. That was part and parcel of our daily uh, existence. So, um, and also at that same time, my parental grandmother was living with us. So just her being present was a, a present was just a constant memory all the time. And uh, among some of our routines was on April 24th, every year we would go to the Turkish consulate and demonstrate and we or we would be marching, you know, uh, with, with the march in L.A. and demanding the recognition of the genocide. But then the next day or the following, we, we would go back to our daily lives. I mean, it seemed like we were just going through the motions uh, at that time. So there was something missing. I mean, there was something lacking. And that, for me, became a little bit more real in 19, 1987 when I went to Armenia on a trip with Rafi and Gado and another friend of ours. Besides, that was my first time there. Uh, and um, what besides going and seeing all the touristic sites, Rafi took us to some border villages and we met these larger than life, uh, you know, men with these bushy mustaches and so on. And, um, you know, we heard their stories. We sang patriotic songs with them. Uh, we even had a few toasts with them. But uh, honestly, I think it was more than a few toasts. It was probably the first time that I got drunk uh, in my life. Uh, and but something clicked, something happened, and I knew that I could be doing more. I could be, you know, uh, there was more that, that 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 I could give, and who to give that to, and work with more than Doctor Olanesian, the person who is an actual doer. You know, he for him, every day is genocide. You know, the battle to have you know genocide recognition. Every day is an April twenty fourth for him. He never rested. So. Um, you know, that it was a no brainer to come and work with them. But before I started doing my interviewing, I basically I was an interviewer. So what I did was um, I knew the family because I was very good friends with Gatto. And I just mentioned the trip that we had just taken together uh, to Armenia. And then, you know, we, as friends, we would always go to each other's houses. We had interactions with uh, parents and so on. But it was always different when we were at Gatto's house because of uh, Dr. Oanesian, the celebrity. I mean, I didn't know any celebrities at that time, but for me, he was a celebrity. I was, you know, you know fairly aware of his work already. Um, and uh, it was just, you know, just being in his presence. I mean, uh, he was an intimidating guy, but not intimidating in any kind of a negative way. It was just more of, um, you know, he, he, he listened to you. He validated you. But indirectly, he kind of wanted to send you a message that were you going to be a better version of yourself? You know, do, do, do not do not waste away. I mean, he had this way of, you know, making you feel comfortable, but also challenging you to those uh, limits that maybe you never really thought of or you never thought that you could, you know, possibly possibly do. So I love this man. I'd walk through a brick wall for him. Um, so that was uh, my initial experience. And then uh, later on when I started, I was a little familiar with the interviewing process because my sister uh, had done it before me. And, um, you know, now was my turn. Uh, for me, when I first started, it was more of I'm, I'm, I'm you know, exacting revenge, you know. Oh, you're going to silence, you know, the, the voices of our, of our people. No, you know, I'm not on my watch. I'm going to be somebody who's going to be documenting and you know that that's the way i you know thought when i was 17 and 18. uh so it was all about that in the beginning and then trying to get re uh, ready for the interviews you need to make sure that you knew where you were going at that time you know we had to consult the thomas guide there was really no 
uh, Google Maps or anything that uh, of that nature, you know, making sure that I had my notepad, my pencils, my paper, you know, uh, the cassettes, uh, you know, the, uh, the extra ones, too, because you never knew how long these interviews were going to take. And then I practiced those questions over and over again because I really, really didn't want to disappoint uh, uh, Dr. Hovhannisyan. Up until that point, it still seemed like it was about me. What, what was I going to get out of this? But that really quickly changed as soon as, you know, you go to the, you walk up to the uh, door, you ring the doorbell, and then it was usually somebody else who would open the, uh, who would answer the door, uh, usually a son or daughter or, you know, a grandchild or you know, just, just someone in the family and to escort you to where the interview was going to take place. And as I was walking through, uh, you know, the, the the living area and so on, I couldn't help but see, you know, pictures the pictures on the mantles, family portraits, rugs, tapestries, knickknacks, you know, all just uh, various mementos of things that were lost. I mean, those were the only things that they were preserved. Um, and uh, it's, you know, it, it, it starts sinking in. And as soon as you go and you meet the survivor, I mean, my, my initial reaction was I totally felt irrelevant compared to these people, and I felt like this big. Um, they were just, uh, you look at them, the first thing you notice is their eyes and the, the wrinkles on their faces, you know, and you see the pain and you feel it, you know, you feel it on your skin, it be, you know, because um, all, the, all, all this time you feel that, you know, you've, you've, you've known about the genocide, but you really haven't because, you know, you, you, they're all generalizations for you. They're intangible. But as soon as they start recounting their stories, you start asking questions. So during the interview, I'm asking myself questions. You know, what have these eyes seen? You know, uh, what were they doing as an 18-year-old compared to what I'm doing as, as an 18-year-old? Is, is it even fair to compare? And then I'm telling myself, stay on task, stay on task. You know, you, haven't, you have to go through uh, with the interview. So... You know, as these happen, the, the, the more you, you talk about to the survivors, the more I realized I thought I knew a lot, but I didn't really know a lot because every single one of those stories, you know, is a story. It's not, you know, we know Armenian genocide, you know, that, that's what we know. We, we know a certain account, but when they start telling their stories and then you learn about Arakel who uh, hid a fedai or Kevor who, you know, rode off to the neighboring village to forewarn of you know uh, 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 an onslaught that was coming i mean it just becomes real and it really really sinks in um and then at some point they begin to cry because it's uh it, devastating for them to kind of relive you know all of these experiences and um, i mean it's just an emotional roller coaster that you're going through as an interviewer you're first sad and compassionate then you're angry and then you're hopeful because you feel that you know they're they're still around and we're still around and you know we persist we rebuilt and uh, we continued and i believe it was stalin who once said uh, one death is a tragedy and a million is a statistic and i think uh dr hovanesan's entire life was dedicated to that to make sure that we weren't a statistic it was a every single person's account was a tragedy every single person had a story every single person really really mattered and when you look at it they just didn't an annihilate the armenian people but they are annihilated us as erzurumtsis as zaytunsis as vanetsis because each one of those villages and each one of the villages they had their own culture their own tradition their own dialect you know their own history so uh, when you look at it that way that 1.5 million number e i mean even seems like a greater number than you know what it is so um just in closing, the uh, interviewing process was an, an incredible experience for me, an eye-opening experience. I grew up really fast. And, uh, you know, I made connections with uh, the, the survivors. And, uh, you know, that just those interactions and that privilege that I had to do the interviews really brought out the best in me. And that was what Dr. Owen had instilled in me from day one and to Every single kind, uh, every single uh, interaction I had with him, I'm going to miss him. Thank you. Thanks to all of our panelists. What a meaningful set of con comments you've made. So you can be seated. Uh, 
As you may have noticed, we are running a tad bit late, but um, I would like to now offer a 10 minute break. Okay, so welcome back to our third session of the morning, um, still barely morning um, here in Los Angeles. Um, our next um, session, which will include a couple of speakers as well as uh, another panel, is entitled Modern Armenian History, the First Armenian Republic, and uh, Professor Havanissian's uh, additional extensive contributions to the series of conferences that were held at UCLA on historic Armenian cities and um, provinces. So today, our moderator for the next two sessions, uh, one before lunch, one after lunch, is our own Dr. Christine Mardirosian Olshansky. Uh, Christine is the director of UCLA's research program in Armenian archaeology at the Coatsen Institute for Archaeology here on our campus. So, Christine, I will now turn the program over to you. And once again, I hope more people will uh, come back into the room very soon. Thanks. Thank you, Anne. Unfortunately, our first speaker is not able to be here in person, but we will have um, Dr. Anu Suni, one of our UCLA Promise Armenian Institute postdoctoral scholars, read Professor Suni's remarks about Richard Hovanesian on her father's behalf. Uh, Ronald Gr uh, Grigor Suni is a William Sewell Jr. Distinguished University Professor of History and Professor of Political Science at the University of Michigan, an Emeritus Professor of Political Science and History at the University of Chicago. Anush? Thank you so much. It's an honor and a privilege for me to be here today. I'm so sorry that my father isn't able to be here. He was really looking forward to being here to celebrate Professor Hovhannisyan's life and work. They were longtime friends and colleagues. Unfortunately, he became ill yesterday morning. And so instead of flying here, he's uh, recuperating in Michigan, but he sends his greetings to all of you. For me, being here is also personally very special because Professor Hovhannisyan was a big figure in my life for longer than I can remember. He was a friend of the family from before I was born, so I don't remember the first time I have that I met Professor Hovhannisyan. He was retired when I started my graduate studies here at UCLA, but he was always a, an important uh, member of the community. And when I spent two years doing fieldwork in Van in contemporary Turkey, the one physical book that I brought with me was Professor Hovhannisyan's Armenian Van Vasburagan, which I consulted probably on a daily basis. So now I will read the remarks that my father wrote for this event. So imagine that I am embodying Ronald Grigor Suni. Richard Hovhannisyan was someone I consider a mentor in Armenian studies. I want to explore two journeys into this field with the themes of belonging and foreignness. The question I begin with is, what does it mean to be Armenian and engage in the history of the Armenians? How does one do scholarship, which supposedly involves impartiality, objectivity, and neut neutrality when the fate of a nation is involved? The journeys will be Richard Hovhannisyan's and my own. It was Richard Hovhannisyan who first brought me into the Armenian fold by inviting me to give a talk on Armenians in the Tsarist Empire for his conference at UCLA on images of the Armenians. I was to write on Russian attitudes, images, and prejudices against Armenians. The paper went well. It was published in Richard's edited collection, but it was also criticized by some in the audience who objected to my recitation of many of the negative essentialist almost racist stereotypes that, Ar that Russians had about Armenians. Why stir up all that negativity? It was at that conference that I met Girard Libaridian and was so impressed by his talk that I thought that this new generation of young scholars trained by Richard 
was a cohort that I would like to join. My mother had warned me, Ronald, don't ever get involved with the Armenians. But now I was about to do exactly that. Unlike Americans or Russians who are people continually trying to figure out who they are, Armenians are a people who are pretty certain they know who they are. Even when their own history had been largely unknowable, at least their modern history. And Richard Hovhannisyan was a pioneer in establishing what we now know as modern Armenian history. Like any other nation, Armenians, both in Hayastan and in the diaspora, are on a continual journey to learn about their past. Richard made that possible almost single-handedly when few others were as interested. When I, first learned, when I first tried to find out about Armenians, there was not much to read. What I learned from, was from parents and grandparents, personal histories, experiences, and memoirs, but that could hardly be called academic history. When I was growing up, my grandmother made sure I knew I was Armenian. She used to tell me, a little boy born in Philadelphia, that we Armenians were different from, and the, implica the implication was actually better than, those Odars who lived all around us. The Odars, of course, were the Amerikatsiner. Americans were the foreigners, the Odars. There I was, a little boy living in the United States, speaking English, not knowing Armenian, who was taught to think that we Armenians were not quite like those other Americans. In a sense, I was a foreigner in my homeland, in the land in which I had been born, different from the natives. I grew up with the double consciousness of being Ar American, but a different kind of American, an Armenian, whose country no longer existed and whose people had been rendered invisible. Today, I am convinced that that distance and perspective, belonging and being foreign at the same time, helped me become a good historian. I have never rooted for the home team, not the United States, nor Armenia. The country I felt might provide some salvation from the pathologies of late capitalism was the Soviet Union. But then that particular experiment ultimately failed. That was the perspective with which I came into Russian, Soviet, Georgian, and finally Armenian studies. My journey to Armenian history, I assumed, was quite different from Richard Hovhannisyan's. If my perspective was of an Armenian who was at the same time a foreigner, both as an American and an Armenian, Richard's was of a member of the tribe, of the nation, one of those rooted in the Armenian community. I learned, however, from his grandson Garin's family biography that Richard was not automatically Armenian. He actually constructed his own Armenian identity. Richard grew up in the Central Valley in California on his father's farm, then studied in Fresno and turned to history at Berkeley. He imbibed the party politics of his grandfather, Hovanes, and his father, Kaspar, who had gone through the genocide. Born and raised in Basmashen in Kharpert province, Kaspar was deported from his village and survived by being ripped away from his mother and brother and saved by a Kurd. As a boy, Richard grew up with those tales of the genocide. He was an active member of the Dashnak Tsuchun youth group, the AYF, and therefore was associated with the most dedicatedly nationalist of Armenian parties. But ultimately, he did not join the party and tacked between the nationalism that surrounded him and his dedication to objective and dispassionate history. He was on a search to find Armenia and who he was as an Armenian, perhaps to win over his distant and temperamental, temperamental father or secure a sense of self that had been damaged by his upbringing. Not knowing Armenian, Richard traveled to Beirut and became fluent in the language. There, he drew close to the venerable last prime minister of independent Armenia, Simon Vratsian, who gave him some good advice. When you return to the United States, marry that Armenian woman you met, Vartiter Kocholosian, which he did. Ultimately, it was Richard's relationship and long marriage to Vartiter that solidified his Armenian identity. 
It is hard to imagine Richard without Vartitej. So let me start with an encounter that I had with the indomitable Vartiter Kocholosian Hovanisian, someone I truly treasured. Many years ago, I was with Richard and Vartiter, and somehow we began talking about my research project at the time, which was a history of the country of Georgia. I was trying desperately to master the beautiful but incredibly difficult Georgian language, which in my experience was harder than either Russian or Armenian, the other two languages I had attempted to learn from my research and writing. Vartiter, as many of you undoubtedly know, was a woman who told you exactly what she was thinking at the moment. She asked me bluntly, with a hint of accusation, why are you writing about Georgia? As an Armenian, you should be writing about Armenia. As Vart's grandson, Garin Hovanisian, writes in his family biography, Vartiter was emboldened by her experiences in Soviet Ukraine, post-World War II refugee camps, and emigration in the United States to become, quote, a staunch, unrepentant Armenian. At that time, I was still an interloper in Armenian studies and was suspect by many of my contemporaries because I was basically a scholar of Russia and now of Georgia, spoke Armenian neither like a native nor a heritage speaker, and I was opposed to nationalism on any of its fronts. I su suspected that it was a contradiction to be a real scholar and a committed nationalist. How did Richard manage this dilemma? His goal was to raise Armenian studies to the level of academic history that would meet the standards of the profession. And that was his great achievement, which impressed me as I read his work. But he also wrote history with another purpose as well, to bring Armenia and Armenians to the attention of the world, to erase the erasure, to remind people of what had been forgotten, a genocide, an independent republic, towns and villages that had existed for thousands of years, but now had been obliterated or were being eliminated. His history was a history of recovery. His work was a patriotic obligation. Armenian scholarship at that time, at the time that Richard was writing his dissertation, was at a turning point, but had not yet turned. And Richard was the leading figure in taking modern Armenian history, an underpopulated field, from unfiltered nationalism and Armenian partisan politics towards something more objective, evidence-based and archivally informed, with a certain distancing from nationalist emotions. His four, really five, volume history of the First Armenian Republic was a monument to how he conceived of history. It was a labor of love, which few other scholars would have undertaken, and few Armenians have actually read. I read all of it, and reviewed much of it. He worked on the history of the Republic for over three decades, truly a life's work. This reconstruction of a lost state's lost story was the result of prodigious labor in archives in half a dozen countries, sustained by a patriotic engagement tempered by the highest standards of scholarly detachment. For all its detail and range of observation, the text is always clear and precise. The writing is fluid and inviting. From the councils of the great powers to the bloody massacres of Marash and Karabakh, Richard made sense of the complexities of a small state's struggle to survive in a hostile constellation of forces. Given the heft of these volumes, he seems to have believed, like his medieval predecessor, Movsen, Movses Khorenatsi, that though the Armenians, quote, are a small country and very restricted in numbers, weak in power and often subject to another's rule, yet many manly deeds have been performed in our land worthy of being recorded in writing, end quote. Every historian who takes up Armenian history writes in the shadow of the genocide, and Richard was among the first to take on the task of con confronting the denialists. When he entered the field of genocide studies and brought 1915 to the attention of an indifferent world, forcing historians to think about the unthinkable, everything about the Armenian genocide, every hypothesis, interpretation, 
even fact or event, had been rendered controversial by paid propagandists, public relations firms hired by the Turkish government, who were then assisted by pseudo-scholars or even distinguished ones. The field of inquiry has thus been structured by denial and prevarication that forced those who would try to establish a more credible record and provide explanation to take up a combative stance. Richard was ready to fight. The politics of knowledge about genocide rendered the seldom realized ideals of dispassionate analysis nearly impossible there. All were engaged in a deadly struggle to establish an unbearable truth that the Ottoman government had deliberately set out to annihilate masses of their subject peoples. Richard Hovanisyan put the hidden story of the Armenian genocide on the agenda of modern Middle Eastern historians. Richard's history was a history from within and is Armenia-centric because he felt passionately the injustices that his people had suffered. He defended his affection for Armenians, but he did not allow it to mar his finest work. Richard's history, if I may make an important distinction, was patriotic rather than nationalistic. That is, it sought what is good in our history, but without avoiding the faults missteps, and bad decisions that have proven disastrous. His historical honesty, in fact, got him into trouble with some of the most fervent nationalists who demanded a history solely of heroism and victimhood, of bravery and suffering. As much as he loved Armenians, Armenians and Armenia, at a deep level, he understood the importance of honest evaluation and critique. Nationalism, we might define as my country, right or wrong, while patriotism is my country when it is right and what can we do to make it right. Our work as historians is influenced by who we are, where we were educated, and how we feel about ourselves, our sense of self, and our values, moral and political. It is always a struggle to do the work of a professional historian, which requires a commitment to the unattainable goal of objectivity and neutrality and putting aside our personal and political commitments. Richard was indelibly an Armenian patriot, and his achievement was to write history that was both as close to objective as possible, but at the same time committed to recovering what had been lost or denied. He made modern Armenian history respectable something to be taken seriously in the academy, and he inspired younger generations of scholars to take the risk of challenging the dominant narratives of heroes and victims. A fully mature historiography is one that is prepared to be critical of the unquestioned assumptions of popular understanding, a history that fearlessly moves beyond what is safe and comfortable. Small, beleaguered Armenia is a country more than most that is burdened by its history, and more than most needs scholars who are unafraid to expose, analyze, and explain the complexities, false steps, tragic errors of the past to prepare that country and its people for the difficult present in which they struggle to survive and the unknowable challenges that they will face in a perilous future. There is the essence of what I think was going on in Richard Hovhannisyan's mind, and by extension, in the minds of the best critical historians. History is about the future, not the past. It investigates and tries to understand the past in order to figure out how we got where we are and where we might be going. History is the only database we have to tell us what human beings have done and what they potentially might do in the future. History, like anthropology, liberates us from the past by informing us of its burdens. History, like anthropology, provides us with alternatives to an impossible, intolerable present. Thank you. Thank you, Anush, and thank you, Dr. Ron. Um, our next speaker is Jirai Liboridian, who has sent his remarks via a video. 
He is a retired diplomat and professor, former holder of Alex Manugan Chair in Modern Armenian History at the University of Michigan and Arbor. Hasmi, could you please play the video? Oh. Hello. Should I repeat it or could you hear me? Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this important event and to do so via this uh, video message. Thinking about Richard Tolanesian, I've tried to formulate his multidimensional life in a few simple points. Not an easy task, as you can imagine. Let me try anyway. Richard was a pioneer in replacing the writing of Armenian history by well-meaning amateurs and semi-professionals with well-trained professionals. Richard was a pioneer in the legitimation of the study of modern Armenian history. When Armenian studies was for the most part interested in the ancient and medieval periods, he was instrumental in the study of the two most consequential events of modern Armenian history, the genocide and the establishment of a republic. Third, Richard taught a huge number of university students who learned about Armenian history from him, as well as an even larger number of community members throughout the US and many continents who benefited from his countless public lectures. Richard cared about the need to produce a new generation of scholars who cared for history as much as he did. And finally, Richard spent an enormous amount of energy institutionalizing the study promotion and professionalization of Armenian studies, as well as representing the Armenian community uh, to the larger world by participating in the leadership of various organizations, institutions, and journals. To my knowledge, he was the main instigator, in fact, the inspiration for the founding of the now very vibrant Society for Armenian Studies, as well as the Armenian Assembly of America. I first met Richard in 1969, I believe. He was ready to publish his first volume of the Republic of Armenia. While I was, briefly, the editor of the Aspires newspaper in Los Angeles. He dropped by the newspaper office to ask if we could locate an official seal of the First Republic, a photo of which the publisher could use on the cover of the volume. Not long after, I became his student, and sometime later his colleague, and I dare say co-conspirator in a number of projects as we shared fundamental values. Beyond these simple notes, I think he and his family will understand if I do not try to find other more appropriate words to express my gratitude, our gratitude, to him and to his family for a lifetime of learning, teaching, and giving. Richard, at the end, was bigger than life. Before we continue, sorry, it's me. Can I ask everyone to just take a seat either here or in the audience? There are enough seats. All right, next we will have a, a panel of speakers. Um, Thank you. Um, our panelists uh, are Ar Armen Baiburtian, Professor of Practice of Political Science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and two-time Council General, General of Ar um, Armenia in Los Angeles. Fatma Muge Kuchek, Professor of Sociology at University of Michigan Ann Arbor and Armen Del Kurgerian, President Emeritus at American University of Armenia and Emeritus Taisei Professor of Civil Engineering at University of California, Berkeley.
Thank you for joining us. Um, we have heard from Professor Ron Sunis and Professor Jirai Libaritian about Richard's pioneering contribution to the documenting the history of the Republic of Armenia and later his groundbreaking series of conferences and books on historic Armenian provinces and cities. Perhaps you could offer your own perspectives um, on the lasting impact of his scholarly work and documentation of the historic towns and provinces for historians, for Armenians in the diaspora, as well as in perspectives and lessons for the present day Republic of Armenia. Thank you. First of all, I would like to extend my profound gratitude to the Promise Institute and all the co-sponsors, partners in organization of this fascinating conference. Thank you. Let me start by sharing with you that this very morning, I had a phone call with my dad, first ambassador of Armenia to Iran and uh, professor of Middle Eastern Studies, Vaham Baiburtian. He lives in Yerevan, so we talk every day. And I told him that I'm going to attend the conference dedicated to Richard Hovanesian. And he told me one sentence that I want to share with you. He told me, Professor Richard Hovanesian is not only, only trailblazer in institutionalizing Armenian studies and setting very high bar, but also a scholar whose academic achievements, whose scholarly works are unsurpassed. I was very impressed what my dad told. And I want to add, you know, my personal perspective not only about the quality of his academic scholarship, but also I consider what he was choosing to study, all the decisions for selection were strategic. Why strategic? He didn't choose anything, in my opinion, to study, to present, to share, just because of interest, historic or historical interest. No, it was strategic. Strategic for the present day Armenians, strategic for present day Armenia. And when we try to see the link between the past, between the history and the present, his writings are the bridge, bridge to address all the issues of the present that we face through history and to be advantageous in addressing those issues. So very quickly, let me speak about two of his monumental achievements. One is the four-volume Republic of Armenia. And second, historic Armenian cities and provinces. So we all know that history is not sufficient to develop policies. But history is very important to understand, to comprehend the complexities of the present and to be able to navigate. And what Professor Hovanissian wrote, how he wrote, how he systematized the entire Republic of Armenia, I see the following practical conclusions not also only as historian, but also as, di as diplomat. I'm telling this in presence of our first Armenian foreign minister, Mr. Rafi Ovanisian. So practical my practical conclusions are the following. First, he presented, not only he presented overarching trends and patterns that we see in the history of the First Republic, but that enables us to construct 
to develop, to understand, to devise present-day foreign policies. We all know that history impacts, strongly impacts foreign policy. That's a fact. Impacts in very many ways. Impacts nas through national identity, which very often shapes foreign policy, in the impact in um, the way consciously or unconsciously statesmen try to understand history to be able to conduct their policy in present. It impacts in very many ways, but it doesn't enable us to build policy just knowledge of history, but we cannot ignore it. If we ignore history, so that we means that we are destined to repeat it. So, summarizing that part, I can say that Richard Hovannisian's foundational work allows us to understand the present, allows us to be able to build policies that correspond to the national interests of Armenia and Armenian nation. Talking about historic Armenian cities and provinces, let me make, we can talk for a long time about this another signature events, series of events organized by Professor Hovannisian. Actually, I, I had the pleasure to participate and honor in a couple of them, and more importantly, in 2007, I traveled for Armenia upon invitation of Professor Vanisian to participate in the conference titled Ebb and Flow of the Armenian Communities in the Indian Ash Ocean. Professor Sebun Aslanian remembers well, and many of you. So, but um, uh, to my to my knowledge, 14 volumes of proceedings, conference proceedings were published. So let me share with you how I perceive that work, that titanic work. This um, first of all, uh, first of all, it aims at bridging the gap between old generations and new generations. And we we see, we understand the need to bridge that gap. Not only because of attaining knowledge about the past, about our provinces, about our historical roots. A person cannot live without knowing his or her roots, but also for the new generation to, to develop strong identity. That's very, very important. Another aspect that I can see very important, I'm going to be brief, so very important aspect, that we all know that being located on the crossroads, crossroads between Europe and Asia, and being subject to long terms and periods of foreign occupation. So we developed man-made and also natural defensive mechanisms for protection of our national identity and unique way of living. So not only Armenian culture, not only socioeconomic, religious structures to preserve our, our Armenianness, but also topography, terrain, landscape, our mountain, mountain ranges divided Armenia or isolated some regions of Armenia. And as a result, very many regions of Armenia. As a result, we developed local, domestic mechanisms of protection of Armenian identity and these conferences, and these volumes published, aim, in my opinion, aim at understanding that, are putting together the entire mosaic of the nation with understanding of and loving every piece of that. Thank you very much. Let me stop here. And um, once again, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Fatma Müge Göçek. I'm a sociology professor at the University of Michigan. So I come from the other side uh, as a Muslim Turk, obviously, a white Turk to boot. Uh, I, uh, the most important memory I have, uh, you know, unlike the academic one, 
I was very lucky uh, to uh, uh, invite uh, Richard and Vartiter to accompany me uh, to um, a visit to Western Armenia together. And um, I issued the invite to uh, Richard and to Peter Balakian, but Peter said he was too scared to come. Uh, Richard said, I'm shaking in my boots, but I'm coming. Uh, so they uh, traveled uh, through uh, to Trabzon, where I went to pick them up, uh, Bartitar and Richard, and we spent about 10 days literally going through uh, the whole where the caravans went, the Kemah Gorge, uh, Harpert, uh, his village, uh, where he has this amazing picture on top of the, uh, yes, cabbage, yes. Oh, here, okay, sorry, uh, a cabbage patch. Uh, and it was what struck me the most uh, was uh, the grace uh, with which uh, they uh, demonstrated their, their sorrow uh, at seeing, of course, um, a devastated and destroyed uh, Armenian remnants of one kind or another. And uh, it was through him uh, I um, understood about uh, denial about uh, social justice and how uh, if you want to be socially just, you have to uh, make sure that everyone in your society, in my case, Turkish society, is treated in a just manner. And it was because of that uh, that I realized uh, um, that I had to study this more. Uh, but uh, our tra travel uh, was in 2007. I actually met uh, Richard for the first time when he came to the Middle East Studies Association conference, trying to establish these, you know, Armenian things. And where am I on the other side? Because uh, Heath Lowry was my uh, Ottoman professor when I was at Boğaziçi University. And then I came uh, to Princeton uh, and I studied with Bernard Lewis there. So I have a very interesting legacy and you can imagine, you know, but to give them credit when I took a stand and ended up writing the denial of violence about the Armenians in, uh, in, in, in the Ottoman Empire and modern Turkey, they both congratulated me and said it was good that I was doing what I was doing, which is, you know, at least a, a positive thing, <laughs> you know. And going forward, uh, especially at uh, Michigan, uh, we have tried very hard uh, uh, to uh, especially develop Turkish-Armenian, of course, uh, relations, because uh, there are also, as in all society, enlightened Turks in Turkey too, you know, who want these uh, violences in the past to be made public so that we don't repeat them. I always say we will not have democracy in Turkey unless we account for all the violence we meted out on people in our own past. So that is at least uh, what I try to do uh, going forward. And one thing that uh, struck with me as we were traveling through Western Armenia because he had written all those books, especially when we were coming to Harpert, he says, okay, now we're going to go around the mountain, we're going to descend on the valley. He just literally narrated the entire landscape uh, and all the uh, in instances uh, going forward. So I could see how much he felt uh, about that. Um, so after our 1982-83 uh, uh, encounter at Mesa, uh, he was like on the other side, and I was with Heath Lowry and all the other Turkish students, and we were take they were taking pictures of each other and you know chasing each other around. It was like, and at that time I saw him and I went and talked to him, and he was great. He was very gracious. He talked back to me because I don't believe in these. You know, we we are all of the same uh, soil. Uh, you know, yes, we came much later and you were ancestrally there before us. I, I always uh, say that, but we did live a long time together and, and we share a lot, uh, uh, much more than our uh, differences, of course, differences which nationalism brought upon us and destroyed us. And hopefully, you know, we will go back uh, to more communitarian models. But the, let me um, end by uh, talking about the impact uh, he had uh, uh, on my life. So I wrote uh, nine, uh, my dissertation until 1988. 
And during that time, I also started getting interested in things, uh, Armenian, of course, because I already knew Ottoman uh, language, Ottoman history. I studied, you know, with Lowry and with uh, Inaljuk and Lewis. So we're talking the whole uh, well, Hall of Fame uh, of <laughs> Turkish historians, but I'm a sociologist, so there's some deviance there, obviously. Uh, but um, I first wrote uh, a piece for him uh, for the Remembrance and Denial book, uh, and that is when uh, he truly understood what I was doing, and uh, he started inviting me to conferences here. Uh, it was very uh, interesting because we went to Glendale and the people are going around telling what's happening. Uh, and then I said who I was and then there's this silence. <laughs> and then he says, he turns to them and he says, yes, he's a Tur she's a Turk and you're going to listen to her. And that was it. And then, you know, I delivered a, again a talk uh, on, on the stage and uh, he came up and he said, Yes, he's, she's going to talk, and you're going to listen very quietly. Are you, so it was fascinating about how she, he sort of, you know, integrated me into uh, it. But through him, I learned what it is like to be a minority in my own country. I learned the sufferings because as a white Turk, I didn't know any of that. And because of that, I decided to work on minorities after writing The Denial of Violence, which is on the Armenians, I'm now writing um, um, a book on the Kurds, because once the Armenians were gone, the Kurds were the ones, of course, the different ones that are being, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately uh, decimated uh, um, themselves until the, I mean, uh, the present. And because of uh, uh, my interest in those two, and because I teach here, I'm now also going to be working on Native Americans and African Americans in this country, because they too need to, uh, you know, obviously I, as a contribution to this country, uh, I figured I would also help uh, bring justice uh, to our own unjust past in the United States. Thank you. First, uh, uh, I'm Armand Erkuregen. Uh, uh, I feel honored. Can you hear me? Yes. I feel honored to be here and par be a participant in this momentous occasion. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, during my career as a professor at UC Berkeley and then as president of the American University of Armenia, I had, a, I had the privilege of interacting with uh, Professor Richard Hovannessian on a number of occasions. Uh, in the interest of time, I will highlight just a few of uh, these interactions. I must add that as an engineering academic, I will refrain from characterizing uh, Professor uh, Hovannessian's role as a historian, that uh, the experts have done this well and are doing, so I am I think uh, I should uh, stay within my own bounds. Um, in 1995, after many years of community-wide effort, fundraising and negotiation with the university, we were finally able to establish the Armenian Studies Program at University of California at Berkeley. As the chair of the advisory committee of that program, I'm, I deemed it befitting that Professor Richard Ovanesian be the inaugural uh, visiting professor of that program. Uh, with the approval of the advisory committee, I invited Professor Ovanesian to teach the very first course on modern Armenian history in that program. We were fortunate that he agreed, uh, even though the arrangement required uh, a lot of back and forth travel between Los Angeles and Berkeley. Uh, he would travel to Berkeley each week and give lectures to an enthusiastic, I must say, very enthusiastic group of students and auditors. He also mentored several of these students for their future studies. Uh, in subsequent years, every year, I would call Richard and ask his advice uh, on selecting the visiting professor 
next year for the program. Uh, two momentous occasions uh, of interaction with Professor Richard Ovanesian occurred during my presidency of the American University of Armenia. The first one uh, took place uh, on October 10, 2014. And when we had the opening of the collection of books he generously donated to the AUA AGBU Papazian Library. Professor Hovanissian donated his pro professional library of 1,338 books, which greatly enriched our library collection on the subjects of Armenian, Russian, Soviet, Near and Middle Eastern, ancient and medieval, Byzantine and modern uh, European history and culture. On this occasion, we unveiled a plaque in his honor. Uh, on this occasion, we unveiled a plaque in his honor in the wing of the library uh, that is dedicated to his collection. Uh, and uh, I, I want to make sure that our students knew who owned these books, who touched these books, and uh, who read these books. Uh, I think it's important for them to know. And so the plaque is next to his collection. The second occasion was in April 2018 when we hosted a series of lectures by Professor Richard Hovanesian dedicated to the centennial of the First Armenian Republic. Co-sponsored by the AGBU, the lectures were held on April 16, 18, and 20, and were respectively entitled May 28, The Uncharted Course Toward Independence, Creating the Republic's Infrastructure, and Armenia in the International Arena and an Assessment. The lectures were attended by a large audience from within and outside the university. The depth of his knowledge on the topic of the First Republic and his extraordinary mastery in storytelling made an indelible impression on all those who were fortunate to attend those lectures. My other interaction with Professor Hovanesian of a more personal nature was in connection with his last ed edited book on Armenian communities of Persia, Iran. Uh, this is based on the proceedings of two conferences held at UCLA, the first in 2004, on the occasion of the 400th anniversary of New Julfa, uh, and the second on our Armenian communities in Iran. One of the presentations in the first conference was by Leonardo Alishan and was entitled Images of New Julfa, Sumbat's paintings and some remembrances. Unfortunately, as many of you know, Leonardo tragically passed away a year after that uh, conference. Sumbat, in uh, Leonardo's article, happened to be my father, a renowned watercolorist from New Julfa. Uh, Richard knew that I had published a book about my father, uh, father's life and art. Uh, furthermore, he had one of his paintings, uh, I think gifted to him by the Armenian Educational Foundation. And I know that he truly valued that painting. Many times he mentioned that to me. Uh, in May 2020, I received an email message from Professor Rovanissian that said, and I quote, about 15 years ago at the UCLA Conference on Armenian Communities of Iran, Leonardo Alishan presented a paper on Sombat. I have that short text, but it needs to be enhanced. As you have done so much work on Sombat, I'm writing to invite you to prepare a supplemental piece on Sombat. End of quote. The short text uh, Professor Hovanesian was referring to was a one-page abstract Leonardo had prepared for his talk. It just happened that Leonardo has had, had asked me to project photographs of Sumbat's paintings during his presentation at the conference. 
for that reason, I happen to have Leonardo's handwritten text of the full 25-page article with notes on the margins telling me uh, which paintings to show. And Richard didn't have it. I happened to have it in my thoughts. I offered to Professor Hovannesian to edit that article and have it published in the book along with a selection of Somba's paintings. That article uh, is now chapter 23 in the published book. Furthermore, the cover of the book shows a pan panoramic view of New Julfa painted by my father in 1958 uh, from the roof of our house in that city. I remember that day ex very precisely when he went up on the roof three, four hours later, he came down with that painting. And if you have the book, it's on the cover of that book. Working with Professor Ovanesian on this article was a most rewarding experience for me. It's the first time I've interacted with a non-engineering <laughs> academic. Last but not least, in October 2022, the San Francisco Hamas guy hosted a lecture by Professor Ovanesian about this book. In spite of his health problems, he gave a full hour lecture, standing there full hour, and he spoke all from memory and fused with fascinating details and stories that he knows by heart. Uh, he was gracious enough to ask me to make brief remarks when the time came uh, to talk about Leonardo's chapter. Uh, it has been a pri special privilege and honor for me to interact with Professor Richard Vanessian on these and other occasions. The memory of these interactions will always remain fresh in my mind. Thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists. You can take your seats. And I think Anne. Thank you, Christine. And thanks to all of you, Armen, Bocha, and uh, Armen, other Armen. So uh, next in our program actually is a musical performance that comes to us from our Armenian music program. I am absolutely delighted to introduce you to Professor Melissa Bilal, who is now the newly appointed promised chair in Armenian music, arts and culture at UCLA our third endowed chair having to do with Armenia and Armenians, first being the Narakatsi chair, then the Hovanissian chair, and now we have a new chair in Armenian music, arts, and culture. So, Melissa, I will bring you to the podium to introduce our musician. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Armen. And said, I'm Melissa Bilal, the Promised Chair in Armenian Music, Arts, and Culture. Apart from having the honor of being the inaugural holder of this important chair, which is the third Armenian chair at UCLA, as Anne said, one of which was founded by Professor Hovannesian himself, I'm also especially emotional today, remembering the day I met Professor Hovannesian some 23 years ago in Turkey, when he visited my hometown, Istanbul, Bolis, for a conference at my alma mater, Boğaziçi University. The conference was organized by the Oral History Association, and the fact that this important scholar, an Armenian scholar, was going to give a paper at this conference, a paper on the memory of the Armenian genocide, as you know, denied by the Turkish government, successive Turkish government, and the articulation of which criminalized by the state. This created excitement in my community of Bosahais, and of course, backlash in Turkey. And I remember that the relatively progressive Turkish Social History Foundation at the last minute withdrew its sponsorship from the conference. I remember going to see this giant uh, probably the first diasporan Armenian scholar I have ever met in person with a group of other Armenian college students at Boğaziçi University. 
after attending his lecture, I had the chance, I had the honor to attend a concert of a uh, concert with him uh, on campus that, that same day. And it was a concert uh, by uh, Boaz University Folklore Club. Uh, members of some some members were Armenians, and the the club was performing songs in Armenian, Turkish, Kurdish, Laz, and other languages spoken in Turkey. After the concert, during which Professor Hovanesian was sitting next to me, we said goodbye, and he turned to me and said, "Hayutunat chumornas, don't forget your Armenianness." It sounded puzzling and strange, I have to say, back then that the Spürkahay diaspora Armenian was telling a young Bosahay to hold on her identity, Armenian identity, or never deny her Armenianness. But his words stayed with me for decades and resonated in my mind. What I found strange back then as a young uh, Bosahay makes a lot of sense today. As I stand here as the chair of Armenian music and culture, and it gives, it guides me in my work at UCLA as I teach young generations of diaspora Armenians music, oral history, and gender studies. Now I turn to music. Uh, I am also the director of the Armenian music program at UCLA. And when Anan Hasmik approached me with the idea of including music in this commemorative event, I thought of Richard Hovannesian's volumes dedicated to the history and cultural heritage of Western, the, the, the various provinces of Western Armenia. Together with the master musicians you will hear in a bit, we decided to put together a program that reflects the importance of oral tradition, in this case, songs and instrumental melodies, in terms of historical research. As primary sources for the historian, and how music research is an essential part of what Richard Hovannesian envisioned with those volumes. And in fact, I recall at least two music articles in these volumes. The program you will hear today covers repertoire from Daron, Van of Historic Armenia, all the way to Bardizak in the West. And it will also cover pieces that, um, that um, reflect the relationship that emphasize the relationship between musical connections between Western and Eastern Armenia. You will hear a variety of genres, including lullabies. These songs either survived in the memories of the survivor generation and were passed on to us through oral transmission, or they come from the song collections of Gomidas Vartabet, his student Miran Tumajan, and Grigor Stunik who is, of course, from Artsakh, but lived and collected uh, songs in Western Armenia, mainly in Garin, because uh, Grigor Suni was uh, a teacher in Garin's um, uh, Erzurum Getronagan. They were collected either before the genocide, as in case uh, of Gomidas and Suni, or from the survivors in exile, as in the case of Miran Tumaja. Our celebrated musicians are legendary singer Hasmi Karutunyan, who is the living proof that it was the genocide survivors from the Ottoman Empire who became source people for Western Armenian musical heritage in what was then the First Republic of Armenia and Soviet Armenia. Hasmi keeps alive the repertoire she learned from her mentor Hayrik Muradyan and her own Moshetsi family. She, of course, needs no introduction because she released numerous CDs and performed around the world. She is a meritorious artist of the Republic of Armenia and currently mentoring our UCLA students through a fellowship program founded by us, UCLA Armenian Music Program. Vartan Bagdasaryan is a Vastagavor Kamanchahar, a master Kamanchist, another meritorious artist of Armenia. He has been a master solo performer in many major ensembles in Armenia. And of course, we are very privileged to have him as one of our Kamancha mentors, actually the Kamancha mentor, one of our mentors of UCLA Armenian Music Program. Our third performer is Armen Adamyan, who is a master dudukahar, a master duduk player, and a PhD candidate in ethnomusicology at UCLA. And he is 
currently teaching, I think for the first time in history and only here at UCLA, if I'm not wrong, a course titled Introduction to Armenian Woodwinds, Duduk and Shivi, Capacity Enrollment. And this is the second term, actually, the students are returning. Uh, and Armen is writing his dissertation on the revival of Western Armenian music heritage in Armenia today. Now I invite the students to the stage, uh, the musicians to the stage, and have the floor to music. I hope you enjoy. Thank you for having us. So we're definitely thankful for Professor Richard Hovannesian because if it wasn't for him, if, it's okay. That's why I'm talking. So to give him time to <laughs> um. If it wasn't her, for him, uh, we would definitely not be um, studying Armenian issues at UCLA, and thus we would um, not even be um, thinking about Armenian music and its cultural and socio-political roles as a uh, as a memory practice. Um, and as Melissa said, um, I I was lucky enough to meet uh, Hasmi Harutunyan um, as part of my fieldwork research in Armenia because uh, she played an instrumental role in um, maintaining the memory of Western Armenian music uh, in Soviet Hayastan, uh, particularly um, being a student of Haidik Muradian, the iconic folklore revivalist who was a survivor from the Armenian genocide from Shatakh. And he passed on a lot of songs to her, so we're very lucky to hear those songs today. And because um, we have another special guest, um, uh, a Kiaman Cha master from um, Hayastan, from Yerevan. Um, Vartan is also going to play because the Western Armenian and Eastern Armenian musical idioms would converge uh, after the genocide in, in the Republic of um, uh, in the Soviet Republic. So he's also going to play um, one piece that is characteristic of the Southern Caucasus tradition. Um, he will play the mode of Charga.
le le jam gorani le 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 gorani le 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 ma shu gorani
Thank you again so much, uh, Vartan, Hasmik, Armen, and Melissa. What a magnificent performance. Uh, now it is time for lunch. As you know, we are running a bit late. I would ask, so those of you who are here in person, we do have lunch provided for you. Uh, in our lobby, there are places to eat in the lobby, in the outdoor patio, in the uh, uh, some of the adjacent rooms. Um, we can open the ones that are available. Please do not bring food into this room or drinks. Uh, we will see you in an hour, let us say, 2.30 Pacific time. And we will have a very special video to be presented by Ani Hovanesian. So please be back promptly. Thank you. Okay, well, welcome back to our uh, afternoon session um, of talks and presentations. We are absolutely delighted to bring to you now a new retrospective video that has been created by our own uh, Ani Honesian Kevorkian, who is a well known filmmaker and documentarian, and of course, Richard's daughter. So let us welcome Ani to the podium. Parevses, Pariyagak. Welcome home. Welcome to his home, our home, the home he gave us for all of our lives. I'm really overcome with emotion and love and gratitude to the Promised Armenian Institute, Dr. Karagosyan, Hasmig, Emily, Nanod, for creating this most meaningful day. To Papa, Papa, always with us, and to you. Because I realize that he's in all of you and all of us. And I know that Papa is smiling very humbly and beautifully and big as he is today. Not because this is about him, and not because we are applauding all he has done, but because we are carrying on what he gave us. Papa, throughout his life, picked up gathered the pieces of our grand and glorious and broken and forgotten and defining Armenia and brought them together or worked to bring them together to make them whole again, to make it whole and to revive it, to give it life. And likewise with us, what Papa has done as he has today is to bring all of us together to make us whole, to realize that we belong to something so great and so big and so important. And it's not only Armenia, 
It is humanity. And these are words perhaps, but they're so real and he made them real. He made them real with everything he did through his life and with how he lives in each of you. I, I, honestly, I look at each of you and I see a part of Papa and there can be no greater gift. And I, his daughter, well, he and Mama gave me the world literally gave me the world. They gave my brothers, Rafi, Armen, Garo, our entire family, the world. They gave us Fresno, our grandparents, our cousins, aunts and uncles, our roots, many of whom are here. Uncle Vernon was here. He had to return to Fresno for a wedding, thankfully. Papa's only um, living brother, though I believe they're all living, truly. And um, they gave us roots in Fresno, and they gave us UCLA. They gave us the rec center and Poly Pavilion and our classes and the conference rooms, our our Bruin spirit and our education. And more than that, you know, I'm looking at this conference and I'm remembering all the conferences that Papa created. I brought some of the programs with me, but I didn't bring them up with me. But there, there is a program that the Promise Institute created for today. And Papa likewise would create these big fold out programs for each of the conferences full of people bringing community together, bringing everybody together, and bringing the pieces of Armenia together, bringing Gadin and Van and the communities of, 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 New, of Julfa and, and Harpet and all these places and people and pieces and bringing them together and bringing them alive with the community coming alive, bringing the community together. And Papa gave me the greatest gift of allowing me, not allowing me, it was just a given. We all belonged and we belong. We were side by side as we traveled the world together. And discovered ourselves in all the places where we traveled whether it was Egypt or India or Syria or Lebanon or Argentina or Brazil, everywhere we went, Papa brought people together, communities together, and brought them alive and revived identity and revived belonging and revived a drive to the future. Yes, rooted in the past, but a drive to the future. And I am so thankful for the life, for the thousand lifetimes Papa lived and gave, and Mama, and for taking me to our ancestral homeland, to the soil of Mami, Tunguhi, and Babi Hovagim, and Babi Kaspar, and Grandma Sirun, and to all of our grandparents' birthplaces and homes to touch and feel that soil together and to be filled with the souls of our people. Even to, in the desert of Dezor, to lift the bones of our people out of a mountain of bone, of, of, of us. But here we are. And here is 13-year-old Emmanuel Kazaz, who has come because he wanted to come and learn. And he told me that next year he gets to choose an elective in high school at Clark, and he's choosing Armenian history. Papa would be most pleased because there are youth here. And he would be most pleased because 
we have purpose. He would say, enjoy life, but have a purpose. And that makes it more enjoyable. Papa, you will always live in every breath and step I take through life. And, and I know that somehow the same for all of us as we carry forward what has been entrusted to us, Shunagaltiun, and now Papa in his voice, at least a drop of his miraculous life and being and good and truth and purpose for all of us to enjoy. Thank you. Hello, Heidi. Hello, dear Sose. I know you as Heidi, which actually means father in Armenian and not grandfather, but you're our father, so. Yes, well, I like the word Heidi. It means like little father <laughs> as enduring term. I was born in Tulare, California, a small um, farming community uh, not far from Fresno, an hour, those days probably an hour and a half drive from Fresno. Uh, my father had been through the uh, genocide of 1915, had uh, survived. He was from the village of Basmashen in Kharpev. The Armenians of Tulurik all came from Basmashen, and almost all of them were farmers. I mean, they all had vineyards or farms. And I uh, always felt a, a sense of hurt um, when I would look in uh, geography and history uh, textbooks for the name Armenia and, and was disappointed that I didn't find the name there, or if I did it was just in passing that the Romans conquered 15 countries including Armenia. And by the time I had uh, gone to Berkeley, I had uh, then uh, felt uh, a discovery uh, of my Armenian identity. I was comfortable being a non-Armenian, but now that allowed me to become comfortable as being an Armenian. And I became uh, active in Armenian youth organizations and prompted me to want to learn the Armenian language, which I could only speak Kitchen Armenian, dialectical Kitchen Armenian. Uh, propelled me to go on to Beirut, um, Lebanon for a year to learn Armenian. In Fortune, I am a Kaila Zuner, Chagan or Hire and Gartal Kerel, Yev Kohem, Yev Shunragalem, Beiruti Jamaranin, where the Vav Ain Megdarin in Z, Urgirtha Machachavil, Hire and Lesvov, Sorvil. Uragan Dasnu Chors Dasnu Vet Jam, Porcel, Sorvil, Hairen, Lezun. It gave me the means to come back uh, having the ability to use Armenian and Armenian sources uh, that are essential to do what I wanted to do, and that was to write a history of the first Armenian Republic, which existed only three years. And I spent uh, many years uh, working on that uh, as a result of this sort of reawakening of my uh, identity. My uh, greatest uh, supporter and my greatest critic is Vartiter Kocholosin. The <laughs> 
So when I came to UCLA, I was a lecturer there in the early 60s, but I was able to get a tenured position in 1969 and create graduate and undergraduate programs. It was about that time that it sort of struck me that those people, Armenians in Fresno, when I went back to visit, one by one, they weren't there anymore. <coughs> they weren't on their front porches. This is indeed a memorable evening, an exciting evening, not only for me, but I'm sure for all of you and for thousands of individuals outside the halls of this banquet. We are here today receiving from the University of California, one of the greatest universities in the world, a commitment, a commitment to teach and to have a position in Armenian modern history in perpetuity, that is for as long as the university is in business. As a teacher, I've been thankful that I had the opportunity that Armenian studies came along in the university when it did. And secondly, it's been a fascinating odyssey for Vartiter and me to travel around the continents into the various archives to study this very short period of Armenian history and to be amazed by the materials that are kept in every archive of the world nearly. But there is another side to my activities which is also a side of your activities. I've been forced to give up much of my scholarly time to the campaign for truth against those who would deny. Denial is a crime and those people who say that the current governor, governments are not responsible for their predecessors are wrong if those present go governments continue to perpetuate the lies that such events did not occur. Thank you. You have to believe that by teaching what is right, by teaching the history of the Armenian Genocide, by teaching the Holocaust and the lessons that have to be gain from the Holocaust and from what's gone, the victimization of the Cambodian people by, by its own government, that, the, that a generations will continue to be committed and try to eliminate the worst excesses uh, that take place frequently in the name of government, frequently in the name of religion, frequently in the name of a good ideology, frequently in the name of making the world a better place, but a better place for whom? And I think we have to all work for it's being a better place for all. If you're going to prevent genocide, the predictability of punishment has to be there as well. That is, perpetrators have to know that there is punishment to be followed. 
what next? And it is the question of what next that terrifies the uh, Turkish government. Stop the denial, teach the truth, say that we, our predecessors may committed a crime and we should work never to commit it again. What the Armenian community today and those who are involved in human rights today are really seeking is reaffirmation of the Armenian genocide of the United States government because at the time when it did occur under the presidency of Woodrow Wilson, it was affirmed many times they over and given the name the murder of a nation, a holocaust and many other inferno and many other terms. I conclude by thanking Councilman Victoria, Council Chairman Garcetti, all of you who have spoke and all of you who will vote and speak up for human rights because the Armenian genocide is not only an Armenian issue, it's a human issue. And a cardinal part of that struggle is the struggle of memory against forgetting. And I think we're here today to commit ourselves to that struggle of memory against forgetting. If we are persistent and if there are enough of us and we really believe we will continue with our own personal sacrifices to build up the underlying soil so that ultimately it will dam up the damnation of genocide. Thank you. We are all excited about Karabakh, and we're saying, when is it going to be united um, to Armenia? But the fact is, probably, that very few of us know much about this land. Karabakh. Karabakh is the easternmost extremity of the great Armenian plateau. This is the historic Armenian province of Arzakh. You must understand the importance of this area as a symbol of Armenian freedom. And indeed, when all of the rest of Armenia was submerged for several hundred years under alien rule, the mountains of Karabakh maintained a semi-autonomous existence. And even at the time, even after the Mongol invasions, which were terribly destructive for Armenia, the Armenians in this region of mountainous Karabakh continued to put forward great cultural places. The, the monastery of Ganzasar. They had their, even their own, their own Catholicos in Ganzasar. And so for the Armenians, this region on the top of the Armenian world was like a beacon of light in a great deal of darkness. And many Armenians even concentrated in this last region of semi-autonomous existence. And I never thought, by the way, in the 30 years that I was writing this history of uh, the first Armenian Republic, that all of these issues about which I wrote in detail would become live issues once again. You may um, uh, be rather surprised if you read the chapters on Karabakh alone, so much will be familiar to you because this all came alive again uh, after 1988. My mission in life only partially successful, has been to see to it that all of us have this same shared common goal that it's important to understand, to bring out from prejudice and mythology, the true and real history of the Armenian people. I'll tell you a, a little bit about the background of this collection. You know, my first teaching job, well, not my first, but my steady teaching job was at a uh, a school in Fresno and I remember walking down the streets of what we call the Hazelwood district and block after block after block were Armenians uh, and in the summer they would sit on their porches and as you walk by they would greet you uh, and if you had a little baby in a stroller it was even better and and I now realize that every single one of those people had a story. Every one of those people had been uh, uh, a survivor. We, we, we thought that they were going to be there forever, uh, but they weren't. And so I was pleased that I was able to put in a proposal to do a course on Armenian oral history uh, at UCLA and to give students credit for doing 
What didn't seem so great, that is uh, 10 interviews in a quarter, but was a lot of work. How many interviews do you have here? Ask Mano Kilte. <laughs> We're getting Professor Alonician's uh, Armenian Genocide testimonies and his audio cassettes and on all the documents that he has in relation to his collection that he's been working on for 40, 50 years. Um, we're getting, we are transporting his cassette tapes and we think we may have about 870 to 970 tapes. Um, but we're gonna find out in the, in the next few weeks. You mean interviews, not tapes. Sorry, interviews, uh, interviews. Tapes, we have a lot more. Maybe you could triple that or quadruple it. I'm hoping that the show will have the facilities and the resources to handle it the way I want it to be handled. In honor and appreciation of his contribution to the Visual History Archive, USC Shoah Foundation commits to preserve in perpetuity and make accessible for research, education, and the promotion of human rights, the Richard G. Hovhannisian Armenian Genocide Oral History Collection. May that legacy live on. Probably all of you have Armenian kids in your classrooms, or most of you do. Do we realize really how um, difficult it is for a lot of these kids? They have um, probably the children of immigrants, and or may they, they may be immigrants themselves. Why did their parents or grandparents feel the need uh, to leave a land which they really loved. They had, like probably I had, a lot of identity issues of, you know, who am I? Um, how do I become accepted uh, into the mainstream? I got over my identity crisis and I, I, I found out it's pretty good being something else besides uh, the good Anglo-American that I can be. Uh, that I'm enriched by this additional dimension or dimensions. Wouldn't it be nice if we asked where people were from, what was life like in this place and that place, and uh, how did we get here? And uh, make them comfortable to appreciate the dual existence that they have that they may not realize at this time. And so you're the leaders and you're the teachers, and. Uh, I look forward to your going forward. Thank you. In my later years at UCLA, I was so conferences of this type maybe help to lower the barrier to break a brick down at a time in the great divide that still leaves uh, an enormous diaspora in Armenian community with unhealed wounds. If you will allow me a personal moment, uh, because we do have the Marta Sedeva and Jemaran and the Wardens, I have, uh, uh, I have published books on our historic Armenian provinces of Harvard, Vaughan, Sebastia, Pikramagirt, Gai, and so forth, which are now unfortunately lost to us for the time being, but I would like to present these to the wardens if they would like to give them to the army in school. I was given a little extra life next in order to come to this final volume that I didn't think that I would ever publish. Appreciate the question 
and I want to reiterate that I appreciate you. Um, I just want to acknowledge these two young men here who have been sitting here from 9 o'clock this morning until now. I want to say bravo to you. It's a good example. We hope that more families will, and parents will encourage their children to come with their children. So uh, the worst fears of the Armenians have come to pass. Their lands on both sides of the frontier will become uh, the theater for war, and there will be inescapable, inescapable tragedy for the Armenians. But no Armenian at that time could dream or imagine that that, in, that tragedy would really amount to a genocide in which the entire Western Armenian population would be swept away irreversibly, perhaps forever, uh, from the lands on which they had lived uh, for the for 3,000 years. Is this Antronik here? Stand up, let's, let's take a look at Antronik on your chest. He's tattooed on his chest, let's look at it. Come here. This is Antronik. This is, uh, this is the nice hero. <laughs> and he's your buddy, right? Yes. He's your buddy. This is Antronik. He was born in, in Sebastia in Sivas and became a revolutionary fighting for 30 years against the Turks as a partisan warrior. All right? And he died in Fresno, California. Bye, Professor. Nice, nice last class. Thank you. not only who are here today, but the thousands over the half century that have been bright, motivated, brilliant, and have kept me going and feeling young and being a part of this university and keeping me on my toes and allowing me to expand my horizons. All true teachers learn a great deal from their students, and I am no exception, and I'm very thankful for that. When I arrived at UCLA at the age of 28, as a member of its faculty, I uh, had, had walked something of a miraculous path, uh, a most unusual path, and one that really should not have been mine, but fate would have it that it became mine. And I fantasize, I fantasize a lot. Fantasize about one day Armenia being independent. Someday representing an independent Armenia at the United Nations. Truly fantasy. Well, it wasn't really so much a fantasy, but in fact, it would be my own son who in 1992 would have that privilege of raising the Armenian red, blue, and orange flag in front of the United Nations building. And so fantasies sometimes become reality. The Armenian flag went up at the United Nations in March of 1992 on my father's and mother's anniversary. Uh, and and that, you put it up. And, I, and Well, I put it up on behalf of all the generations. And so we have this nice circular pattern of Armenia lost, remembered, and regained. Our generation was the middle one uh, between my father's and uh, our children's, uh, and uh, we're, uh, we're Bruins both in the, in the uh, basketball and football and sporting way, uh, and uh, in terms of our gratitude for the academic uh, opportunity that UCLA provided us. We in the Promise Armenian Institute family are truly honored and humbled to welcome to the stage our own Dr. Richard Hovanissian, recipient of hundreds of awards, too numerous to mention today, but it is now uh, my distinct pleasure and privilege to welcome him to our stage for introductory remarks. So Richard, welcome. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Dr. Cargos, and you're always very generous in your introductions. And dear members of the Kerr family, founders and organizers and maintainers of the Promise Institute and uh, friends of the UCLA and the community for this uh, auspicious event of 
the inaugural of the Kerr family lectureship. Stanley and Elsa were the living witnesses to these events and their letters and their writings leave no nothing to imagination and they put faces on people which makes it all the more common. They spent a great part of their life tending to the surviving children of the genocide. So I want to leave you with the idea that wherever you go and whatever you do, uh, find an ideal, find a cause. Service uh, gives you the greatest reward. I've been truly blessed. There's nothing more that I would want to have done than what I have done. A life of loving, teaching, being, trying to be objective and historic and at the same time to be something of a missionary, to teach, to inspire. We all strive to make a difference, that we all strive to believe that when we leave this world we have done something good. And I thank you for this honor and for your good because I know all the good work you're doing in education for Armenia in these terrible, terrible times that have crushed our spirit for two years. But we have learned in the long history of the Armenian people that we shall remain. Thank you.
not sure what to say, but thank you. Thank you, Ani, for that effort of love in putting together that amazing video. Mish um, Moving on, our next uh, panel will once again be moderated by our own Dr. Christine Maridosian Olshansky, and this one pertains to um, our dear Richard's pioneering Armenian studies as a field, both with organizations and with universities. So, Christine, I'll welcome you back to the podium. Hi again. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Huri Berberian, Professor of History and Mehruni Family Presidential Chair in Armenian Studies and Director of the Center for Armenian Studies at UC Irvine. Please help me in welcoming her. Um, I have to admit, it's a little hard to follow that. Thanks for putting me on this panel. Um, it's an honor to be here. I don't know what more we can say that hasn't already been said, but we will continue to say it and in different ways. Titan, pioneer, towering, renowned, trailblazer, giant, father of modern Armenian studies. There are just a few of the many ways Professor Hovanisian has been recognized in his lifetime and is remembered today and will be remembered. In the 10 minutes I have, I'll focus on one very important contribution he made throughout his life and career, one that sets the course, one that set the course for how Armenian studies has been received, and one that changed its trajectory from a small, obscure field to a globally recognized one. I will also incorporate remarks of my own experience and relationship with Professor Hovanisian as one of his doctoral advisees at UCLA. As an, as an author, or over dozens and dozens of articles in authored and edited books, a prolific lecturer, conference organizer, co-founder and three-term president of the Society for Armenian Studies, as an advisor or mentor, both direct and indirect to graduate students and emerging scholars, or as a teacher to undergraduates, Professor Hovanisian has made a tremendous contribution to the field of Armenian studies, starting his own career at a time when Armenian studies was marginalized and minoritized, at a time when its scholars were known and appreciated only in their own narrow academic circles, even if that. In scholarship, in lectures, with his conferences, in his own history department at UCLA, he toiled to demarginalize Armenian studies. He struggled uh, to lure it out of its bubble, to wrench it out of its cocoon, a cocoon both self-ascribed and assigned by others. And he succeeded in familiarizing non-Armenians and Armenians alike to the field, to Armenian history, the first Armenian Republic, historic Armenian cities and provinces, and of course, to the Armenian genocide. Through his prolific scholarship and public-facing role, Professor Ovanisian brought Armenian studies scholarship to the people and the people to Armenian studies. Broad swaths of Armenians in the diaspora and in the Republic were familiarized to aspects of Armenian history and culture through his scholarship and efforts. Those outside of Armenian communities, generations of scholars and non-scholars alike, for the first time became acquainted with a minor people and a minor history eclipsed by the history of victors and great powers. His influence and impact were so enormous and his persona so commanding that Armenian studies has become identified with him more than any other person in the history of Armenian studies as a scholarly field. I can't count the number of times as an emerging scholar that the mere expression of what I do has elicited the mention of Professor Havanisian's name. As a 20-year-old senior at UC Berkeley in the late 1980s, when I expressed my interest in pursuing Armenian history as a doctoral student, my professor at the time, Middle East and Islamic historian Ira Lapidus's response was an unequivocal and explicit recommendation 
to go study with Professor Hovannisian. My first meeting with Professor Hovannisian was in his uh, sixth floor bunch hall office before my application to the PhD program in history, where he welcomed my interest in pursuing the study of Armenian history, but sternly spoke about the challenges ahead, trying to ascertain, I presume, whether I had what it took to take on the rigors of a doctoral program and succeed. I'm assuming I did. Uh, I spent the next several years under his tutelage and even TA for him, including his class on comparative genocide that you saw earlier, which was taught for the first time in the history of the department as a hybrid course with UCLA students learning in person and other UC campuses, Berkeley and Santa Barbara, uh, virtually, which was quite a feat for the 1990s. This is very pre-pandemic. Professor Ovanisian was a confident and impressive lecturer, seemingly speaking extemporaneously without any notes. He expressed interest in his undergraduate students as individuals and continued to promote the study of Armenian history, whether those students were Armenian or not. In many ways, he was a cheerleader for Armenian studies. I realize the visual uh, of Professor Ovanisian as a cheerleader might throw some of you off. But so instead, think of it as a person who encourages and supports rather than one carrying out tumbling routines. Although there too, the analogy serves us well, considering the acrobatics he had to perform to help bring Armenian studies as a field from the shadows and the, of the per and the periphery to the universal and intellectually relevant. The scholarly work we do today has its foundations in his scholarship and that of other scholars of his generations. The magnified awareness of Armenian studies among scholars or non-academics is largely due to his efforts, efforts that were carried out in challenging and unfriendly, even hostile circumstances against the tide of apathy or worse, antagonism and intimidation. As an advisor who, model, who modeled rather than pontificated or lectured, he taught through his example and experience about the harshness of working on the often dismissed history of Armenians, but also that of academia, more generally, often unfamiliar to those outside it. One of the most important contributions he made, one not widely recognized, was one that I picked up on wholeheartedly, that is to help lay the foundations through his historic Armenian cities and provinces conferences and edited collection for further study in the long and rich history of Iran's Armenians. To bring, and to bring that study out of the margins of Armenian studies. Professor Hobanisa and I shared a deep appreciation for this community of Armenians further minoritized in the already marginal field of Armenian studies. He consistently supported my pursuits of modern Irano-Armenian history, never questioning it, nor planting seeds of doubt in me about the significance of studying that history. There are relatively few specialists on Irano-Armenians in the world, most especially the modern period. His final edited collection published in 2011, uh, to, excuse me, 2021, which you saw a cover of, is a good start in bringing more attention and further developing scholarship on the oldest and closest of Armenia's diasporas. In public presentations, Professor Hovannisan talked about his visits to Tehran in Isfahan as a young scholar. And I was pleasantly surprised when going through Tehran's daily Alik for my co-authored book on Armenian women in Iran, I came across several articles from the 1960s and 1970s proudly talking about his appointment at UCLA his first book, Armenia on the Road to Independence, and his and Vartiter's visit to Tehran. Whether he knew he would be contrib contributing in some way to that community's history or laying and solidifying a foundation for the global and multi-directional growth of the field, I don't know. Although he never wrote about Armenian women's history, had he, had, had he been given the time, I'm sure he would have, uh, Although he never wrote about Armenian women's history, also historically neglected, uh, both within and outside Armenian studies, he demonstrated pronounced interest in and ultimately produced and advocated for at least one student uh, who pursued that history. In my own experience as his doctoral student, I found Professor Ravanisan a demanding advisor 
who expected the best and trusted you to deliver it. He was nevertheless in many ways hands off, trusting my own judgment and my own approach to and process in research and writing. For example, he welcomed my desire to connect modern Armenian and modern Iranian histories and working on both with him and Iran specialist Nikki Kedi. And it is because of that openness at a time when that combination was uncommon that I developed a double perspective in my scholarship, Armenian and Iranian, which has served me well throughout my career. As one might imagine, as students, we sought his approval and favorable comments. But Professor Ovanisan was, shall we say, sparing, uh, even cautious with expressing praise directly, so as, as he once said to me, kaluchat churi, so that your head will not uh, get big, or you won't get a big head. But recognition came through in other ways, in my case, through positive remarks he had made to others, or glowing letters of recommendation, the kind that prompt all graduate students suffering from imposter syndrome to say, is that me? Today, we continue to cherish and celebrate his field altering impact and contributions to Armenian studies within the field and outside. His legacy lives on in the work he has left behind and his students, both official and unofficial. He has either mentored or influenced profoundly who carry on his legacy. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christina Maranzi, who is the Mashtots Professor of Armenian Studies at Harvard University and the President of Society for Armenian Studies. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Maranzi. Hi, everyone. Um, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. In some ways, it feels like a reunion, except for the noted absence of the central figure. I keep thinking I'm going to see him, and he's not here. So it's very strange. Um, but I want to thank Anne and Hasmik and Nanor for organizing this so magnificently. Um, I have a lot of memories of Richard. I was, I guess, um, an unofficial student of his, um, I came, uh, my first time to LA was in, uh, was for his, one of the Historic Province conferences. And I can't remember if it was Sepastia or not, but my own family on one side is from Sepastia. So this was, um, he mentioned that I remember before I gave my talk, but I became sort of the art architecture person for the, the conferences and the volumes. And that was very important for me. It was a chance to publish, a chance to present, I wouldn't have otherwise got those opportunities. Um, and I know that that helped me tremendously in my career. And I'm, I'll never stop being grateful to him for that. Um, there are many other things I could talk about, but I wanted to address two things. Uh, well, really, yeah, one big thing, one little thing um, in the time that I have. And one is that when um, a colleague of mine at Harvard found out that I was going to be coming, she wanted to, to, to offer her own uh, brief remark too about him, and this is Professor Ioli Calavrezu, who was in the Department of Art History. And um, this, so I just want to read you this quickly. And she, so she's now at Harvard, but she was at UCLA. And she said that he was a wonderful colleague and they had a great understanding. And the vivid memory she has is that when the olives on the UCLA campus, olive trees uh, on the North campus were ripe, Richard, uh, Speros Vrionis, who may also be a name you know, um, and Ioli went collecting the olives, some that had begun to fall from the ground, others by shaking the trees a bit. Uh, this was done on the weekend when there were hardly any students around. And so she would look forward to this event every year. But I can just imagine the three of them, these you know, great scholars shaking olive trees together. Um, so now I want to um, talk a little bit about what Richard did for the Society of Armenian Studies, of which I am the president and we have officers here, um, as well as two past presidents, um, Bedros uh, and Barlow. Um, so I'm just, this is just a little bit of a, to give you a sense really of what he did. Um, and so this is the Society of Armenian Studies. These are some of the things we do. 
Um, it is, I forgot who said it, but this is a robust organization now uh, with many different dimensions, um, some of which you see on the screen. But how did it all start? Well, and this is Mark, I think it's from the NASA website, but anyway, I'm taking it. Um, so Richard, um, Richard was present at a conference uh, at Harvard sponsored by NASA in 1973. You can see the participants, quite the luminaries of Armenian studies, in, and also uh, a luminary of Indo-European philology, Calvert Watkins at the very end. Um, but Richard asked the gathered scholars about the desirability of the creation of a, of a professional society for scholars engaged in Armenian studies. And a month later, which is really, if you think about the time frame, this is amazing. He sent a letter to about 100 scholars and graduate students to gather feedback on the creation of this society. Well, what happened to those questionnaires? They're there. They're in my office. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think what happened was when Robert Thompson was president of the SAS, um, he had kept all those files, including canceled checks and things like that. And I have them. So it's a little mini archive of the SAS that's sitting on my uh, desk. So I thought in, in, you know, for this purpose, for this uh, symposium, I might rifle through and see what I could find, anything interesting. So let me just show you a few of the questionnaires. And I hope I'm not violating any confidential information here. But anyway, it's too late. Um, so <laughs> here is the questionnaire that he sent out. And you can see that it's a series of questions. So do you favor the formation of an academic forum in Armenia studies associated with a national scholarly society? Yes, no, undecided. Um, another one is about MESA. Actually, two are about MESA. Um, do you want to be associated with MESA? Are you a member now of MESA? More about MESA. Are you going to go to MESA? And would you, I think this is brilliant. I have to remember this. Would you serve on an ad hoc committee? You know, I mean, this is a kind of great information if you're organizing something. Um, and so it's really interesting then to see what people wrote, who signed, and what they said. And so I'm just showing you two examples here. Um, the one on the left from Kachik Tololian saying, good, good luck. I think this is a great idea. On the right is Nina Garsoyan in her very fine, neat handwriting. She tells us she's in process of becoming a member of, um, of MESA. And then we have my favorite one which belongs to um, Dikran Tashjan. And I love it because you can see that his little boy has decided to scribble in many undecided. So it's, it's uh, yeah, that I thought, I don't, yeah, anyway. Um, and then a couple more. Um, this one from Ara Dusturian on the left saying, basically, um, this is a great conference. Um, Good meeting you after all this time. Hope to see you at the next one. So here you get a sense of Richard's connection to colleagues and, and how much he was, he was loved. Um, and then this one is probably my second favorite, Dikran Kuimjan, uh, who is also, of course, a, a great participant in, um, uh, in the conferences. And he says, in com comments and suggestions, it is time for this important organization to get going. I had already tried to start such a thing in 1970. So if you know Dikran, you know this is, um, okay, let's keep going. Um, and then sometimes there was a little bit of, you know, frisson. So my name is spelled Yangoyan, not Yangoyan. Um, and then, um, and then this one from Robert Bedrosian, who indeed one can imagine was busy with his PhD oral and so he said he was frantically busy. And again, remembering his like, career, you could imagine he was busy. Um, in any event, um, he was the president of the Society of Armenian Studies in 1977. And he was president twice more in 1991 to 1992. And then again, from 2006 to 2009, which is a heavy lift um, when you think about everything else that he was doing. Um, I love this old font, by the way, for the Society of Armenian Studies. And then last thing I want to show you is this letter that I found in those files um, to Hrair. I don't know which Hrair I have to look again. Oh, thank you. Um, from 1974, March 11th. Just got your note. Would you believe I've been playing with this thing? 
for the last 10 days to the exclusion of all else except meeting my classes. Um, and then it says composing, typing, Xeroxing, stuffing, typing envelopes, mailing, what fun. Here you get a sense of his, uh, his sort, you know, sort of ironic humor, but it can be done. And I think with that, it can be done. That very much sort of conveys his spirit. Um, I will leave you and I will say, yes, it can be done. He did it. We're continuing to do it. And thank you so much for involving me in this. Thank you, Christina, for that lively um, remark. Um, next, we have a panel of speakers um, who I invite to come to the stage who work closely with Professor Hovanisian um, here at UCLA and in Los Angeles. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Peter Cowie, Narekati Chair of Armenian Studies at UCLA, Hagob Kulujan, um, Hach Hachigyan, family lecturer in Armenian Le language and culture at UCLA, and Mark Mamigonian, director of academic affairs at the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. Ah, well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Let me, if I may, just oh, yes, a by question all to you, to all the panelists. Um, Professor Huri Berberian and Christina Maranchi have discussed Richard's pioneering contribution to Armenian studies writ large, in addition to his long-lasting contribution to the establishment of scholarly and other organizations focused on Armenian studies and related Armenian issues. Could you please comment on your view of his impact, views of his impact in these areas, perhaps with a special focus on his um, Efforts that have efforts that have impacted your own institutions and your own careers. Ah, so uh, uh, thank you, if I if I may. Um, so we were uh, talking earlier on about the whole question of history. What is history? Fundamentally, the interpretation of the past for the understanding of the present. Uh, yes, I think that this is uh, very correct. Uh, one of the key issues, which is very important to note, is that history itself is always undergoing change. Uh, it's never the same. And this is where I think the role of uh, Richard in Armenian history is uh, so important. Um, I think that uh, we have to come to terms with basically the Richard Hovhannisian phenomenon. And I use that word advisedly because uh, fundamentally there was no one in Armenian studies in generating Armenian history until that time. Someone that is a Sian from uh, the West Armenian background in uh, Kharpert, uh, who is also then a son of Toler, Fresno, California, a young man who received his education uh, at a public university in Berkeley, and then of course went on to teach in UCLA. Those particular factors are found in no other uh, uh, person involved in Armenian history. If we think of uh, the past, obviously you have the tradition of oral history within the community. You have the uh, medieval, uh, the pre-modern ecclesiastical approach. And what I think is also important, uh, the, the, the approach that takes on uh, its uh, significance from the 16th century, basically in Europe. There we're talking about philology, texts, and uh, very much as uh, Huri indicated uh, 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 just a moment ago, um, everything is very uh, uh, individually based. And of course, this was the model for scholarship at that time, individual initiative. This still, of course, is a major, major issue in scholarship until our time. How do you actually document uh, collaborative uh, involvement in a, a particular uh, engagement? Um, and I think uh, also the, the, the other important uh, characteristic is that um, we're, we're talking, of course, about America. This is the first real time where America becomes involved in creating knowledge within the Armenian sphere. Uh, this also is a major novelty. So indeed, it's very understandable why we use these terms of uh, trailblazer, uh, of pioneer, etc. Now I think we, we have perhaps a greater contextualization of uh, why that uh, is. 
And so we come to this whole new understanding of the context uh, in which Armenian studies must function. Uh, in a public university, and as, as we saw in the film, Richard is saying, so we have to produce a, a set of courses in Armenian history for undergraduates. And of course, uh, one of the important things there is, so this is Armenian Studies, Armenian History 101. Um, so we need to have an overview from the beginning uh, until the, the present, pointing on trends to the, to the future. This, I think, again, is something that never really was uh, fully comprehended uh, uh, before within this sort of uh, perspective. And uh, so uh, fundamentally, this is one of my connections uh, with uh, Richard. I should say that uh, the very first one uh, uh, goes back a little later than um, the uh, images that um, uh, uh, Professor Maranzi just uh, showed. Uh, that was uh, 73, I think it was. Um, so uh, the Society for Armenian Studies was established, and uh, although at that time the main emphasis was on America, uh, it also spread gradually uh, into uh, Europe. So as a student at Oxford, I learned that uh, this initiative had uh, been undertaken, and I uh, wrote uh, to, to Richard that I would like to to, to become an associate, a member of the uh, society. And another point which I think is uh, very important to highlight, so we, we were talking about the evolution of SAS, which indeed in itself is enormously important. Um, but uh, the emphasis that was mentioned earlier on about Armenian studies becoming global, uh, this I, I think is uh, very significant with regard to later developments in Europe as well. Um, fundamentally, one of the best ways of uh, celebrating uh, uh, something or someone is to imitate. And so uh, this is exactly what we see happening there with the Association Internationale des Etudes Arméniennes, the AIEA, uh, which performed a parallel function primarily initially uh, in Europe, but uh, has since spread. So here again, we, we see the importance then of uh, all of this collaboration in Armenian studies uh, that uh, becomes uh, much, much more uh, broad. And this also, of course, is very important with regard to understanding of what is scholarship? Um, how do you proceed? Uh, and uh, I was already alluding to that. Uh, the need for cooperation, collaboration, um, for a teamwork. So this model basically that comes from um, the um, precise uh, sciences that is now applied in the humanities and uh, the social sciences and the, the great importance uh, of that. And I think that uh, we, we see uh, one of its uh, major results in the creation of this uh, textbook, because here again, we're talking about uh, undergraduates. Uh, they need to have something tangible in their hand to give them guidance as to how they are to enter into and to advance along this particular study. This was something that particularly in English was totally absent. We had it, of course, in classical Armenian, uh, in uh, East Armenian, uh, in French, but not in English. And this was, again, one of the major contributions, I think, of um, Richard. He realized the necessity. This is uh, an idea whose time has come. And then, of course, the major question was how to put it together uh, and uh, how to get all these uh, uh, crusty uh, uh, colleagues uh, who were very much in their, their own shells and their own areas, their own expertise, etc., to collaborate for the great benefit of the field as a whole. And this is, again, one of his uh, major achievements in bringing this about, as he did in uh, the volume Armenian People from uh, Early to Modern Times that was produced in 1997. Um, uh, clearly, uh, again, I think that uh, one of the major points which uh, 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 Professor Moranzi has uh, highlighted, uh, which is uh, important here, is the uh, development, of course, of a scholarly society, which I think is absolutely crucial to indicate that Armenian studies has arrived in the academy in America and also, of course, in other parts of the world. And I think it's important to, to note um, the great significance that this has, um, uh, not, not only then in uh, collaboration, but also in the broader process of the creation of new knowledge and uh, the encouragement of this endeavor. I think that uh, this is another very, very important aspect of this initiative of Richard, uh, producing the journal, a vehicle 
for uh, pr presenting the uh, results of uh, modern scholarship. Uh, the connection then with Mesa. That, uh, so here again, um, the um, conferences associated with this SES, the Society of Arabian Studies, should maybe be something uh, separate, exclusive, and uh, uh, limited, but should be part of the broad uh, warp and woof of uh, the study of the broader region in which um, uh, Armenia finds itself. And again, if, if I may, I'd like to pick up just a little on what uh, Professor uh, Vatna Gurchek was, was talking about, because I too was uh, present back in the, uh, the 1980s at uh, some of those uh, Armenian panels organized by Richard at Mesa. And I have to say that indeed, um, the atmosphere at those was truly electric. Um, uh, so uh, obviously this was of an, uh, enormous importance for everyone present in that room. But the sense also that uh, this was innovative, uh, new ideas, new understandings were evolving out of this. And I think that uh, here too, in terms of uh, Richard as being a mentor, one of the points that uh, I noted particularly uh, was the way in which uh, he would be next to the, uh, the people who are uh, uh, in charge of the actual panel and would be guiding in various ways, passing uh, little notes, et cetera. And the, the question then of uh, maintaining a certain detachment in a topic uh, in which then obviously everyone in the room was enormously engaged uh, in order to maintain the, the proper standards of discourse and of scholarship. Um, uh, and I think uh, this is also true with regard to the scholarships which uh, 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 SES is, uh, provides, uh, the, these various fellowships for graduate study, for uh, access to uh, various collections, et cetera, and um, the awards which are given uh, to acknowledge uh, the achievement and the promise of uh, upcoming graduate students. So these are some of the major things that uh, strike me in terms then of uh, Richard's uh, incommensurable involvement and uh, in and contribution to um, Armenian studies and Armenian history. Hello. Oh, yeah. So, uh, well, much has been said today about Oanisian's contributions that much left, but I limit myself to a few salient aspects uh, that seem more important than others to me subjectively. So the first thing I want to cite in this respect has been obviously mentioned, but it's worth repeating. Oanisian series on Armenian communities was a seminal and monumental achievement in 15 or 14 volumes. What I'd like to add here is that he put it together through massive heartache, which I witnessed and the sense of duty, a deep feeling of responsibility toward the lost generation, the lost stories, and the lost history. I know this personally, as I had the fortune to assist him in the edition of six of these volumes, four of them much more intensively. Yesterday, I was going through the hundreds of emails we had exchanged with Hovannisian while working on those volumes. And I realized I could easily make a long, long list with all the words he used to express his angst, his frustration, and his haste in order to advance and finish the project while torturing himself with a contagious sense of duty, as if he were the last one who could save that material for the world. Or if he didn't start the, that task, maybe no one would continue. Even though he took special uh, care of remaining objective in his writing and scholarly activities, this part of his produ uh, production stands out not only as a historical record, but as an act of bearing witness to loss. Uh, he officiated as a second-hand witness to events that defy and resist the act of witnessing. Genocide, an event that by some definitions is such when it attempts to erase or annihilate its own factuality, is particularly resistive to attempts to tell or narrate its occurrence and its impact. The more you tell, the more you know you're failing the fullness or comprehensiveness of it. That is why it may have been rewarding for him to resuscitate bits and pieces of the truth for history. However, I can tell he suffered because he knew there was no end to the telling. On the other hand, 
processing loss and telling loss is a frustrating and impossible job. When you narrate the loss, when you go toward the encounter of loss, when you recognize loss and describe loss, paradoxically, you may lose that sense of place that abstract knowledge of loss used to give you, even though it would be an upsetting place. Actualizing, verbalizing, seeing the physicality of loss is what I call the loss of loss. That is what I think was experienced by Hovhannisian after his trip to Western Armenia or Eastern Turkey almost two decades ago. I remember it was a Saturday night. We were sitting at the same table during a wedding reception of one of our graduate students in Universal City. I noticed that he was overly gloomy, sad, and uncharacteristically quiet. I'd say even depressed. I asked him if he was okay physically. His answer was that he had just returned from his trip to historical lands where Armenians used to live. He said that after four or five decades of talking about them and foregrounding them in his academic production, his tour in those lands had made him face and confront the loss in tangible, intense, and physical ways. It would take him a long time to process that feeling. Another area I'd like to talk about concerns his persistent efforts to disseminate his views among the larger community. We talked about this. It was about enabling, on the one hand, the outer world to get a glimpse of the truth and its destruction. On the other hand, it enabled the community subject to his research to acquire and to be capable of using the tools he produced through his research conferences and publications. He was the quintessential public intellectual. His life is a lesson in how to transcend the detachment most academics experience, or better said, perform, within a context of what our universities unfailingly promote as quote, community impact, but which in reality is, sadly, only a specter of what it should be. He would accept and even seek invitations to, to speak anywhere, in any community center, you saw it, club or any continent, even a 10 people gathering. It went obviously beyond anyone's desire to be heard and displayed an obsession to educate the public at large. A third very important observation that strikes me in his is his way of truly practicing the role of what we call an engaged intellectual. I see it as an understanding, as understanding Armenian studies not as a business, or a mere way of earning a living, or earning a name in the field, or building a career. It understands being an academic as being engaged with truth and justice, to be idealistic and to work toward those ideals without falling, of course, into a trap of serving ideologies and pushing ideologies. My next point is something I mentioned in my last intervention during Kovanisian's remembrance in February by our history department. Havanisian was, from the very beginning, careful to avoid researching and or pontificating about the history of a nation without learning their language or glossing over research in the primary and secondary sources in that language. I might say that he was one of the few in our field who strove to avoid Orientalism in this sense, almost four decades before even that term was coined, that is, teaching a people their history from an alien ivory tower without reading their sources in their own language. In addition, Havanisian was consistently concerned about the teaching of language and literature, which is my area. From his very first invitation to have a lunch after I started to teach at UCLA, to enduring interest in how my things were going, to the offering of many valuable advices on the politics and the economics of teaching, for instance. He would tell me, don't be too hard, too few students won't serve anyone. Find the balance between depth of teaching and open-mindedness and tolerance with students. I learned some. <laughs> to finish, I'll talk about UNESCO's 2010 categorization of Western Armenian as an endangered language. What does it have to do? That was based on the report that I had prepared. What has not been mentioned so far is that it was Professor Rovanissian who asked me to prepare that report two years earlier in 2008 and who introduced me to the contact from UNESCO who would process it. So Richard Rovanissian 
we all know, was a great, he is a great, and will continue being so and inspiring us all to follow on his steps. Thank you. Thank you, Hakob. Mark? Thank you, and uh, let me also thank the organizers and hosts of, of this wonderful event. Uh, this is this is hard for a number of, of reasons. Uh, to respond to this prompt is hard, uh, not least because Richard made lasting contributions to pretty much every Armenian studies organization or Armenian organization, period, uh, as well as many others that, that extend beyond uh, just just the Armenian or Armenian studies world. Um, speaking as a representative of an organization uh, of Nasser, he, he, his association spread over the course of 60 years. I can't sum that up. Um, so I kind of feel a little bit like you know uh, an electrician who's asked to describe Thomas Edison's impact on his field. Uh, you know, it's it's everywhere. So uh, let's let me take a different tack. Um, in 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 the copy I have at home of Richard's edited volume that nearly shares a name with today's symposium, that is looking backward, moving forward, confronting the Armenian genocide which has contributions from several of today's speakers. Richard signed on the title page with the tagline, which I assume he used often, and not just in this one copy. Let us move forward with strong and active commitment. And in Armenian, Harach. I feel like that is the example that he set for us, uh, or the demand that he made of us. And I mean us as individuals, uh, us as scholars, us as representatives of institutions, us as Armenians, us as human beings. I don't know how or when exactly he came up with that line, whether he pondered it deeply or if it just came into his head one day, but it sums up for me uh, about what he expected of himself and, and, and of others. The events of the past few years, and I mean, of course, the Artsakh War and its aftermath, culminating in the elimination of Armenians from Artsakh, have made clear to a lot of scholars what was already clear to Richard a long time ago, that while it's of course the duty of Armenian scholars and scholars of Armenian to do their work to the highest level of quality and accuracy humanly possible, there's also a categorical imperative to speak, write, and act when the facts of the Armenian genocide or about Armenian history or history of Artsakh or the, anything, uh, and not just the facts about them, but let's face it, the things themselves are in danger of erasure. There is an obligation to speak up and act. I've spoken to many scholars in recent years who felt the need to show their strong and active commitment in ways that previously they might have been reluctant to, or maybe even scoffed at, lest they be perceived as being partisan or ethnocentric or less than objective. When I think about Richard and his contributions and his impact in both his life and work, I think of his absolute integrity and his sense of ethics as a scholar. And part of that meant taking public stands that did leave him open to such accusations, unwarranted in my view, of lacking objectivity. I can't speak authoritatively about whether Richard always felt at ease in this role. Perhaps he would have liked to have been, quote unquote, just a scholar. But as he forcefully stated in 2006 at a Nasser uh, symposium, and I know Tanner was there, Christina was there on this panel as well, he said, quote, I must confess to having difficulty, apparently unlike those who call for pure scholarship, in separating sound scholarship from moral and ethical considerations and even from implicit advocacy. I believe that scholarship in and of itself is essential, but I also believe that try as one may, social science research cannot be entirely neutral. Historians take positions. Many US historians have, after all, taken a firm stand on slavery, on the treatment of Native Americans, and on a number of social issues. Why, therefore, should it be regarded as unprofessional to take moral or ethical stands when it comes to Armenian history?" Unquote. He was absolutely right, in my view. But there is an unspoken caveat that goes with this, though, which he made clear through the example of his own work, namely, righteous anger and moral indignation will only take you so far, and you'd better do your homework 
And you better have your own facts straight. And don't think that just because you have your facts straight that people are not going to try to discredit you to advance their agendas. We would all do well to emulate Richard's deep commitment to factual accuracy and to his fundamental and I think unshakable commitment to the idea of truth in history as a form of justice. Uh, but let me uh, end on a, on a personal note, and I don't want this to sound like a humble brag or something like that, but few things in my work in Armenian studies over the years have meant more to me than words that appeared at the end of one of Richard's articles titled Denial of the Armenian Genocide 100 Years Later, The New Practitioners and Their Trade. Quote, the author gratefully acknowledges the valuable assistance of Mark A. Mamagonian, Director of Academic Affairs of the National Association for Armenian Studies and Research in the preparation of this essay. Why exactly did this mean so much? Well, of course, it's always gratifying when anyone acknowledges your work, but Richard was not just anyone. And because anything I may have contributed on the, the topic of denial is a gloss on work Richard did starting more than 45 years ago, I felt a little bit like the guy putting in a light bulb getting a thank you note from Thomas Edison. So let us move forward with strong and active commitment. Arach. Thank you to our panelists. I think we can all take our seats as Anne takes the stage. Thank you so much for those wonderful comments to Peter um, and uh, and all of the rest of you. Thank you. So you can note in your program that it indicates there's a break, but in fact, we, that is, Hasmik and I, have made the executive decision that we will omit the break. You may use the restroom as you wish, and we will continue now with our program in the interest of time. Next, we are going to have a very short video that consists of some very short clips taken from a wonderful series of videos entitled Forever Our Professor that were collected and produced by Ara Sohomonian back in 2010 or so. And Ara is one of our panelists uh, later on. So thanks so much to Ani of Anisian um, for putting these together. And we can now... Uh, have the short videos projected, if you will. The awesome thing about Professor Horvath Nisha is that he's like a walking encyclopedia. I mean, you can give him a little snippet, a date, a location, it'll give you an entire chronology of every Armenian who's been there. How do you feel about Hovhannisian? I really like Hovhannisian. I love him. I got my first B plus ever in Professor Hovhannisian's class. A couple of months later, he saw me, pulled me aside, and said, were you disappointed with your grade? I said yes. He said, you didn't read the chapter on the diaspora, did you? And I hadn't read the chapter. At that moment, I made a promise to myself that I would take every class he ever offered and receive an A, not for my own personal satisfaction, but to earn his respect. The one thing that's great about Professor Vanissian is that even though he's a professor here at UCLA, he always travels the world for different conferences and he always starts off his emails saying greetings from Buenos Aires, greetings from Giligia. And he comes back telling and tells us stories about how great the steak was in Argentina or the food from wherever else he was in the world. After I presented my paper at one of his yearly conferences, I'll never forget at the banquet that night during his speech, he said how proud he was of me. And uh, in our field, that's like Mesrop Mashto, it's giving you a high five. Oh, I think the most impressive counter of him in the classroom is his sense of humor. After class, he and I were discussing personalized license plates. And I told him, well, Mr. Professor, since my family originates from the city of Vaughan, and I am high, how about I get high Vaughan? He just looked at me and said, yeah, you would say that. One of those people that talks a lot in class, I always have to put my two cents into everything. So one time, I, he, Dr. Hobanisian asked a question, and I raised my hand and responded. And I guess what I said didn't really make very much sense, because Dr. Hobanisian looks at me, and he looks at the class, and he says, you should all be more like Emily. She responds to questions whether she knows the answer or not. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Hovanisian has eyes at the back of his head. Actually, I think I had a dentist appointment that day. He knew exactly when I was gone. And 
it didn't just apply to me, it applied to any student that didn't show up. He knew, he knew where you were and he knew that you weren't there. One of the coolest things about Professor Hovhannisian is that um, he remembered me by name years after the, the, the year I took his class. Every time I saw him, whether it's uh, in an academic setting, in a social setting, or a community activity, or a community event, he would remember me. I'm sure just like he would remember many of his other students. For me, that represented a teacher who gave you a piece of himself, but also helped you find a piece of yourself within you, and that is forever. I remember looking through the course catalog at what classes to take, and I came across Armenian history, which caught me by surprise. And I showed it to my dad. I said, look, UCLA is teaching Armenian history. As soon as he saw the name Hovhannisian as in a, under the instructor, he said, you have to take this class. You have to study under this man. Um, he started Armenian history as a, as a field of study in the US. And he said, if you get anything less than an A, don't bother coming home, because this is probably the most important class you'll take. Well, the good news is he let me uh, come back home. Bad news is Hovhannisian gave me a B plus. Dr. Hovhannisian has always been a mentor, an advisor, and a backbone uh, to the Armenian American student community at UCLA. I remember when I was president back in 2005 of the organization and I would always seek Dr. Hovhannisian's help and advice to uh, guide me and, and the Armenian American student community uh, in the right direction to advance our issues and he was always there for us. Uh, he had an open door policy and uh, he was a voice for our board, he was a voice for our community and he was a voice uh, for the great uh, UCLA campus. So, I was working on the second chapter of my dissertation and after months of writing it, I sent it into Dr. Hovhannisian for him to take a look at it and I thought I was in the clear, I thought I was going to have a couple weeks to catch my breath. I was getting ready to go out and celebrate with friends when an hour after I sent it to him, I got a message right back from him saying, rewrite. It's not so long ago when I was 18 years old and I first went into Professor Hovhannisian's office. I don't know if he'll remember this, but um, we're raving about how much we like being in Armenia, working in Armenia, and here I am, 14, 15 years later, I'm still here, and a lot of that has to do with the influence Professor Hovhannisian has in my life. I've known Professor Hovhannisian since the mid-60s, when I was a new student on, on the UCLA campus, and I found Professor Hovhannisian's history uh, course, and I immediately ran for it. But it was pretty late in the uh, semester, so he warned me that it was going to be hard on me. So I didn't, I didn't worry about it. I said, I'm a hard worker, and uh, I insisted. So at some point, I had to take my written exam. He rewarded me with a C. <laughs> and that was so preposterous for me, the A student, you know. And I had to work very hard for the rest of the course and other courses from him that I took in the future. I want to thank you Professor Hovhannisian for teaching us so much about history, about our culture um, and just about how to be good scholars. Professor Hovhannisian and I started meeting every other month for lunch ever since I joined the faculty at the uh, UCLA School of Medicine in 04 and when it was his turn he'd take me to the faculty center and when it was my turn per his request unbeknownst to his family I'd take him to Panda Express down in Ackerman Union and there we'd enjoy a nice rich meal. But more seriously, that's where I discovered that he has babied through and, and really initiated the Armenian history movement. And now that it's in its adolescence, early uh, stages of fruition, his concern in his eyes is apparent. And this is where we're going to need the next generation of students, academicians, and so on to carry it forward so that we see his dreams completely realize themselves. As you see in your program, our next series is one that is more personal. We will be hearing from uh, individuals who were mentored by and or taught by Richard, and our sessions will be moderated by our own uh, Dr. Alina Dorian, who is Associate Dean for Public Health Practice, Associate Professor in the Community Health Sciences Department of the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health. So Alina, I'll call you to the podium. Thank you. I get the fun panel. Everybody who was here. All right. 
Thank you all again for being here so late. We're gonna move forward. That doesn't mean I'm rushing anybody in their remarks, but just sort of thinking about it. Following lunch, late in the day, I get two sessions back to back about how Dr. Hovhannisian has personally and professionally, as a teacher, a mentor, and overall community leader scholar, really impacted these individuals. So without further ado, let's begin with our first session. I'm excited to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Shushan Karapetyan, Director of the USC Institute of Armenian Studies. Shushan. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Anne, Hasmik, Nanoj, and the Promise Institute for organizing this beautiful event in honor of someone who in my life has not just been a formidable presence, but a transformative figure. As I tried to write these remarks, I was flooded with over two decades of memories. From my freshman year at UCLA in 2000, when I inquired about his class and was told explicitly not to take it because it would ruin my GPA, and it did, um, to November of 2021, when he graciously agreed to guest lecture for my USC Armenian Studies class, though his health was obviously suffering and we were still masked in the midst of the pandemic, to December of 2022, when Manuk and I conducted an oral history interview with him for our California History Through Armenian Experiences project, and we saw an entirely different side of him that will stay with us permanently. I want to start by reading a private letter I wrote to Professor Hovannisian in 2011 for this Forever My Professor uh, event that we organized with so many of my peers here. Um, we collected testimonials from his students across the decades. It was me who broke into his email system, by the way, with his permission and emailed so many of you who provided testimonials. And I want to read mine uh, with you now. This is from the voice of 29-year-old Shushan, who was a graduate student then. Dearest Professor Hovanisian, I have composed this letter in my mind numerous times in various shapes and forms at different times during the last nine years that I have had the fortune of being your student. Perhaps you are not aware of the profound impact you have had on my life. Perhaps even I don't grasp it in its full capacity. And I'm certain I will not be able to convey all that I feel or wish to express in this letter. How do you compress almost a decade of memories into a single letter? I cannot enumerate the times I have walked out of your office and had an intensely strong urge to turn around, embrace you, and tell you how that certain meeting has changed my life. Yet I have been too embarrassed, too reserved, and too timid. I will not miss my opportunity this time, however inadequate this may be. I walked into your modern Armenian history course as a young, impressionable sophomore over nine years ago, unsure about what to expect from this very famous and difficult professor. You walked in with your map in your hand and your smile on your face, and before you finished the introduction to the course, you had already won me over. From that moment on, your presence in my life in all its features has been constant. The lessons I have learned about Armenian history are only the surface of all that I have gained from you, Professor. More importantly, you have shaped my ideas and outlook on what it, what it means to be Armenian. I, along with many of my peers, have faced that crisis in identity as a result of being an immigrant child to this country. When I entered your class for the first time, I wasn't quite certain of who I was and more significantly who I wanted to be. Although sometimes I have been overwhelmed by the catastrophic twists of fate that our people have faced, your lectures on Armenian history and the example of your own personal history have instilled an unwavering sense of pride in being Armenian. Your passion about Armenian history and your expertise in passing on that knowledge are simply contagious. It is no surprise that I have chosen a career in Armenian studies myself. I only hope that I will be able to navigate in this difficult field with some of the dignity, high standards, inexhaustible energy, devotion, and class that you have demonstrated. Inside or outside of the classroom, I have been most affected by your sheer humanism and kindness. You have always treated me with such respect and greatness that I have often been overwhelmed with gratitude. 
I am lost in the ways to describe the many memories that come to mind. What stands out the most are the little gestures of affection and care, offering me sweets every time I visited you, especially when I was pregnant with my first daughter, calling my husband Anushik Tara when you met him, which was decisive in my choice of him, um, quickly responding to my email announcing the birth of my daughter with hearty congratulations, never failing to inquire about the well-being of my husband and daughter, responding to all my emails within hours, writing letters of recommendation even when I asked you one day before, agreeing to meet with me, although I knew you had a million other things to do, trusting me to take over the oral history course when you were out of town, though he did email to check, always encouraging me in pushing forward with exams, simply smiling and recognizing my presence every time you saw me. I'm reading over this letter and it does not come close to what I want to convey, but I guess I want to say thank you. Thank you for being a role model, not only as a professor, but as a scholar, as an Armenian, and as a person. Whenever my husband and I discuss our worries about the possibility of raising an Armenian family in the diaspora and being someone of value to our community, I conquer those fears by bringing up your example. You fill me with so much hope and pride. If nothing else, for that I'm grateful. Shushanik, the only person in, in the world who calls me Shushanik. So my 29-year-old version was indeed correct in realizing that I didn't then fully grasp his impact on my life. I didn't know yet that in my various professional and personal capacities, as a leader of an Armenian Studies Institute at USC, and he was hesitant about that, um, as a teacher and mentor to young students, as a member of my various communities, and as Professor Hovanisian would say, most importantly, a mother to my children, I often pause in my difficult decisions and say to myself, how would Professor Hovanisian handle this situation? With what gait would we wa walk into a room and own it? How would he pronounce certain syllables with particular pregnant pauses, like he would say Armenian communities with the T highlighted, so you knew this was something important. With what strictness would he convey his demands to his students, adequate but not inspiring, while also transmitting that this was for their benefit? With what in integrity would he work on his scholarship? With what professionalism would he navigate the difficult relationships in the university and more? He taught me, not just through his words, but through his work and his actions, to acknowledge Armenian studies and academia as a serious, professional, rigorous field that shapes both individual lives and collective narratives. He taught me that our roles as scholars go beyond the scholarship we produce in texts. They have the potential to touch and shape countless lives. He taught me the value of one's words, not just in text, but in action because he never missed a single meeting or a single deadline. He never left an email unanswered. He taught me that a formidable persona and a generous spirit are not mutually exclusive. He taught me that when the world collapses around you, when the world order no longer makes sense, when your body and your health give up on you, it is your priorities and principles that keep you together. During my last visit with Manuk, he made sure to articulate for posterity that no one exists in a vacuum. We are all dependent on and reflections of those closest to us. He made sure we knew it was Vatiter who was his true muse, his drive, his true partner, his meaning in this world. And he made sure to tell me in a private setting to focus on my family, my children, to show him pictures of now my three children, and responded with, as Vartiter would say, Hian Alien. I want to end on a personal anecdote. When he guest lectured for my class two years ago, I kept citing things he had said 20 years ago that I had uh, remembered and followed, and he was quite embarrassed that I cited him so frequently <laughs> and so accurately. Um, and I made sure he knew that the most important thing I carry with me from all of the years and all of the important things he shared was something he said, I think this must have been 2002, 2003, I was taking the modern Armenian history class. We had just finished the unit on the Armenian genocide. 
And he stood in front of us, uh, probably 40 of us in the middle of the classroom. And he said, never be a victim, either in your personal life or as a larger group. No one likes victims. At first they pity you and then they class you lower than them. This has been seared in my mind and in my mission for 20 plus years. And I just want to say, Professor Hovani San, you didn't train and mentor victims. You inspired generations of agents who are in this room and beyond. Hajoch. Thank you so much, Shushan Jan. I would now like to invite to the podium Dr. David Myers, Distinguished Professor and Sadie and Ludwig Kahn Chair in Jewish History at UCLA. Dr. Myers. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to begin with a disclaimer, um, which is uh, that it is not my custom to engage in professional activities on the Jewish Sabbath um, when one abstains from work and driving in cars and using electronic devices. Um, but I am really just thrilled, delighted, um, and, and, um, and privileged to be here with you today. Um, I suspect I'm the only scholar of Jewish studies in the room, um, perhaps the only Jew in the room, um, and yet I feel very much at home, not least because the conference is running an hour late, which seems very familiar to me um, and suggests another affinity between Jews and Armenians. But I'm here in the first instance because this conference is devoted to the memory of Richard Hovhannisian, and that is not an occasion that I would miss. I'm also here because this is not really labor. This is really a labor of love. And as I was thinking, and Ani, I, I don't know why you do this to me again and again. I was, I've been teary since watching the video. Um, it really made clear how much I admired and respected, but also loved Richard. As a colleague, as a mentor, as a friend. Richard had many distinctive qualities which have been spoken about and which we'll hear more about uh, in, the, in the remaining hours of the conference. But I'd like to call attention to one quality which perhaps hasn't been mentioned, and that is Richard's sternness. I came to be aware of this over the course of our time together, but especially when I was chair of the history department at UCLA. We had a rule at UCLA that retired faculty could stay in their offices for three years, after which they were required to move into a shared office space. Richard had been retired for, well, at least a decade. And you know that office, we saw a picture of it, overstuffed with papers and documents, books, cassette tapes. And the task fell upon me to inform Richard that he had to move to a smaller office. It didn't go well. And frankly, I regret it to this day. But what it bespoke was his remarkable discipline, his passion, and his sense of purpose. What was crammed into that office was a lifetime of historical research that Richard believed made a difference. Because Richard believed that it was, an, it was actually a moral imperative to engage in historical research in order to arrive at the truth. He understood that the stakes of history were very high. And so he had that sense of purpose to complete the mission as much as was humanly possible by one person. I once wrote a book called The Stakes of History, and this was just yet another way in which I so appreciated Richard's own professional and personal being. But if it were just his sternness alone, we wouldn't be here. It was also the qualities that I saw in his interaction with his students, quite different. And we've heard about it just in the last few minutes. 
his compassion, his kindness, and his patience. His belief that every student could be, must be, the torchbearer of truth to continue that mission along the path that he walked on. The task he understood was too great for one person, but he understood his students as fellow travelers in seeking to illuminate the world that was so often shrouded in darkness. I learned that from Richard. Each student bears within them the capacity to be a torchbearer of light and justice in the world. When I think of Richard, I think of the person who is probably the greatest Jewish historian of the 20th century. His name was Salo Wittmeyer Baron. He was the teacher of my teacher, Professor Yosef Yerushalmi. And I, on other occasions, have compared Richard to Mozart's Chorum Nazi or to another Jewish historian, Shimon Dubnov, but I'd like to focus in my remaining minutes on the links between Richard and Salah Baron in several regards. First, Baron was an institution builder. He was appointed to the first position in Jewish history in the United States at Columbia University when he was designated the Nathan Miller Chair in Jewish history in 1930. Baron had three doctorates in philosophy, political science, and law from the University of Vienna. Note, he did not have a doctorate in history. Why? Because there was no Jewish history taught in a European, or for that matter, American university. So he was an autodidact. Richard had no teacher in Armenian history. Richard, amongst the many extraordinary colleagues in the UCLA History Department, was the only one who, for all intents and purposes, invented a field. In that regard, his significance is Baronian, if you will. He really gave rise to an academic discipline in its own right here at UCLA. Baron was a foundational historian. He was the author of the 18-volume Social and Religious History of the Jews. The earliest iteration of that was a three-volume series of that title in 1937. And then he wrote another three-volume series on the Jewish community in 1941 before he began to write uh, the volumes that belong to the larger Social and Religious History series. Richard was a foundational historian in the same mold. His four volumes on the First Armenian Republic really set a new standard for historical research into modern Armenian history. We're marked by absolutely extraordinary archival research and masterful literary presentation. His volumes on Armenian cities and regions really transform the historical imagination of a larger audience in ways quite akin to Baron's impact uh, on the wider scholarly and public world. Baron was also a chronicler of the genocide that befell his people. Most famously, he was the historical witness called to testify at the trial of one Adolf Eichmann, the SS officer for Jewish affairs, at the trial held in Jerusalem in 1961, where he recited the entire history of the Jews in flawless Hebrew without a note. Hebrew was his fifth language. Richard, too, was the chronicler of the genocide that befell his people. This is a task he took with enormous seriousness, as we all know so well. Interestingly, for Baron, the rich legacy of Jewish history was not reducible to what he called 
the lachrymose, the tearful or the mournful. And so too for Richard. The rich legacy of Armenian history was not reducible to the genocide. The genocide was essential to understanding the Armenian experience, but the vitality of the Armenian people, the resilience of the Armenian people, was in a certain sense the sufficient condition for the completion of the historian's task. Balancing tragedy and vitality, that's the mission shared, I would say, by the Armenian and Jewish historian. Something that Richard was able to navigate with extraordinary skill. There are many things that I learned from Richard. I learned, as the ethnographers, ethnographers would say, to be a participant observer in the history that I study. I learned from Richard to be, or I should say, it was okay to be a lover of one's people and a critic of one's people. I learned from Richard, we all did, how to reach that perfect aquapoise. Mark alluded to that in his very wise remarks. Between critical distance and getting it right historically, very careful archival research, and manis manifesting all the powers of empathy to understand one's historical subjects. That ability of Richard's, perhaps for me, is the greatest le legacy and lesson. And it's one of the things that makes him not only such a significant figure to all of us, but the most important Armenian historian of the last century. As we say in my tradition, may Richard's memory always be a blessing to all of us who have benefited so much and to future generations who will continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Dr. Myers, for being here today. Next, we have a panel of esteemed individuals whose personal and professional lives have been incredibly impacted by Dr. Hovhannisyan. I'm delighted to welcome to the stage Dr. Rafi Tashjan, Associate Clinical Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics in the Division of Allergy and Clinical Immunology at UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine, Razmik Sarkisyan, Attorney, Law Clerk at Los Angeles Superior Court, and Doris Melkonian, graduate student at Fuller Theological Seminary. At the end of the panel discussion also, we will have a video message from Dr. Shant Shekhardamian, Associate Professor of Pediatric Surgery at UCLA Department of Surgery. May you all join me up here. Thank you so much for being here, panelists. So we just heard incredible words from Dr. Karapetian and Dr. Myers about Professor Hovhannisyan's, if you will, thumbprint in some way on their lives and their both professionally and personally. And I'd love to go around and have each of you offer your own personal story about his lasting impact on your professional and or personal lives. Okay, John. My story at UCLA starts when I was 18 and I'm in the Ackerman Center walking by the arcade and having not grown out, grown up with too many Armenians, having always gone to a Odar schools, I hear a couple of Turkish and Armenian expletives and I'm thinking I found home. And it was Garo Hovhannisyan, <laughs> along with his friends Misag, Huygens, and... Uh, and I believe Arden Pataputian was in that mix too, who won the uh, Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. And I did not have the chance to have a class with Dr. Hovhannisyan, but I'd heard, you know, this is a legendary family with a with a really powerful father. Um, 
12 years later, I come back for a fellowship at the School of Medicine. And serendipitously, I, I'm crossing Kinsey Hall. And we make eye contact, the professor and myself. And he looked at me as if he'd known me. And, and I'm thinking I should introduce myself. And he says, inch basis, with his voice. Uh, empathy, form of admiration here. And I said, love, took inch basic. And uh, he says, what are you doing here? I said, fellowship. But I've, what, we've never met. And he says, that's OK. And he's like, uh, what are you doing Thursday for lunch? I said, I can make myself available. He says, faculty club. So we went there. He treated me to lunch. And I said, but the next time is me. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm offering the next one. He says, we can go to Panda Express. I said, I'm OK walking elsewhere. He said, that's OK, Panda. I said, you know, I can afford something nicer for you. He goes, just don't tell Vartita, my wife. Panda, it will be. So we continue to have... I'd say monthly lunch dates or bromance, as some of you might call it. Uh, and that's when I, and the title of this section is mentorship. That's when I discovered one of my mentors, a non-medical mentor, mind you, who taught me about a lot of life. And some of the first questions would be, as I'm sure you know, where does your family come from? And to me, that's the first source of judgment in the Armenian community, right? That's the caste system. Oh, boy. I said, funny enough, all four sides come from Kai City or Caesarea. He says, I know, I know. And I said, you're probably going to think, you know, we're the cheapskates and, you know, we were frugal. He says, no, that's not why I'm asking. And that was my first hint of this man is not judgmental. He's actually reflecting. And he said, you know, the, some of the greatest philanthropists come from there, Gulbenkian, the uh, uh, Melkonian brothers, and the list goes on. And it was more about genocide recognition and really self-recognition. And I said, why does it matter to you that I'm from Gesaria? And he says, well, when the genocide gets recognized, because remember, this was before uh, a few years back, you should be able to hold up a big billboard and say, I am from Kai City, right? Kind of like what? all the revered speakers here mentioned, we're all from that land. You know, we're all from this planet. So it's not a matter of just coexistence or tolerance. It's actually a matter of celebration. If you make a one-word pivot, it changes the paradigm. And along those lunch dates, he taught me to try to stay in academics because that's how you're going to be able to teach the next generation. And you look at the list back here of all the little logos and how far we've come. Um, charity, not just philanthropy, because philanthropy gets you a name on the wall. Charity is a little more in the shadows, all right, and subservient. Mentorship, which I've taken that flag and his uh, uh, message and created an Armenian Medical Society mentorship program. That, by the way, includes non-Armenians as well, because that's the only way we're going to develop. And unity. Unity across humanity. And so these are little lessons that, you know, taught me a lot. But in the end, we always think, what is being Armenian? And I don't have an answer to that to this day. Is it the food? Eh, we share it with other people. Is it our music? Actually, many of the instruments come from the further Orient. Uh, is it a sense of home? But I can guarantee you, every people who identify, who create their own boundaries, can identify a, this is home, and that doesn't feel so much like home. Um, but I'm going to shift here. Instead of dwell, because this could take weeks to figure out what is being Armenian, I'm going to actually challenge you with, what is it being Richard? I've always called him professor to his face, but I'm doing this as a familial kind of to your heart. What is being Richard? And the best example there I could say is drawing from music where I've learned to not play a note unless I mean it. Or from the professor not to write something down unless you meant it or you intend it or take an action unless there's repercussions you're going to put up with. And being comfortable with being uncomfortable, 
because if I put myself in his shoes, boy, it must have been uncomfortable for 30 some years, but you had to be comfortable with carving out your path. And the best example I can come up with what is being Richard is, has anyone been to Boston's Copley Square? I know, Christine, you live right around there. Boston's Copley Square has seven buildings, some beautiful churches, the Boston Public Library. You guys get the picture. And then they wanted to put a high rise in the middle of it. And they hired I.M. Pei, who designed the Louvre, among other things. And he came up with a slice of a building that looks like a mirror at 90 degrees. Okay? And they said, what was the purpose of this design? And he said, this building, the, the set of buildings is so beautiful, I couldn't take anything away from them, but rather to have them reflect. To me, that's what Richard did. He helped you reflect. He might have not said much, but he made you reflect. And so when we talk about victimization, when we talk about conqueror, non-conqueror, denial, the denialist or genocide victim, all he could do is reflect. And in the end, the truth comes out. Because wh whichever side you're on, or even if you're, you're a moderate, you're going to reflect, you're going to get a better image, and the truth will come out. And that's the mirror that's echoing and, uh, and, and really celebrating the voice of the unheard. And to me, that's how his oral history program came about and his current history. Because here we're seeing today the propagation of all his work. And I saw it last night in the, some of the people that I met. And I'm actually sitting next to one of my mentors. We used to sit at bomb shelter and you take off time to, to help me figure out what path I need to carve out. Another one is Dr. Pirumian, who, funny enough, I didn't take the professor's class, but he made it happen for her where she taught me Armenian. I didn't know how to write or read it. And even though Professor Hovanesian recorded history, he contributed more to personal development of individuals and that's how he continues and will continue to write history. And that's spanning different walks of lives because I have nothing to do with history. But yet here I am really thinking about it and hopefully adding a little dimension. And as I wrap this up, in the last conversation that I had with him over the phone, I said, Panda? And he said, I'm in no shape to, to go outside these days. And uh, my dad, who had delivered me his book, looking backward, moving forward, that I had read before meeting the professor, finished a book called Return to Homelessness. And I said, do you mind reading the copy before we send it to the editor? He says, my eyes don't even work anymore. But you know what? Send it and I'll have Ani read it to me. I'm like, how tireless is this person? And in essence, to respect his dream and life's work, we need to continue this. It doesn't stop here. Unity cannot stop here. You cannot stop playing your notes. You cannot stop writing your words. Uh, that'll connect and make sentences and chapters. He was a huge chapter. And guess what? I know he wanted the next you, the Richards in here, to be the next chapters of, of life. And take a moment to reflect. Now go spread some Richards out there. Russell John, thank you so much. That was beautiful. Doris, we'll turn to you. Um, I want to share a glimpse of the man I knew, the professor and the mentor who influenced me both professionally, my academic career, and personally. So the piece that I wrote is adapted from an article I submitted to our denominational news magazine, The Forum. It's the Armenian Evangelical Union of North America, The Forum. And from there, um, I adapted it for today's conference. The cramp office on the sixth floor of Bunch Hall in UCLA was home to Professor Hovanesian for several decades. I would find him there within these walls, engrossed in the solitary work of a scholar. Sitting behind his desk in his gray sweater, Professor Hovanistan hovered over a mountain of books, copiously working on one 
of many things, a conference address, a public lecture, a class lecture, or a submitted manuscript. A draft would lie on his desk with his editing marks and scribbled notes, legible, legible only to him. He worked tirelessly, fact-checking each statement, each footnote, each bibliographic entry, and improving the draft with his poetic and succinct style of writing. It was a laborious task, a solitary one, but one he carried out relentlessly, taking short breaks by walking the halls of Bunch Hall's sixth floor. Professor Hovanyasyan spent many hours in that small office surrounded with his books and the towering filing cabinets of Armenian genocide survivor testimonies. This office was the nucleus of his scholarly output. As an undergraduate student of his, taking his Armenian, oral, uh, Armenian history class, I was extremely intimidated by this towering figure of encyclopedic knowledge who dominated the room when he walked in. Many of us students would um, look elsewhere during question and answer period, hoping to evade his eyes, but there was no chance of that. He called on us regardless, putting us on the spot and asking, Doris, what do you think about this situation? And then as his former graduate students and later his teaching and research assistants for the Armenian Genocide Survivor Oral History class, my sister Arda and I became closely acquainted with this man who initially appeared to have an intimidating presence for us. Our preliminary impressions of Professor Hovanesen, the intimidating professor, was dismantled as we discovered a caring and very thoughtful man. Working in his office on the survivor testimony transcripts, we developed a keen understanding and a close relationship through many conversations, both academic and personal. He became more than a professor for us. He became our member, a mentor, and a family member. His cramp office in Bunch Hall became home for us for several years as we spent many hours working with and getting to know Professor Hovanyasen on a deeper level. In one corner of the office, Professor would work tirelessly on his projects while Arda and I worked a few feet away on the Armenian genocide survivor testimonies. The unique opportunity of working intimately with the survivor testimonies and discussing their contents with Professor Hovanesen was priceless. He would use every opportunity to share with us his vast knowledge about events, about geography, about customs, linguistic nuances, and then we would discuss the survivor transcripts themselves. We were being trained in Armenian studies and Armenian genocide studies by one of the foremost scholars in the field. So the cramp office was quite tight and we tried working around his schedule, often staying late in the evenings. And then once he gave us the key to the office, we would come on the weekends on Saturdays and work um, uninterrupted. The work on the survivor testimonies was laborious and emotionally ch challenging. Many times, Arda and I would weep as we worked on the translations, the voices of the survivors coming alive through those tattered pages. We valued this collection and appreciated the sacrifices Professor Hovanesen had made to secure these testimonies. When there was no funding for us as his research assistants, we still continued to come to the office and work on the survivor testimonies because this was no longer a job for us. It was a labor of love. Over the years, my sister and I corrected and edited more than half of the thousand testimonies in the collection. We appreciated Hovanesen's work and valued his contribution to the field of oral history. Professor Hovanyasen encouraged and supported us as we use these testimonies in our research. 
Arda and I have used these testimonies in conference presentations, speaking about the Armenian genocide, bringing awareness to this traumatic period in our history in conferences spanning five continents. The passion with which Ho Professor Hovhannistan approached this Armenian genocide oral history project somewhat, somehow was transmitted to us as we work with these testimonies. I will forever be grateful to him for encouraging me to pursue a research career in Armenian genocide studies. As I reflect on my personal relationship with Professor Hovhannisyan, first as an esteemed professor and later my mentor, I am reminded of the man who impacted my life and changed the tra trajectory of my academic career. In closing, when I think about Professor Hovhannisyan, I am reminded of his dedication to educate his students and the public about Armenian history and the Armenian genocide. Even when his health was failing, Professor Hovhannisyan continued to fly across continents and speak at conferences. One of my last memories of Professor Hovhannisyan was when we participated at a conference on the genocide of the Christian minorities, the Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks in Thessaloniki, Greece in 2019. This was the last time that Professor Hovhannisyan, Arda, Professor Tanit Akjam, and I presented on the same um, conference. I'm repeating what has already been said, but I wanna emphasize this. Professor Hovhannisyan was a remarkable man. He touched many lives. He was an exceptional scholar, a kind and caring individual. He was very special to me in his loving way. And I will greatly miss him and hope to continue his legacy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doris. Ross McJohn. Uh, first, thank you very much uh, for organizing this uh, and for having me. It's a, an honor to be with much more esteemed uh, individuals on this panel, uh, but I'm excited to share my uh, anecdotal experiences with Professor Hovhannisyan and his uh, impact. Uh, so I went to uh, uh, Armenian Mesroban school my whole life. I grew up in the tight-knit community of Montebello. And uh, when I got accepted to UCLA after graduating Mesrobyan, I was really excited to be uh, a student here and especially take part in all of the Armenian studies classes that I knew were offered. And I immediately committed to uh, uh, declaring for the minor. I remember going to my first ASA meeting uh, back in fall of 2009, very long time ago now. And uh, it was at that meeting that they announced that Professor Hovhannisyan was retiring. And I felt this uh, sense of urgency to take his classes uh, as soon as I could. Uh, fortunately, uh, he didn't immediately retire. It took him a lot longer uh, to leave, thankfully. Uh, and that following quarter, even though I already had three classes, I decided to make life a little difficult and took a fourth class, uh, which was his uh, modern Armenian uh, studies class. Uh, and uh, that's when I got uh, inundated with the magic that was Professor Hovhannisyan. Uh, he really brought uh, Armenian history to life. Uh, he, he would walk into class, and I, like I said, uh, a much younger version of myself, he had this encyclopedic knowledge. He didn't need uh, presentation slides or notes or anything. He would walk into class, lean up against the, the table, sometimes cross his arms, and then just in a quiet but commanding voice, pick up right where he left off last time. And uh, I learned so much more than just history in his classes and through my experiences with him. Uh, he, he had a, a magic for making history uh, cinematic in the way that he told it. Even though you weren't watching it, in your mind you could just play it all happening. And uh, he brought it to life in the sense that he taught me that history 
especially Armenian history, wasn't this static, uh, determined uh, entity. Uh, there were so many pivotal little moments in history that changed uh, the way that the future unfolded. Uh, and that really stood out to me because it, it taught us the impact that each of us have as individuals on the course of the future, the present, etc. Uh, little things like uh, that you take for granted just because the paradigm has shifted. Um, you know, you always think May 28 is Armenian Independence Day because that was just a good date and that's why they chose it. And then I learned in that class, it was, it was kind of out of necessity because uh, our other two neighbors had declared independence at the same time, claiming all the lands that we were trying to claim. Uh, and, and it brought out, it took away the mythology of these moments, but it, it grounded it in something more real and memorable and uh, interesting, genuinely. Uh, even uh, you think, oh, Yerevan is Armenia's capital. It used to be thousands of years ago, and it is now just because. But it was a conscious choice by these uh, Armenian intellectuals in Tiflis who had to choose uh, what uh, uh, Professor Hovainisan described as like it was just a village. It was dirt. And they had to turn it into a capital of a republic. Uh, and th those lessons stuck with me. Um, beyond just the, the historical aspect, though, uh, Professor Hovanisan's example uh, as a, an academic who, who wasn't locked away in an ivory tower. Uh, he was actively going to communities uh, and organizing conferences. And I, I loved that side of him, the organizer side. Uh, and and how he uh, grounded himself in community. No event was was beneath him. Uh, he could have easily rested on his laurels and only gone to the most prestigious events. But any random Aglump Armenian center that would invite him, uh, a Hamas guy in across the world, it was an opportunity for him, and he took it. And that was something that was was also meaningful to me. Um, I also took uh, oral history and translation the following quarter. And Doris and Arda were my TAs, and I'll uh, publicly apologize for all of my procrastination, uh, but I eventually did get all of my work turned in. Um, and that was a very unique experience because we were in the phase of that class that was translating these testimonies from Armenian to English. And you felt like you were this small part of something so much bigger than yourself uh, because generations before had gone out with and i remember uh mr dermagadichan mentioning this and i had heard it from others you know we used to have to physically like look at a map to find where we were going to interview these people and now here i was with this class uh translating these interviews and it wasn't just another class it wasn't like a grade that you were trying to get you felt like you were a part of uh documenting this you were a steward for this survivor and you didn't want anything to get lost in translation. And it uh, it made us feel uh, important and value our roles as students. Um, and uh, the third class that I took with him was his uh, postmodern Armenian studies class. It was a seminar. And it was the first time that I had offered it. And I was extremely excited to take it, especially because we were going to be learning a bit of contemporary Armenian history. Um, I remember uh, Rafi visited that class and spoke about his time in the foreign ministry. Uh, and uh, just his work in political organizing in present-day Armenia. And it it really made me feel like being around Professor Hovanisian was like being at the nexus of Armenian history and present and future. And I remember, I don't remember which class it was for, but we were assigned to read Godin's Family of Shadows. And uh, through that brilliantly narrated book, it really uh, solidified to me who Professor Hovanisian was and what his life represented. Um, for him to go from not knowing Armenian or fluent Armenian growing up to seeking out these struggles of going to Jemaran, learning Armenian, the fact that he knew Simon Vratsian, someone that I've just heard about in stories and songs that he literally was mentored by him, that blew my mind and in a way that made a lot of these abstract historical things feel so tangible and real and like we were empowered to be able to do that going forward. Um, so briefly, uh, after I graduated, I was working uh, in video production here at UCLA and my former principal from Estrobian called me, uh, inviting me to work on PR at the school. And 
in our first meeting together in his office, uh, Mr. David mentioned, just uh, as an aside, oh, you, you minored in Armenian studies, right? And I said, yes. And he said, well, we've been trying to find a way to make Haitad, which was an Armenian history class for the high school called Armenian Cause, uh, more appealing to the high schoolers. And we're thinking of maybe teaching it in English. Would you want to do it? And I, I'm here thinking I'm just interviewing to be like a PR person for the school. And I'm being uh, flung into a teaching position. Uh, and I said, yes, I felt like this, this would be a great opportunity. Uh, Professor Hovanisen had taught me well. Um, I can confidently say I imparted maybe a half fraction of a percent of what he had taught me to these students. But it was a full circle moment because I got to teach it in English and I insisted on assigning my 11th and 12th graders Professor Hovani Sound's book. Uh, and I assigned them all uh, volume two of his uh, uh, History of the Armenian People. And I didn't think that they were going to fully grasp it all. I mean, I barely did when I was in college. They were high schoolers. But I wanted them to have that feeling that that we had as his students that Armenian history is not this closed little insular bubble it's this vast world that um I wanted them to feel tiny in front of it the way that we felt listening to Professor Hovanisian's lectures uh and for a few years I did that and um his involvement in the community just inspired me to stay grounded in my community uh I taught there for a few years I would teach Armenian history lessons through Badanegan to my AYF juniors um and the, the example of his activism, I don't know if you would describe it as activism, but his um, his struggles uh, in academia, not just as an academic, really inspired us too. The stories of uh, the, the endowed chair of Turkish history that almost was established at UCLA with a one and a half million dollar endowment, um, the way that uh, his uh, involvement in that vote uh, helped swing it by one vote, 18 to 17, it prevented a history of uh, an endowed chair of potential denialism uh, from being established. And that taught me that just like in his history lessons, there are these pivotal moments in history and individuals cause that pivot. They are able to change the tide of history. Uh, and I think that's the biggest lesson that he, he taught me, that uh, history is not determined. It's not deterministic. Neither is the future. And it's influenced by us. So uh, just, just to wrap as quickly as I can, it's easy today uh, to be extremely hopeless. Um, you know, we in the last few years, we've seen another genocide of our people. We've seen the ethnic cleansing of Artsakh. Uh, we have uh, a genocidal dictator to the east and to the west, and uh, uh, a, a hapless, at best, treacherous, at worst regime in Yerevan, eager to foreclose our legitimate grievances under international law uh, with these neighbors uh, for the ephemeral promise of peace. And uh, to that, I would just say as hopeless as our present day reality seems, the memory and the example and legacy of people like Professor Hovanisian should inspire us. He started his scholarship when Armenia was in the depths of the Soviet Union behind the Iron Curtain. After a century, he saw the Republic the first republic's flag rising again at the united nations not all uh, and not only that but raised by his own son uh it was e it could have been easy for him to have just not wanted to rock the boat when shaw came around and said you know what i have this endowed chair uh let me not risk anything let me just be quiet but he didn't he spoke those uncomfortable truths he struggled and he challenged others um, and uh, for that, uh, he still is a light uh, in the darkness for all of us. So thank you. Thank you so much, Rosnick John. Um, we have the video from Shant, if we can play that, his message. Hi, everyone, and greetings from Yerevan. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to share some of our uh, thoughts uh, and memories of Professor Hovannesian. We thought it would be ideal for us to walk over and record ourselves in front of Aram Manukyan's uh, statue, uh, a representative of the First Republic of Armenia that Professor Hovannesian taught us about and loved so much. I happened to bump into a good friend of mine uh, from UCLA this morning, Madlen, who uh, was also taking classes with Professor Hovannesian when I was 
an undergrad and we thought we would share a couple of memories together. Well then, John. Uh, hi everyone. Um, it's very special to, to share um, Professor uh, Havani Sen's impact uh, on me here um, in Yerevan because he has a large part of, of my story in being here. Growing up, I always knew that I should be proud to be Armenian. Um, Professor Hovani Siant shared with us why. Why should we be proud to be Armenian? Um, by stressing the significance of history, by telling us um, about our story of survival, um, our sharing with us our rich cultural heritage, he answered that question why. Why should I be proud to be Armenian? And it's that the answer to that question that he helped me find that brought me here um, 23 years ago uh, when I moved. And um, a part of him is this Armenia story of mine, and not only um, for thousands and thousands of, of, of students, he, he placed a little puzzle piece called the power beauty of the Armenian nation into into the overall tapestry of so many hearts. And for me, uh, he was the inspiration and the person who taught me that that love for Armenia can also be perfectly blended into having a successful career in whatever it is that we choose to do. And uh, it was so inspiring to see someone that was able to uh, blend that passion and love for Armenia and to teach us history the way that he did um, that led me down the career path that I have taken and the ability that I've had to blend my love and interest for healthcare and medicine with having an impact and being present in Armenia where we are today. We're actually also standing right in front of the Ministry of Health behind us where I've had the chance to uh, be a part of over the past couple of years and uh, not a week goes by where I remember the few people who have taught me uh, and who have led by example and shown that it is possible to be a good professional in whatever career that we choose and to be a good Armenian and to give back to our country and our people. So for that, I am forever indebted to Pro Professor Hovannesian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much to our presenters, Shushan, Dr. Myers, for everything. Um, we're going to, I think, move right into the next <laughs> presentation. Thank you so much. All right. So we're going to move to the last, second panel that I have. Again, I'm sure very touching stories coming around the professional and personal lives about Dr. Hovannisian and how this incredible scholar and impactful community member impacted each and every one of them. But before I invite up everyone, I would just like to reflect for one moment and just really think about and feel what is happening right now today. I believe a great strength or another aspect of Dr. Hovannisian's strength and legacy is what we all see today from a macro view. It's the strength of a man who just through his being brought us all together, all of us together, knowing that the strength of his work and eventually all of our work lies in this, the collective. As you look around the room, it's not just about the strengths of each and every incredibly accomplished individual that's here today, but it's so much more. It's the power of this. And his legacy reminds us that we are so much more than just the sum of our parts. So let's move on to some more incredible parts. It's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Mary Papazian, Executive Vice President at Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges and former president of San Jose State University and Southern Connecticut State University. Dr. Papazian. You've all stuck with us. Thank you. And that's the power, of course, of Richard. But I want to dedicate my comments as well to four people who shared 
Richard with all the rest of us. And that's Rafi, Armen, Ani, and Gatto. Your whole lives you shared your father and your mother with so many, and that wasn't always easy. And Ani, you brought all of that back. I too have still have tears, so I might do this every now and then. So I'm honored to offer some reflections on Professor Richard Hovhannessian's extraordinary career and impact, including his not 50, but 60 years affiliated with this great university, my alma mater, and his dedicated service to Armenian scholarship and to the Armenian people and truly to humanity at large. Must much already has been shared by Professor Hovhannissian's many colleagues and students about his impact as a scholar, a teacher, a mentor, a colleague, and friend, as well as his fight against denialism and his contributions to Armenian genocide scholarship through the Oral History Project and his conferences on historic Armenian cities and provinces. Now, as many of you know, I myself am not a scholar of Armenian studies, so my remarks will take a more personal tone. But simply, my life would not be so engaged in the Armenian community, nor my career have unfolded in the way that it did without Professor Hovhannissian. I've known Professor Hovhannissian, and now I'm going to turn to calling him what I always called him. That sounded really formal. I had to get that out, Professor Hovhannissian. I never called him that. He was always Uncle Richard to me to my brothers for as long as I can remember. When he came to UCLA in the early 1960s, he had been teaching at Mount St. Mary's College in nearby Brentwood and was working on his dissertation, what would become his first book, Armenia on the Road to Independence. Now it was during these early years that he first came to know my parents, Agop and Marilyn Arshaguni, and some of you know them who had met at UCLA a few years earlier, married, and were now the parents of four very young children. We had moved by then from Santa Monica to Sherman Oaks, but my mom was driving the old Sepulveda Boulevard, 405 hadn't yet been built, to pursue her master's degree at UCLA. And at this time, she decided to take a class in Armenian history from a newly arrived graduate student Richard Hovhannessian. Now, I attended my first class with Uncle Richard during this period, as my kindergarten schedule was mixed up for about a week, and my mom had to take me with her. I still remember buying a coloring book and new crayons, and for about a week, sitting quietly in the back of Uncle Richard's course. Mom finally got my schedule straightened out, and, um, and I was told I was no longer able to come. Like many of you, I would return to his class years later when I enrolled at UCLA as an undergraduate. Taking and surviving Uncle Richard's Armenian history classes was, of course, a rite of passage, as you've heard already, for so many Armenian students over the years. Now, Uncle Richard soon realized that my mom was an excellent writer and editor and asked her to help him with his dissertation. And so in the mid-60s, she took on the task of editing Uncle Richard's manuscript. And I like to think that she taught him how to write. I can still remember her sitting at our dining room table, dictionary, thesaurus, and always several sharp pencils in hand, asking us to stay quiet so that she could read Uncle Richard's long and convoluted sentences, he loved long phrases, understand what he was trying to say, and recast those sentences into readable prose. For those of you who were his graduate students, I venture to say that he learned his editing skills from watching my mom edit his work all these many years ago. And you should take comfort in knowing that she marked his papers up just as much as he marked yours. After editing his dissertation, she went on to edit the first vol two volumes of his magisterial four-volume collection, The Republic of Armenia. 
Now, Uncle Richard's profound impact on my life and that of my entire family began in these years and remained strong until the very end. He and my mom were especially close, and we were honored that he offered to offer his reflections at the time of my mom's passing. I credit Uncle Richard for joining with my father, who had been born in Greece, to pull my mom a third-generation Californian whose family had come to United States from the Ottoman Empire, from Marzavana, Malatya, in the late 1880s. If it weren't for him, I'm not sure how close our family would have come into the Armenian community. He had a way of doing that for so many who were on the verge of being lost to assimilation, and somehow have come under his aura, have recognized and learned the value and the beauty of their history, and have been brought back in. For our family, that started very early, as I said, following on their work um, on the dissertation on the Armenia on the road to independence. He invited my parents to join with him on the Armenian Monument Council that built the Armenian Genocide Monument in Montebello, California. It was the first time, by the way, that all parts of the Armenian community came together to do something to really serve the community as a whole. And Uncle Richard always had a knack for rising above difference to find commonality for a greater purpose and a greater cause. I remember carrying the candle as a seven-year-old walking beside a survivor as we did the groundbreaking for that first Armenian Genocide Memorial. Some years later, Uncle Richard joined the other founders of the Armenian Assembly, which included my husband. He wasn't my husband at the time, I just wanna make this clear. Um, Dr. Dennis Papazian, some of you know Dennis, at the first meetings in Airlie, Virginia. Uncle Richard invited my mom to join with him to take notes and to be a scribe, um, which she did. And another example of how he pulled her in and deepened our family's commitment and connection to the Armenian community. And of course, this led to our participating in many events in Los Angeles and to my becoming an Armenian Assembly intern years later when I was in college. Now, when time came for me to attend college, um, really, UCLA was, was the place to be. It was my only choice. It was my first choice. And in fact, as long as I could remember, I wanted to come to UCLA and study English, which is what I did. But Uncle Richard's taking us to UCLA football and basketball games throughout the years. I don't know if you knew he actually was a sports fan or else he just did it because he thought it would be a fun way for our families to be together and to spend some time. When I was a freshman, he asked, he had been named the associate director of the von Grunebaum Center for Near Eastern Studies here at UCLA, and he asked me to come work for him, his first foray into administrative work. And this is where I first began to see what was possible from an administrative side. Now, I didn't realize at that time that years later when I went into an academic administrative position, I had learned so much from working with him at the center at a time when the center itself was right in the middle of so much of global change. I was able to help him organize conferences, handle book reviews for the International Journal of Middle Eastern Studies, or IJMIS as we called it, and he spent that time, by the way, trying to talk me into becoming a student of Armenian studies and to go on and do a graduate program in Armenian studies. Now, I said no. I was interested in literature, and that's what I wanted to do. But I promised him at that time that even though I would pursue a PhD in British literature, that I would always find a way to stay close to the Armenian community. With a smile on his face, I still remember he forgave me for not pursuing Armenian studies. And I think it's because, you know, he always did have a deep love for literature. And I know he respected it, and he believed that each of us should find our own path in a way that was meaningful to us. 
seeing him navigate the university as a professor, historian, and administrator, taking on causes and issues big and small, had a profound impact on me and helped me see the life of an academic as one worth following. And I'm not sure I would have followed into an academic path if it weren't for Uncle Richard. And so I'm forever grateful. As a matter of fact, in the year I received my PhD, and this was 1988, it was the 50th anniversary of the first PhD awarded at UCLA. And so UCLA decided to mark that 50th anniversary by having a special ceremony where the candidates would walk across the stage and be hooded by their mentor and a moment to celebrate the great accomplishment. It was very special for me that when I was able to be hooded at that ceremony, I was joined not only by my dissertation advisor, but also by Uncle Richard. As a current faculty member, he was able to do it. And because he was so instrumental in shining a path for me, I wanted him to be a part of it. And he graced me with that. I'd never seen him so proud and happy, and it touched me deeply. After I left California and went on to Michigan to take my first academic position, my relationship with Uncle Richard began to change from mentor and student to colleague and friend. And this was especially true after Dennis and I married in 1991, as he and Dennis had had so much in common as founders of the Armenian Assembly, leaders in the Society for Armenian Studies, colleagues and friends. They were indeed brothers in arms. We often met and visited and shared and reminisced about all of that. And it was a particularly special moment when in 2022, on the 50th anniversary, somehow 50 is a rhythm here, um, of, the of its founding, the Armenian Assembly honored both Dennis and Uncle Richard together to really mark what these two extraordinary founders had done. Uncle Richard himself wrote to me on the parallel lives that he and Dennis had lived. Dear Mary, he said in an email, please tell Dennis that I have finished reading his very interesting memoir. It's the first book I've read since Anti Vartiter's, or he wrote Vartiter's passing. And I've been struck by how many parallels there have been in our lives. And I share this, by the way, because it is a window into how he reflected back on his own life. They were less than one year apart. Dennis was 11 months older. And he writes, our lives began less than one year apart from each other. List of similarities. Growing up in the Great Depression. I do think there's something about growing up at a time of great scarcity that provides a concentration of purpose in one's life. Experiencing the negative aspects of an immigrant background. Transforming the immigrant experience through education and developing skills, when we had to learn how to move within privileged society, that move from the outside to the center. Influential teachers who made a great difference. Involvement in initial stages of the Armenian Assembly Steering Committee and Airly. Close friendship with Kadakin II, who became Kadakin I an enjoyment of lavish receptions in Deal, New Jersey with Hudar and Anna Hovnanyan as hosts. Congressional hearing with Congressman Wayne Owens storming out in protest. That fight, right, that was there. Mesa war zone, need I say more. Experiences in the Soviet Union, Lincoln Center and Times Square, Achieving rejection of the Turkish chair at UCLA, even after the money had been transferred in secret. Everything else is a set is a word or two. That's a whole sentence. That really was one of the pinnacles. Connections with Shireen Hunter and so much more. Yes, so much more. I last saw Uncle Richard when he came to Dennis's funeral last year, just about a year ago, almost to the day. He was as sharp as ever, though slowed down and physically frail. At the memorial luncheon, he offered all of us a moving tribute to Dennis, 
but really it was also about himself, of the role they had played in connecting the survivor generation to this newly emerging generation, of playing an important bridge connecting the history of the Armenians to the possibilities of their future. He was both optimistic and very, very worried, proud of all he and Dennis and their generation had done, proud of the new generation that was emerging to carry the torch forward, but worried about the headwinds facing Armenians in Artsakh and Armenia itself. He had seen for himself how our Western Armenian homelands were vanishing, and he worried that the future, that the past might repeat into the future. He would want all of us to take up the mantle and dedicate ourselves as leaders like he and Dennis had done. I believe all of us here are animated by his spirit, mindful of his worries, and hopeful about our long-term survival. I imagine him now in his heavenly life, reunited with dear Auntie Vartiter and with mom and dad, arguing with my beloved Dennis and reminding us all that though things might look dire, we have been through worse and survived. And so as we celebrate his legacy, his contributions to scholarship, to each of us and to the Armenian people, let us also redouble our efforts to do all we can to ensure that the Armenian nation, both in the Republic of Armenia and throughout the world, the global Armenian nation, not only survives, but thrives. He will be watching. His legacy will live on in his many students, his scholarship, his colleagues, and friends. And as we have heard today, so many of us have been touched in so many ways. So I close with my dedication to his wonderful family, his children and grandchildren, and now great-grandchildren. The generations continue. Thank you for sharing him with all of us these many years. Thank you for all that all of you have done to carry on his legacy. You will deepen it, and he will continue to inspire. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Papazian. I'd like to invite to the podium Barlo Dermagurdichian, Professor and Director of the Armenian Studies Program at Cal State University, Fresno. I'd like to thank the Promise Institute, Armenian Institute, uh, Anne Karagosian and her team for organizing this wonderful symposium in honor of Richard Hovanesian. It's a privilege for me to participate in such an interesting symposium dedicated to someone who's been part of my life for more than 45 years. It was, all, it was just about 44 years ago when I first stepped on the UCLA campus to pursue a degree in Armenian studies. I was motivated by a desire to learn more about the Armenian language, culture, and history, but I also didn't realize then that the journey I was about to embark on would take me in such a different direction than what I had started. Uh, many people are not aware, but I graduated from Fresno State with a bachelor's degree in biology and a minor in chemistry. Uh, that was in 1980. However, in 1978, I traveled for the first time to Armenia for a month in the summer of 1978. And then also Professor Dikran Kyumjan had also come to Fresno State and I began to take courses. And for me, it was a choice between pursuing perhaps a career in medicine or in another area with, uh, associated with biology, or to take an opportunity to just learn more about my history, my culture, and my language. So that one moment of just going with my heart rather than my brain, I guess, was the difference between uh, where I am today and where I could have been. Uh, in each person's lives, there are those who make a very profound uh, impact, and I can say that Richard Hovanesian was one of those people for me. I entered UCLA in 1980, and at the same time, there were my fellow students, Stepan Asturian and Varam Shemasian. 
They were going to study Armenian history while I had been admitted into the Armenian Literature and Language Program under Dr. Avadi Sanjan. We heard earlier from Rupina Perumia and her story. Uh, she also was my classmate. So we started in the same class with Dr. Sanjan. And for the next four years or five years, we were together in all of the classes. And I can say that uh, with, with Stepan and Vadam especially, we shared many experiences in classes, including two years of learning uh, Turkish language, modern Turkish language, with Dr. Stephen West. That was a very interesting uh, story. This is a side note now, but it just reminds me. It was uh, around April 24th, and remember this is the time that political violence was already uh, around in the, in, the, in the world, and Stephen West had been a uh, Peace Corps volunteer in Cyprus when the Turkish army had taken over Cyprus. And then later he became interested in the Turkish language, became a professor of Turkish. Uh, however, around April 24th, he approached me and said, uh, Barlow, uh, please uh, tell your fellow classmates that uh, I'm not against the Armenian genocide. Uh, he was very afraid that something might happen to him uh, regarding that. And so we shared all of these experiences as I uh, began my career at, at uh, UCLA. But I can also say, as I look around the room today, that I see uh, many of my classmates those who didn't go into Armenian studies, but students who were at UCLA in the early 1980s, because it was a very special time. We had not only the graduate students, we had the uh, faculty, but we had a very active Armenian Students Association, and then uh, just a, a very big sense of community at, at that time. So it's a, it was a very important period in UCLA's uh, history. So as I said, I had, I had a great interest then in learning more about Armenian history, and I had heard about Dr. Hovhannisian and his history program. So in addition to my language and literature courses, I also enrolled in his courses. And then as I began to take his courses, I began to realize how much I appreciated them and how much I looked forward to taking each of his classes. Now, at first, I have to admit that Dr. Hovhannisian was a very, I'm going to use the word intimidating or imposing figure. But it wasn't just because of his reputation but also for, I think, no other reason than our difference in age. I don't know how many of you, you've been teaching long enough, you know that as you get older as a teacher, the students are the same age. But at, at a moment, they begin to look at you as just you know, older and intimidating, even though I'm not really doing anything different. So it's hard to imagine today that uh, today I'm much older than Dr. Hovhannisian was when I began taking his courses. But I think the special part of our relationship was outside of the academic arena, because we shared one thing in common. We were both from the Central Valley of California. Now, the Central Valley is the mother colony of Armenians in the West Coast. So we shared that background. Uh, he was born in Tulare, California, where a small Armenian community also lived. It turns out that my maternal grandmother, my grandfather's only sister, Mary, had married Asadur Bogosian from Tulare and had settled uh, there and, and had started a family. Now, Mary and my grandfather were from Tokat. Very few Armenians survived from Tokat. And so that connection uh, to Richard Hovhannisian, he's from a different area, but because they knew each other, uh, he often recounted to me how well he knew my great aunt. And even as late as just the last few years of his life, he would send me an email and say, uh, can you tell me, was this your uh, cousin or was this your aunt or was this your you know, relative from that period of time? And I, I know that that connection lasted uh, for over 40 years, that the sharing of the Central Valley and what made the Central Valley so different. I think it was one of the few places in the world that Armenians still lived on where they, where they could own land, farming land. You know, most Armenians live in urban areas, but in, in the Central Valley, Armenians were farmers, and that meant that they were attached to their land. And that was the connection that he made back to the country, because as we are also attached to this place we call Armenia. So this aspect of our relationship uh, was very important. I might say that I was born and raised in Fresno, and so were my parents. My, par my dad was actually born in 1920. And I think back and think he was born when there was still a Republic of Armenia. And so what a lifetime that he had in the arc of his life. But I, as an Armenian-American, then shared that connection with Richard Hovhannisian. His impact on me as a teacher and a mentor was direct and long-lasting. And I can recall just different areas where he made that significant effect on me. And I think I extracted lessons. 
lessons which I then uh, uh, applied to my own teaching career because I began teaching in Armenian studies in 1985 at Fresno State, still teaching today. So it'll be almost 40 years. Next year will be my 40th year of teaching at Fresno State. And from that, I took on, from him, I took on those lessons. The first area, as so many of you have talked about, is just the teaching, right? Uh, whoever was in this classroom has been said, uh, was just immediately drawn into the teaching of Armenian history. And uh, he was so interactive, so many uh, things that took place in the classroom that just attracted me to say, you know, this is, this is the way teaching should be. It's not just about the facts, it's about how you get those facts across and the spirit behind it. And this is what he had, he had passion. And it was that personal passion that helped to motivate me also to say in the classroom, I didn't want to just read something, but I wanted to talk about it, to, to tell the story. Someone said earlier about it being like a cinema, or you have to create a narrative. And that's what he was so good at doing. And uh, he never had a note while he was teaching, but he had that comprehensive knowledge, the sources, all of the material, and not only just about Armenian history and culture, but about the whole world at, uh, in, in, in that way. So it was clear to me that uh, this is the, you know, a, a type of teaching that I wanted to adopt in my own methodology. And uh, you know, this is also the time before computers, right? So uh, you couldn't look up things online. You couldn't get pictures and everything like that. So it was through the teacher that we made that connection to get that interest to, to go on. So after, again, uh, being in many of his classes, I adopted some of those, tried to adopt at least, in my own uh, teaching. Uh, some, some of you talked about his humor. We could call it dry, uh, dry humor that he had, uh, where sometimes he would use that elongated pause, uh, he would say, and then uh, tell a joke. Uh, but he made the history of the Armenian people come alive. So he maintained the highest standards in his classes, and his courses were extremely rigorous. I heard so many uh, comments today about uh, people whose GPAs were ruined by his uh, courses. Well, I have to be, I, I should be modest, but today I won't be. Uh, I have a, still have a blue book I have from 45 years ago, 44 years ago. I took his history course. I got the blue book back. I opened it up at the back. And there, uh, there was my grade. It was the Armenian letter Ipe. So that was an A, so yay. It was an Ipe, though. For me, that was, you know, wow, he's writing in Armenian for me. That was great. A second area that we were talked about earlier, but I really want to emphasize, is the financial area. For many years, Richard was the associate director of the von Grunenbaum Center at UCLA. And he was instrumental in providing full fee waivers for his graduate students. Full fee waivers in those days was a big thing. And it meant that we could focus on our studies and not have to worry as much about our finances. And he did this on a long-term basis. Someone mentioned it earlier, that he found every way possible to support his students. Uh, and he did it ev without ever being asked. I mean, he approached us and said, you know, I have this for you. And of course, we were so appreciative and grateful. But it taught me a very important lesson, which I've tried to apply at Fresno State, uh, which is that I, I try to engage my students outside of the classroom and to find for them ways that I can ensure their success. And the way that I can ensure their success is not only the financial, but the moral support, the encouragement uh, for them to pursue whatever dreams that they have, because most of the students that take our courses are not going to be Armenian studies minors or majors, However, they're taking those courses because they are interested in the history and culture of the Armenians. So much was talked today about uh, oral history projects. Uh, I actually was involved in the late 1970s with the Armenian Assembly uh, Oral History Project in Fresno. And then later at UCLA, it turned out that uh, Dr. Hovanesian got me involved. It wasn't such a, a, a great job. I, I got the responsibility of duplicating uh, the cassette tapes that he had. So we went to the library. It was this great big machine that you had to put one tape in and it would produce three tapes at the same time. But think about this, you had to do it at real time. So it's not going fast. It has to, you have to go through it at real time. So you can imagine how much time that took. But uh, in the meanwhile, he was always around. I was in his sixth floor office. By the way, if those of you that have never been in that office, with, it was like a history museum 
with the carpet and the books and the mementos. So it was all, all part of that that also influenced me. Uh, and and I really think about it today, that contribution that he made in the Oral History Project, it is a long-lasting uh, contribution to the social history of the Armenians, to the reconstruction of the history before the genocide, and it preserves the memories of a generation which is all but gone today. So we have to thank him uh, for that. Now, since, since that period, I've had many opportunities to work with Dr. Hovhannisian, um, in particular, his work with the Society for Armenian Studies. Many times it was mentioned he's been the president, but during that time, I was the manager of what we call the Secretariat. So I had to work with him constantly, and uh, we worked fast and quickly. And so when he had projects, I would usually work with him to, to make sure those projects were completed. Uh, also, we had the pleasure in, in the year 2000 of having Richard Hovhannisian as the first Kazan visiting professor in Armenian studies at Fresno State. This was a new program, and since then we've had 19 uh, visiting professors, but he was our first professor, and he got off that program off to a great uh, start. So I've uh, mentioned to you that, uh, again, about the Society for Armenian Studies, and again, uh, I have to repeat, we used to go to these Middle East Studies uh, Association conferences. I was, uh, went to my first conference in 1983 in Chicago, and it was very interesting because uh, it was a group of us graduate students who wanted to go, but we didn't have any money, so we went to Dr. Sanjan and kind of asked him, Dr. Sanjan, is there any way you can kind of support us in going, and he goes, yeah, I think we have a, you know, an endowment that can give us some support. So it was our first uh, visit to a Mesa meeting, and uh, someone said it was electric, right? Those, those, uh, you had to be there. You had to see Richard Hovhannisian single-handedly stand up in an atmosphere in which the Armenian genocide was not recognized, was marginalized, was everything and with the courage that he single-handedly and persuasively took on uh, all of these great figures, as Fatma Mugde mentioned, uh, of the denialist movement in, in Turkish studies. Uh, I was so impressed by that, but it gave me courage to say that uh, I should also follow in those footsteps, that anyone that can do that, then whatever I do in the classroom, I should have the courage to, to speak the truth to my students and to encourage them to also speak the truth. So I'd like to also conclude today by just briefly mentioning that I also had a chance to work with Richard Hovhannisian on his final volume on the 15-volume uh, Armenian Historic Cities and Provinces. This was the, the book on Armenian communities of Persia, Iran. Boy, I got an email in, uh, it was early 2021, and you remember that COVID was in full force. I was teaching completely online and he said, you know, uh, would you help me edit and put together this book in my naivete? I said, sure, I will do that. Not understanding uh, the complexity, this was, I believe, uh, 25 plus chapters in which some of them, the, the, uh, the contributors had not yet even finished their, their articles. But that's where I learned about Sumpod uh, through, uh, through there and then through all the wonderful articles but we did something, again, that he much appreciated. Uh, what we did was uh, that I worked very quickly. So he would send a chapter. I would go through it. We would discuss corrections, ar arrangements, all of that. And I have to say that by uh, May of 2021, we finished in about three months the entire editing process. Um, we would, he tried to figure out, where am I going to send this book to get published? Because it's so expensive now. We ended up sending it. He ended up sending it to, I believe, South Korea to get published. Uh, and, and again, because of COVID, it was going to be delayed because of the shipping. But you know what? I was so happy I was able to have him see that book get published because it gave him such a sense of completion of his mission because that was the last conference book that was, uh, that was not completed. So today I reflect back on my relationship on and his impact. And I also want you to think about it that just a few years ago, if you looked at West Coast Armenian Studies, California Armenian Studies, that at virtually every major institution, it was Richard Hovhannisian's graduates, UCLA graduates. Stepan Astorian was at Berkeley. Uh, Huri Berberian was at Irvine. Levon Marashlian was at Glendale. Vahram Shemasian was at Northridge. I was at Fresno State. So Armenian Studies was really the legacy of Richard Hovhannisian 
in those areas. And as a pioneer whose legacy will live on through his students and through all of you that uh, he had an impact on, we have to say that uh, we are just very grateful that he played such an important uh, light, a role in my life and in your lives, and that we appreciate him as being a unique and enduring figure in Armenian studies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Dermagurdichan. Let me please invite our last panel of the day, our esteemed individuals. I'm excited to be joined by Ara Sogomonyan, Senior Director and Creative at Jero Formulas and Natrol, Ardi Kasachyan, Glendale City Council Member, Jono Bogosian, Doctor of Podiatric Medicine, and Rafi Kasabian, Attorney and Founding Partner at Vesdi Kasap Law Group and Lecturer in the UCLA Department of Communication. Please come on up. All right. Thank you so much, dear panelists. You are the last panel to close out today, and we're very excited to have you here. Um, all day we've heard about incredible stories about how Dr. Hovanisian has impacted um, each and every individual on this stage. We'd love to have a moment of you reflecting on your personal story of his impact on your personal and professional lives. Ara? Thank you. Uh, thank you to the Armenian, uh, sorry, the Promise Armenian Institute. Thank you, Ani, for the recommendation. Uh, I also want to thank special guest in the back, my son Ari. He's 42 days old. So this is his first uh, time at UCLA and his first time uh, at a symposium. My wife, Sharice, thank you for bringing him today. Um, so we've said a lot of nice things uh, about Professor Richard Hovindeson today. I, I, too, will say something very nice, but uh, it will be terrifying for me to relive this, relive this experience. So the first time I met um, Professor Richard Hovindeson was in the late 90s. My friend Popkin Bakhtarian, who was in the video we presented, uh, he was a student here. He said, hey, will you come to UCLA with me? We're going to stuff envelopes for one of his conferences. I said, okay, I never met him. So I went, I think I met him for a second, but nothing memorable. And I think there was pizza and uh, it was a bunch of people who were my age, right? We were in our 20s. Uh, and it was a lot of fun. And that was my first time, I think, on UCLA's campus and I fell in love. I had gone to undergrad at Cal State Northridge. I studied film. At that time, I had dropped out um, uh, for three years and I was about to go back. So it was a good time for me to, to step onto an institution like this and be inspired uh, and to go back to school at that time. So fast forward a few years later, I applied uh, to UCLA, uh, to the Nearest program under the tutelage of uh, Professor Peter Cowie. And uh, before I started in 2003, I think the conference earlier that year uh, is in March around this time, right? Professor Robin uh, uh, annual conference. And I, I attended and I said, I'm going to go up and say hi to him. I'm going to introduce myself and let him know I'm coming, right? Or I'm applying at that time, maybe. Uh, and I And I did that. And uh, he was like, okay, cool. And he kept walking. And so that was terrifying, right? And I said, okay, he's a busy guy, but you know, it was intimidating, like Barlow said. Um, so I started, I attended UCLA in the first few years. It took a while to really get acclimated to the campus. Uh, I was a bit shy, uh, which is odd to say that because uh, I feel like I'm not, but I was. And I definitely uh, took me time to get warmed up, to get used to UCLA and the, and the way things work here. And I took a lot of language classes. There was a lot of people, who, a lot of kids that were, at, at that time, I was in my mid to late 20s, and they were like 17, 18 years old, and they were the smartest students I had ever seen in my life. So it took me a while to get used to campus life here, and I never spoke to, well, I didn't speak to uh, Professor Ovidis at that time, at that time for a few years. So around 2006, maybe 2007, I get this email, and it was the most terrifying email of my life, because it said, <laughs> Dear Ara, and it's from Professor Richard Hovindesian, I am extremely disappointed in you. How how could you not ever come see me? How do you not come talk to me? How are you avoiding me? It's been four years you've been here, right? This is my first conversation. Well, at least it was one-sided at that time. So I don't know what happened to my blood pressure, but it wasn't good. And it really took me a few minutes to recover, but I recovered quickly. Uh, I felt a sense of relief. I wrote back, can I come see you tomorrow? 
So I went to go see him the next day and he said, what's your problem? Why, why haven't you come to take advantage of me? I'm here to help. Like, are you serious? And I remember he was upset. He said, well, there was this conference a few years ago. I came up to you and I said, hi. And he's like, and I, and I was really intimidating to you, wasn't I? And I was like, yeah, you actually were. And that's it. I fell in love after that. And uh, our relationship completely changed uh, right after that moment. And uh, uh, I had, well, he had actually written me because I was, he knew I was studying the Musadal uh, subject and the uh, censorship of the, um, the Turkish Republic at that time in 1935. So I was a film student. I was a Near East program, uh, languages and literature. And I was doing a lot of work. I was going to Library of Congress. I was getting documents. It was a lot of fun, right? And I was really passionate about what I was working on. And he had heard that I was working on uh, this topic. And he, at that time, he was doing his conference in 2008, I think, uh, on Musadal, right? So I worked on the project for about a year. It was probably one of the best experiences of my life. And uh, he was he was such a good mentor at that time. And uh, we presented our papers, right? at the conference, and if you've ever presented, I know there's so many people here presented at his conferences. It was an absolute thrill to be on that stage, to be to, be, to be up there with one of your heroes introducing you, right? Um, and I killed it, it was awesome. But it was a lot of fun and I, and I, and I it was a truly rewarding experience. So there was a banquet associated with the conference. I know we've, uh, so many of us has attended these banquets and uh, he gave a speech at the end as he normally does. And then he stopped and he said, I want to I wanted to say how proud I am of one specific individual here. And he mentioned my name. And in, in about a year, year and a half, it went from this email <laughs> where he said how disappointed he was in me for not actually utilizing him and taking advantage of the fact that he wanted to help. Uh, and a year and a half later, I had one of the best um, experiences of my life. And a few years later, that chapter was published in one of his books. So it was, uh, it was, it was a great way to... Uh, to meet uh, Professor Ovenician. So uh, thank you for listening to that story. But uh, I also want to talk about the video that uh, Adi recut. It was about five minutes that you guys saw. Uh, the original was about 20 minutes. And everybody we emailed was so enthusiastic about sharing their Professor Ovenician moments. And they showed up. We, we filmed that. I think Tom R. Michigan was at Balboa Park. Uh, Rafi was at your house. We filmed you at your house. Gia was at Gia's house. We were on campus. John was outside of my last lecture event, right? And so we spent a few weeks. Um, Tom Arboyajo, who's not here today, and Shushan, and we 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 partnered up. And Doris and Arno, remember, we had this whole event that we were throwing for him, and we um, and we captured so many moments, right? These were these were their these were the students' oral testimonies of their experience with Professor Ovenician. And one, you started to see a pattern emerge. You really saw a tough, uh teacher, a mentor, somebody who raised the bar, somebody who pushed you um, to try harder. And I think the one of the, the main things I saw in that video is everybody got a B plus. Except Barlow. Barlow got an Ipe. Uh, yeah. Oh, there you are, Barlow. There you are. Yeah, you got an Ipe plus. But um, <laughs> Gia got a C. Um, but, you know, I've never seen a bunch of people so happy about scoring a B. Um, and Shushan, you were motivated, right? In the video, you, you mentioned it, and uh, you tried to take every class he had. You, at that point, you tried to earn his respect by working hard. And I felt that when I when I wrote the chapter uh, on Musadal. And uh, you re he raised the bar. He was the stars that you were shooting for. If you landed on the moon, you were lucky because he, he he did so much. And he he took advantage of, well, excuse me. He he. I don't think he rested. I don't know how this man um, functioned, but like, our friend Lilit Kishishan once told us a story, and I apologize if she's watching, where she was at a conference in Europe and she wasn't feeling well because she had just flown in. It was jet lag. And she stumbled into Professor Ovenisan in the, in the, I don't know if he had just come from the gym. I don't know. He's in the hotel lobby, but he was really energetic. She's like, hey, how are you? And he's like, I just flew in from Argentina. I mean, who goes from Argentina to Europe and has that much energy? And, and Shishan said that if he's like that, then, you know, I got to try my hardest to, to, to be the best I could possibly be. And he brought the best... Uh, 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 out of everyone, or he tried to at least, and he was really encouraging. And he, um, as we know, we've talked about it today. Um, but like you say, Artie, um, in the video that we made, uh, um, he he wrote the books, right? He studied from someone who actually wrote the history books, and that's such a unique experience, and that's so amazing. Um, and uh, I just want to say that that a few years later after we made that video. So that's 2011. So the first story is about 2006, 2007, 2011, we made the video. 
I guess the the final chapter of my experience with it was in 2016 when we were working on the chapter um, on the, the provinces in, in Lusidal. And so it was finally turning my paper into into a contribution to to the book he edited. And he um, we had a, a bunch of correspondence that I'm sure a lot of people in this room have revisited their own conversations with him. And I see a different person in those emails. This is about 2016. You know, he wrote me an email saying, um, off to Gilingya, you know, my arm hurts from surgery. Um, and a bunch of other little um, personal sort of touches to his emails. And I would write him email this long and he would respond with like 10 words. Um, and uh, it means a lot. It means a lot to still have those emails. It means a lot to have that experience. It means a lot to to be able to revisit that time because life sort of, um, um, well, becomes complicated and you, uh, you know, you, you maybe can't remember all the little little details of the past but to go back and to actually have a conversation with him maybe he i know is 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 here he's watching us um and it's 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 an absolute thrill to be a part of his journey a small part um and to to be in this to to follow in his shadows and uh to uh to be able to relive some of those experiences by by going back and, and remembering our experiences together so uh, i miss him and uh, uh and uh and i know we all do so thank you thank you for your time Thank you so much, Arajan. I think it's that idea that he gave each and every one of us what we needed. You got the ipe, but we needed something else at that moment, and he gave it. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jono. Show off. First of all, I'd like to thank the UCLA Promise Armenian Institute for uh, inviting me and Dr. Karagosian. Thank you for organizing this event. In lieu of time, I'll try to keep my uh, statement short. Uh, my name is Jano Borosian. Uh, unlike many of the speakers today, I don't work in or adjacent to the field of history or Armenian studies. I'm a foot and ankle surgeon. However, I did complete the Armenian studies minor at UCLA. I actually got a 4.0 in Armenian studies. Uh, that actually helped bump my GPA up, actually. So it was nice. I was actually on the executive committee of the Armenian Student Association for three years. Uh, we accomplished a lot of great things uh, during our time. And it was around 2011 when I heard that Professor Hovannis would finally be retiring. So we wanted to honor him by nominating him for the second annual um, My Last Lecture Award, which uh, there's some footage from that uh, video uh, earlier today. Um, around that time, I remember speaking at an event in Kirchhoff Hall, um, which during which I said, I wish I had the courage to pursue a career in history or Armenian studies because that was the subject closest to my heart. I inadvertently took uh, Professor Hovannisian's History 107 series in reverse order, starting as a freshman. And I was fortunate to be a student over the course of three years. His monumental reputation preceded him, but I was never intimidated by him. On the contrary, he was actually quite endearing. While other academics were self-restricted by the boundaries of their profession, he became a community leader, engaged with his audiences, and made his knowledge accessible to anyone who cared to listen. He went from studying history to making history, from pioneering and legitimizing modern Armenian studies to shaping its historiography and laying its foundation for it to thrive. Professor, Professor Hovannisian was omnipresent in the fields he studied and helped blossom. He was a beacon of knowledge and wisdom. I spent countless hours as an undergraduate at his office in Bunch Hall, picking his brain and connecting the dots about the nuances of history and learning invaluable les life lessons along the way. Professor Hovannisan was a bridge to the seemingly distant past and brought to life what felt like fairy tales I had heard from my parents about our history. My parents instilled in me a strong sense of identity, and Professor Hovannisan amplified that with gravitas and purpose. Nothing was ever in a vacuum. Everything had context. My parents and I attended many of the historic Armenian cities and provinces conferences, which were held on the weekends because Zurnus think Shilakhosing, who can attend a Westwood conference on a weekday. Um, growing up in Syria and Lebanon, my parents knew of Professor Hovanisian, but in the days before the internet, living on the other side of the world, he was an unreachable figure to my parents until I became a student. Thereafter, we would attend as many of his lectures and community events in the area as we could. We stayed in touch often after I graduated, mostly via email, which gave him many opportunities to correct my grammar, try to avoid splitting infinitives, etc. He often shared updates about his life, news about upcoming events and publications, and interviews he had recently done, whether it be with Armenian journalists, students, or the Getting Curious podcast with Jonathan Van Ness. 
I consulted with him on every one of my personal projects, and I cherish the times we spent in person, always, as he said very humbly, learning from each other. Anytime I'd worked on an article or an op-ed piece that I eventually published, he had played a significant role in the process, either di directly or indirectly. Whether it's offering constructive criticism and reviewing my drafts or introducing me to Anne Kerr after I read that Professor Hovani was pivotal in reviewing the biography of Zoravar Antranig, from which I learned about the Kerr family in Beirut and the connection the Hovani family had with Malcolm and Anne in the 70s here in the Palisades. He always took the time to review my work and offer guidance, saying he knows I'll continue to combine profession with avocation. My one regret is having procrastinated on my biggest personal project, you know, some sort of a story interview in interweaving my family's stories with the contemporary history during which those events took place. I know his input would have been invaluable. When I returned to UCLA for my residency, we saw each other in person more frequently, and we would occasionally catch up over some coffee at his home or at a dinner in Westwood with some of his colleagues. I was acutely aware of the finitude of our time together and I was especially grateful that he spent his 87th birthday as a guest at my wedding with his beloved wife and lifelong partner, Vartiter, who he, lo who he loved unconditionally. In fact, the last time I saw him in person was actually in this very room at the Kerr family lecture last April. I had shown him some recent pictures of my then infant son, and we had plans for him to come over and meet him, but his health was declining. He would often speak very candidly with me about his health, doctor's appointments, and diagnoses, and the week before his passing, I received an ominous email from him about his deteriorating health, and I knew the day would come, just not that quickly. Putting into words the impact this man has made on multiple generations of students, scholars, and communities cannot properly convey the ripple effects of his life's work. Rest in peace, my friend. Your legacy lives on in the hearts of everyone you inspired. Thank you so much, John Ojang. Rafi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Promise Institute, Hovanisan family, Ani, Gado, Armen Rafi, Galin. It's definitely humbling to be up here uh, and to remember your father. So thank you for having me. I know it's been a very long day, content-rich day, so I'll, I'll keep my comments brief. Uh, Dr. Hovanisan, throughout the different milestones of my life, would always gift me uh, his publications. Sometimes the same publications, but they're always special. And they were special because he'd always have a personal note uh, every time he gifted me one of his works. And one of them that I brought with me today is the Godin Ezra publication from 2003. Uh, and then in, in the first page, he wrote, For Rafi, Godinan Upatsad Haiga, Met Haigi Silda, Sorvink Yev Sorvetsenek. Sorvink Yev Sorvetsenek, right? Let's learn from each other, as you said. And that has been a guiding principle for me throughout my life as a student, as a professional, as an activist, as a, as a father. And I think everybody in this room shares that same sentiment. So I want to thank Dr. Hovanisian for that very important principled message that has always carried me forward uh, in, throughout my entire life. Uh, I had the good fortune of meeting Dr. Hovanisian at a very early age, at age 12. And the reason for that was when I was a student at Mesrobian in Montebello, my best friend's father, uh, Dr. Haig Manjikian, who's uh, Kesapsi and a uh, longtime supporter in the community would always take us to UCLA every year for Dr. Hovanisian's conferences. And I always remember being so overwhelmed coming from Mesrobian to this massive campus and also meeting this historical giant that we would talk about in class. And I told myself, when I graduate, I'm coming to this school and I'm going to be working with Dr. Hovanisian. And I did work with Dr. Hovanisian, but in a different capacity. To many, he was an academic and historian. But to me, we worked together as political activists on the ground, on campus. Uh, fast forward to 2001 when I got admitted to UCLA. It was a very different time for the Armenian American student community than when Artie was there in the 90s. And he'll touch upon the uh, Stanford Shaw uh, uh, and what the students did there to defeat the Turkish chair. But during my time subsequent to that, it was a little bit different. Uh, and it was a little bit different because, unfortunately, uh, the Armenian student community was had an allergy. They had an allergy to political activism, and they were apathetic to political and human rights activism. Uh, they had an AS, a very active ASA, the Armenian Student Association, one of the largest in the country. The focus was more social and cultural, which is great, but the activism component was missing. And that was very frustrating for me. 
it was very frustrating and disappointing for me because the Turkish community got smart. In the 90s, when they overtly tried to establish a chair and overturn and undermine the Armenian community, subsequently, they got smart and they did it covertly. They started bringing in academics who were mathematicians, who were scientists, who in reality were uh, proxies to the Turkish government, who would start propagating to students about genocide denial. The Daily Bruin, one of the largest circulating papers next to the LA Times, started publishing denialist propaganda by students, defaming Armenians, calling them bigots and, and people with hate. And so they started slowly uh, influencing the community. And we had an Armenian student association who wasn't, was not being vigilant enough to address these issues. So I had many meetings with Dr. Hovhannisian in his office, frustrated. And finally, I decided uh, to run for student uh, body president for the ASA. And I credit Dr. Hovhannisian as advisor, and Artie was also a, our advisor at that time for helping the Armenian American student community wake up, elevate, and, and start taking proactive measures to uh, perpetuate uh, the Armenian story through, through campus and to fight uh, the revisionist history. Uh, through the work of the student body and through the guidance of Dr. Hovhannisian, uh, who gave me the courage and gave the students the courage to stand up for their rights, we were able to pass uh, legislation through the student government level to ban Turkish goods on campus, uh, which was powerful. It was a powerful message. Uh, we were able to build coalitions with different ethnic organizations from the Jewish community, the Latino community, the Asian American community, to start learning about our story and what the Armenian genocide was about, what Atsakh is about. And so I credit Professor Hovhannisian uh, for giving me and the students at UCLA, the Armenian American students, the courage to stand up for what we believe in. And that activism and that courage has transcended for me uh, in my professional life as an attorney, uh, as an advocate, as a family man, and also in my volunteer work uh, with the ANCA, the Armenian National Committee. So um, those were my two cents that I want to impart that I'm forever grateful for Dr. Hovhannisian and his leadership and guidance. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Rafi John. Ardi? There we go. Um, thank you. I want to thank the Promise Institute, uh, Dr. Karazian Ani. Thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, I think that uh, I share many of the sentiments and thoughts uh, with the previous speakers. I think everyone has encapsulated the accomplishments and gifts that uh, Professor Hovhannisian has given to our people, to academia. Um, I, I accepted this invitation because um, it would have been impossible for me to uh, refuse it, to come speak here. Um, I felt incredibly disappointed that I was not able to be um, at his memorial service because I was uh, traveling. Um, and when I was speaking to Ani and Armin um, recently, I remarked that I, his absence still does not feel real. Um, I personally don't do well with uh, end of life events. Um, I don't do well in funerals. I don't know how many people do, but whatever the motions are, I can't understand how Armenians go and sit in someone's home of someone who's departed. Um, but I, I felt drawn uh, to this conference because of the impact that this man has had on my life. Um, and I want to share some of it with you. I didn't have anything prepared, but while people were speaking, I, I, I took down some notes. And, and one thought occurred to me, obviously UCLA has had a very special impact on my life, but not just because of the incredible institution that it is, specifically because of the man we're all gathered here today to honor. And I hope we will continue to honor him on a regular basis through our work, our deeds, through continued conferences, um, because it's the least that we can do. UCLA has a, a very famous alum. It's baseball season. Everyone knows Jackie Robinson was a multi-letter athlete here. And he has a famous quote uh, from his autobiography where he says that a life is not important except for the impact it has on the lives of others. And I think that speaks to the legacy of Professor Richard Hovhannisian. Um, when I was a student here at UCLA, there were three 
types of Armenian students. There were the ones that did not care to share their Armenianness or the fact that they were Armenian with anyone. They were the ones that did not want to ruin their GPAs by not taking Professor Hovhannisian's class, as we've heard. And then there were the ones that didn't care, uh, like myself, um, and who took it. Uh, you heard in the video how one day I came across the printed course catalog back then, um, and I saw that Armenian history was being taught, and um, I told my father, and it's a true story, my father said, look, Zavagas, we never had the money or the means to send you and your brothers to Armenian private schools, and you never learned Armenian history. College is gonna be one of those rare opportunities where you can study whatever you want. And I was at the time a chemistry major, um, and uh, he said, you must uh, take uh, Hovhannisian's courses. Uh, it will be a unique opportunity, unlike any you'll ever have later on in life. Um, and he did say, if you don't get anything, uh, if you get anything less than an A, don't bother coming home. Um, I got an A in one of his classes, and then I got a B plus in another. It, it all balanced out at the end. But um, it, I was in his one of his, the first class I took with him was actually a hybrid class. Today, we all know of remote learning. Back then, he was one of the first professors to embrace it. Our class was in a studio in, I think, one of the medical buildings, and it was taught remotely simultaneously with um, uh, Armenian uh, students or students from all over in Berkeley and in Santa Barbara. I don't know if anyone remembers that. I think maybe you came and taught one of the classes or lectured to us in one of those. Yeah, and um, there were so many people in those courses that have gone on to do amazing things and interesting things, elected office. At least three council members have come out of that courses. Uh, Kirk Kartosian, who was at Berkeley, became a, a council member and mayor in Downey. Uh, Zaria Sinanya and myself, we both became council members in Glendale, um, and, uh, and, and many, many others. Um, and so we took that course, and I will say that it was probably the beginning of the end of my chemistry major. <laughs> it, was, it was at that time that I realized that uh, I was more interested in history, uh, that Armenian history was far more interesting than what we had been taught growing up as children, either around dinner tables or at various community functions, um, that um, we were a people with, you know, human failings, that we weren't the great you know, people of the Sasun Si David, these mythical heroes that shoot lightning bolts out of their eyes, that sometimes our, our destiny is shaped um, more often than by our own um, uh, failures than by the failures of others. By the way, I, I want to also mention that um, uh, Professor Ovenisian was a dear friend and mentor to my late aunt, Iskui Kasachian, who also worked here at UCLA for many years, and that my folks knew him when they were in Cambridge, Massachusetts, when my father was uh, completing his PhD. And he told me that, you know, you, Professor Ovenisian, I had met him apparently as a small child and I didn't remember. Um, but, you know, his impact on me was imprinted here at UCLA. Um, partly because of his courses that made me realize that I was no longer a chemistry major uh, and and I officially switched to history. Um, and uh, I would also be remiss to uh, mention that there were two other figures who impacted my life trajectory at the time. One of them was the late Garo Momjan. Um, I'm sure he was probably spoken about today. And then the other was Stepan Asturian. Uh, I should also mention at this point um, in my comments uh, that I never thought Professor Hovhannisian really liked me. <laughs> he was he was a very serious person. Um, his children and grandchildren have since told me many times that, and, and any time there were any events honoring him, um, I, I, I was more than glad to participate. But he was such a, you know, I, I think the term stern was used, and he was sometimes gruff, and he was not the warm, fuzzy figure that I think that some of us uh, have spoken to. I mean, for, those, for those of you who were, that was very... Um, you were very fortunate. But to me, he was this uh, very serious, serious academic figure. Um, I think many of us uh, still have post-traumatic stress disorder from having to spell Caucasus oh, yeah. in our slate. Um, but he was, he did have that kind of dry humor. He did have that playful side, but he was an, he was an academic's academic. And, um, you know, that, and he was a serious person about his craft. And that, that came out 
during the the fight for the Turkish studies chair and um, the opposition that we as Armenian students, that he as a historian and as a professor here at UCLA put on to make sure that um, that the forces of denial did not have a foothold here in, in a premier academic institution like UCLA. Um, it was mentioned, I think maybe it was Razumik or someone mentioned that, you know, what that came down to was an 18 to 17 vote. So when you look at my life in public service, I can draw a direct line to that event because I, while I was at UCLA, did not have plans of, you know, being in public service, running for public office, being involved in politics until that singular event. And I was the president of the Armenian Student Association the year that happened. Um, our biggest concerns at the time were, you know, what, you know, how much Horovod's Mis were we going to take up to Big Bear for the ski trip? Um, or, or what new uh, co-eds were coming to join the ASA uh, that year? And, and he pulled us into his office at that time was uh, Vace Petrosian, um, Pedro Zarokian, who's now on the Yerevan City Council, believe it or not. Um, and uh, he pulled us all in as ASA members, as some of the executives, and he shared with just a select few of us of this bombshell news that there was an endowment uh, that was being put forth by then retiring uh, Professor Stanford Shaw. He was on his way out, and he wanted his legacy to be uh, this chair of uh, Ottoman studies um, with many, many strings attached from the Republic of Turkey uh, with the... Um, gift of 1.5 million dollars the the irony of which was not lost on anyone at the time um so we went around to different armenian organizations we tried to rally the community and and you know unfortunately many folks felt that what was done was done the advice we received from many people was that you know you're just a small ragtag group of students um, you're up against the university. Fi times were financially tough, so the university needs this money. These are these are uh, some of the uh, excuses and explanations from Armenian community organizations. Um, the Armenian National Committee had our back. I remember Viken Sonens Papazian said, whatever you need, we'll put you on Armenian TV. We'll put you out there. Uh, we'll give you materials to pass out and, and uh, informational stuff. And um, so a few of us uh, sat down and thought about what we could do. And uh, we thought to ourselves, we said, okay, let's assume that this is a done deal. It's a fait accompli. Am I going to look back on my time at UCLA? And if my son or my children, my grandchildren ask me, what did you do when that Turkish chair offer was made at UCLA? Uh, and answer that we did nothing. We just sat by. We said, you know, God damn it. Like, if it's going to be established, we are going to make the process so miserable and so difficult that any other university that is approached with the same offer will say to the Turkish government, we do not want to touch this with a 10-foot pole. So we took it upon ourselves to become activists. We became political activists when it wasn't, you know, no one had taught us how. Um, we would uh, follow the chancellor from event to event and ask him poignant questions as to why UCLA would want to enter, sully its reputation by entering into this um, relationship with one of the worst human rights violating governments in, in, in the world. Um, and Professor Hovanesian, Professor Asturian, they had very large and significant parts in educating us, informing us um, how different professors felt about the chair at the time, who was for it, who was against it. And so I remember the day the vote took place. Um, we came to UCLA. Uh, there was no school at the time. Uh, I, I believe class was uh, not in session. Um, it was a closed door vote in Bunch Hall. Myself and uh, a couple of other students were waiting outside impatiently. And uh, I think this uh, is all chronicled in Garin's book. Um, I told this to him years ago. I remember... Um, the doors opened and, and professors slowly started filing out and we just were waiting impatiently. Professor Hovhannisian came out and went directly to his office and asked us to follow him there. And we still had no idea. I mean, we were just there. You could not. I mean, he had a great poker face. I can tell you. I don't know if he ever played poker, but um, he was a very hard man to read. And um, 
it was at that time that that gruff, stern man, who I never thought well, it really had taken a liking to me, despite the classes I'd taken and the efforts I'd put in his class, he kind of broke down. He hugged me. And he said, boys, we did it. And uh, he, we, it was revealed that the vote was a difference of one vote. And it was at that time I came to the realization of the importance of just being present, being active, showing up, um, and how one vote can make a big difference. From there on, my life took a completely different turn. I was offered an internship in Washington, D.C. in Congressman Frank Pallone's office. I did some work on revealing the efforts of Turkish um, interests to corrupt American academia, the uh, ridiculous efforts of Heath Lowry to try to cover up his tracks and trying to um, manipulate and counter the work of incredible uh, genocide scholars, um, and, and the efforts that were being made by Turkey to we'll go from institution to institution here in our borders um, in the United States of America to buy their way into um, uh, our halls of education and learning. Um, and from there, I, I came back. I started working on campaigns. Um, I started doing more work in the political arena because I realized that in, uh, more and more, it, the Armenian voice in different circles mattered. And, and that can be directly connected to the example that Professor Richard Hovhannisian said, because Professor Hovhannisian was unapologetic about his work. And I think that's the one thing we have to take away today and moving forward. What I've found in my career and life is that most of the time, Armenians try to, we try very hard to justify and explain our presence in certain arenas to justify or try to explain why we deserve to be at a certain place in or in certain academic disciplines. What Professor Hovhannisian taught me besides our people's history was how to be unapologetically Armenian and how to be excellent in your pursuit. He was a he was very meticulous, even if he was not perfect. He worked hard to carve out his own space, as we have heard time and again by so many of you here in the academic world, versus trying to fit into some other person's or group of people's predetermined space based on notions and biases of others in academia. And, and it still happens today. Armenians are constantly trying to fit into someone else's paradigm versus creating their own table and seat at the table. By doing so, he also made sure one of the most important lessons I, I have carried with me to the world of Armenian-American politics, which is don't be satisfied with just being the first, but also make sure you're not the last at something. And we've heard that from so many of the people in academia here today. But that lesson has been transferred to so many of the other fields, as we've heard from medicine and law and film and literature and literary studies. It's not enough to be the first, which he was undeniably. But he made, in his stern and gruff way, sure, he made sure that he was not the last. And by carving out our own space in this world, that is oftentimes very Darwinian and will not give you your space. He made his academic work an allegory for the Armenian experience. You must carve out your own name in history versus being the obedient and placating figure waiting your turn. Sadly, not enough among our people have learned this lesson, not today in the Republic of Armenia and certainly not enough, not enough of us in the diaspora, but we were fortunate, all of us, to have Richard in all our lives. So we have a roadmap to follow and a standard that was set, not just as it pertains to academia, but in how to be an Armenian, to be an unapologetic pioneer. Um, so I'll, I'll repeat what I started with, what I said to Armin, what I said to Ani. I don't think our community will fully grasp the impact that this man has had on our nation um, until years from now, 
when we look around us and we wonder where the giants of our community have gone. Um, I hope um, I'm proven wrong in that. I do know that, you know, I, I said at one of the dinners to honor him when I was asked to speak, and, and, and when I was asked to speak, I said, really, he wants me to speak about his career? I'm like, okay, fine. I said, you know, there's a saying in Armenian that we say, Zara right? You recognize a tree by the fruit that it bears. And when you look around this room and the people watching online and the folks that I'm sh sharing this panel with, if we are all the fruits of Professor Hovanesian, then he was a remarkable tree with incredibly strong roots and a foundation. And it will continue to bear fruit and pay forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Artie John. I just want to thank the esteemed panel. I also want to thank Professor Hovanisian again. Even today, he kept teaching us. That's the giant that he is. Thank you so much. I will turn it over to Dr. Anne Karagosian. Thank you so much, Alina. Thanks to all of our uh, panelists today. We have amazingly come to the end of this extraordinary program. We are so grateful to you for being here. I don't know if there are going to be any other comments from family or if, yeah. So maybe we will welcome uh, Armen uh, Hovanesian, one of uh, Richard's sons, for a few comments. Today is uh, the happiest day in the last nine months of my life because for the first time in those last nine months i spent the entire day from more early morning to now the twilight hours with my father during the last presentations as i've been watching with intrigue with curiosity with great attention my eyes continue to see the glory of my father. My imagination has taken great flights of fancy. As I see his eyes looking to the left, I imagine time and again that he shifts them a little bit to the right and he blinks and he looks at us, he looks at me as he did over the many years when he wanted to give a little, a little nod of approval, and it would be ever so slight, but ever so large. It would pass quickly, but laugh last a lifetime. I imagined him looking at me in the fourth row on the left. Richard Hovanesian was more, I'm reminded, about 10 years ago, maybe 11 years ago, this month, maybe this day, when Garin Hovanesian rose on the opera square and when his father was nationalized by the Armenian people and by the Republic itself. And Garin stood up and he said, I stand here not as his son. He's more than that. I cannot claim him. He is yours now. The same way that Rafi was publicly nationalized, at least by expression, those 11 years ago on the eve of his election as president of the Republic of Armenia, so too today is a public testament to something that we have known for a long, long time. He is not mine, and he is not only yours, he's all of ours. He is the universal donor. He is in certain ways, it's hard to say, but a spiritual leader. And the language of that spiritual le leader was not the literal one only. It was the one that came with body and with blood and care. And it's that universal donor's blood who, which now courses in different levels and in many ways very strongly in all of our veins. 
Let me conclude by saying that we saw all of his measurable accomplishments in each of you, in each of his works. When he was writing those works of the four volumes, those that preceded it and those that came after, his greatest accomplishment was unfurling day after day after day a new history of the Armenian people, a new history that was uncluttered and unburdened by despair, by the great national dispossession, and that was enlivened in his relations with you individually, with institutions, with the Armenian community and those outside of the Armenian community. So at the same time that he documented the past, his greatest success was ensuring the prosperity and the progress of each of you and here today and so many who are not here today. That is what he is going to be known for. He is going to be known for not only memorializing what brought us here, but also allowing us to have more clarity and confidence as to where we will be going. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Arman, and thank you, Rafi, Ani, Gado, for sharing your father with us all these many years, these many decades. I thank all of our speakers. I resonated with the stories and what was shared by each one of you. As an engineering professor here, I viewed myself and loved Richard as a colleague, as an undergraduate here. I took one class from him uh, in my senior year. It was truly a blessing for me and I treasured him as a mentor as we started our Promise Armenian Institute. I hope, as I said in the beginning, that each one of you will use what you have learned today to inspire you, to cause you to rededicate yourself to the sacred memory of our ancestors and the promise of the future for Armenia and for our people. Let me thank very openly and very lovingly our staff who worked so hard, especially Hasmik Bagdasarian, Emily Pavosian, Nanor Hartunian, we are so grateful to you. I know you will, Verchabes, you will get some sleep, I hope. Not have to text me at 1.30 in the morning. Um, let me invite you now, those who are uh, present, we have a reception for you in the Hmong lobby. Those of you who are uh, speakers and panelists, I would, and family members as well, I'd invite you to come forward so that we can take a few photographs. Um, but otherwise, thank you for joining us for this really special event. And I hope you will consult our website because we have other events uh, sponsored by the Promise Armenian Institute coming up very soon. Thanks to all of you. Have a good rest of the day. But please, speakers and panelists, come forward for a photo.